Harper Audio presents Guardian of the Horizon by Elizabeth Peters, narrated by Barbara Rosenblatt. Editor's Note Just when the editor believed she was nearing the end of her arduous task of editing the Emerson papers, a new lot of them turned up. They include most of the journals from the so-called missing years, plus miscellaneous letters, newspaper clippings, recipes, lists, receipts, and several unpublished articles. The circumstances under which this discovery was made need not be discussed here. Suffice it to say that Mrs. Emerson's heirs are no longer threatening legal proceedings and have reached a tentative agreement with the editor that allows her to produce this volume. It is based on Mrs. Emerson's journal for the 1907-08 season and thus immediately follows the events described in the journal published as The Ape Who Guards the Balance. The editor's reasons for selecting this particular volume are twofold. First, she was dying to know what happened when the Emersons returned to the Lost Oasis. Second, up to this time, she had only one journal for the years between 1907 and 1914, a period of great importance in the professional, political, and emotional history of various family members. It is hoped that eventually this gap will be filled in, and the reader may rest assured that astonishing revelations remain to be disclosed. As before, the editor has included relevant portions of Manuscript H, written by Ramses Emerson. It seems unlikely that Mrs. Emerson ever read this manuscript, which Ramses seems to have abandoned shortly after the birth of his children. Any parent could understand why. One other set of documents provided useful information. The letters herein designated as Letter Collection C. They were found in a separated bundle. Obviously, they never reached the persons to whom they were addressed, but were collected by Mrs. Emerson after the events to which they refer, for reasons which should be evident to any intelligent reader. Chapter 1 when we left Egypt in the spring of 1907, I felt like a defeated general who had retreated to lick his wounds, if I may be permitted a somewhat inelegant but expressive metaphor. Our archaeological season had experienced the usual ups and downs, kidnapping, murderous attacks and the like, to which I was well accustomed. But that year, disasters of an unprecedented scope had befallen us. The worst was the death of our dear old friend Abdullah, who had been foreman of our excavations for many years. He had died, as he would have wished, in a glorious gesture of sacrifice, but that was small consolation to those of us who would learn to love him. It was hard to imagine continuing our work without him. If we continued it, my spouse... Radcliffe Emerson is without doubt the preeminent Egyptologist of this or any other era. To say that Emerson, who prefers to be addressed by that name, has the most explosive temper of anyone I know might be a slight exaggeration, but only slight. His passions are most often aroused by incompetent excavators and careless scholarship, and during this past season he had, I admit, been sorely provoked. We had been excavating in the Valley of the Kings at Luxor, my favourite site in all of Egypt. The concession for the valley was held by an irritating elderly American, Mr. Theodore Davis, who was more interested in finding treasure than in scholarly research. We were there under sufferance, allowed to work only in the lesser, more boring tombs. Still, we were there, and we would be there again in the autumn, had it not been for Emerson. The trouble began when Mr. Davis's crew discovered one of the strangest, most mysterious tombs ever found in the valley. It was a hodgepodge of miscellaneous funerary equipment, much of it in poor condition, including a mummy and coffin and pieces of a magnificent golden shrine. And if it had been properly investigated, new light would have been shed on a particularly intriguing era of Egyptian history. In vain did we offer Mr. Davis the services of our staff. Abdullah, who was still with us, was the most experienced rice in Egypt. Our son Ramses was a skilled linguist and excavator, and his friend David, an equally skilled copyist. 
not to mention our foster daughter, Nefret, to whose excavation experience was added medical training and a thorough acquaintance with mummies. Only an egotistical idiot would have refused. Davis did refuse. He regarded excavation as entertainment, not as a tool in scholarly research, and he was jealous of a better man. He wanted no one to interfere with his toy. Watching Davis rip the tomb apart, I quote Emerson, was trying enough. The denouement came on the day when the mummy fell apart due to careless handling. It might not have survived anyhow, but Emerson was in no state of mind to admit that. Face handsomely flushed, blue eyes blazing, impressive form towering over that of the withered old American... Emerson expressed his sentiments in the ringing tones and rich vocabulary that have earned him his sobriquet of Abu Shitaim, father of curses. He included in them Monsieur Maspero, the distinguished head of the Service des Antiquités. Maspero really had no choice but to accede to Davis's infuriated demand that we be barred from the valley altogether. There are many other sites in Luxor. Maspero offered several of them to Emerson. By that time, Emerson was in such a state of fury that he rejected them all, and when we sailed from Port Said, we had no idea where we would be working the following season. It was good to be back at our English home in Kent, and I make it a point to look on the bright side. But as spring turned to summer, and summer wore on, my attempts to do so failed miserably. It rained incessantly. The roses developed mildew. Rose, our admirable housekeeper, caught a nasty cold which refused to yield to treatment. She went snuffling drearily around the house. And Gargery, our butler, drove me wild with his incessant prying and disappointed hints that he be allowed to come to Egypt with us in the autumn. Emerson, sulking in his study like a gargoyle, refused to discuss our future plans. He knew he'd been in the wrong, but would not admit it, and his attempts to get back in my good graces had, I confess, not been well received. As a rule, I welcome my husband's attentions, his thick black locks and brilliant blue eyes, his magnificent physique and, how shall I put it, the expertise with which he fulfills his marital obligations moved me as they always had. But I resented his efforts to get round me by taking advantage of my feelings instead of throwing himself on my mercy and begging forgiveness. By the end of July, all our tempers had become strained. It continued to rain, Emerson continued to sulk, Rose continued to snuffle, and Gargery's nagging never stopped. Oh, madam, you need me, you know you do. Only see what happened last year when I was not there to look after you. Mr. Ramses and Mr. David kidnapped, and you carried off by that master criminal chap, and poor Abdullah murdered, and... Do be quiet, Gargery, I shouted. I asked you to serve tea. I did not invite a lecture. Gargery stiffened and looked down his snub nose at me. I am one of the few people who is shorter than he, and he takes full advantage. Tea will be in shortly, madam, he said, and stalked out. I seldom shout at the servants. In point of fact, Gargery is the only one I do shout at. As a butler, he was something of an anomaly and his unusual talents, such as his skill at wielding a cudgel, had proved helpful to us in the past. However, he was no longer a young man, and he certainly could not have prevented any of the disasters that had befallen us. I sighed and rubbed my eyes. It was, need I say, raining. The drawing-room was a chill, shadowy cavern, lit by a single lamp, and my thoughts were as cold and dark. Gargery's words had brought back the memory of that awful day when I held Abdullah clasped in my arms and watched in helpless horror as Scarlet drenched the white of his robes. He had taken in his own body the bullets meant for me. So, Sit, am I dying? He gasped. I wouldn't have insulted him with a lie. 
Yes, I said. A spark lit in his dimming eyes, and he launched into the familiar complaint. Emerson, look after her. She is not careful. She takes foolish chances. Emerson's face was almost as white as that of his dying friend, but he managed to choke out a promise. I hadn't realised how much I cared for Abdullah until I was about to lose him. I hadn't realised the depth of his affection for me until I heard his final whispered words, words I had never shared with a living soul. The bitter knowledge that I would never hear that deep voice or see that stern, bearded face again was like a void in my heart. The door opened, and my foster daughter's voice remarked, "'Goodness, but it is as gloomy as a cell in here. "'Why are you sitting in the dark, Aunt Amelia?' "'Gargely neglected to switch on the lights,' I replied, sniffing. "'Curse it, I believe I'm catching Rose's cold. "'Ramses, will you oblige?' "'My son pressed the switches, and the light illumined the three forms "'standing in the doorway. "'Ramses, David, and Nefret.' The children were usually together. They weren't children, though. I had to keep reminding myself of that. Ramses had just celebrated his 20th birthday. His height matched Emerson's six feet, and his form, though not as heavily muscled as that of his father, won admiring glances from innumerable young ladies. And a few older ones. Some persons might, and indeed did, claim that Ramsay's upbringing had been quite unsuitable for an English lad of good family. From an early age, he had spent half the year with us in Egypt, hobnobbing with archaeologists and Egyptians of all classes. He was essentially self-educated, since his father did not approve of English public schools, and Ramsay's did not approve of schools at all. He had been an extremely trying child, given to bombastic speeches and a habit of interfering in the business of other persons, which often led to a desire on the part of those persons to mutilate or murder him. Yet, somehow, I could not claim all the credit, though heaven knows I'd done my best, he had turned into a personable young man, linguistically gifted, well-mannered and taciturn. Too taciturn, perhaps? I never thought I would see the day when I regretted his abominable loquacity. But he had got into the habit of keeping his thoughts to himself and of concealing his feelings behind a mask Nefret called his Stone Pharaoh face. He'd been looking particularly stony of late. I was worried about Ramses. David, his best friend, closely resembled him, with his bronzed complexion, curly black hair and long-fringed dark eyes. We were not certain of David's precise age. He was Abdullah's grandson, but his mother and father had been estranged from the old man, and David had worked for a notorious forger of antiquities in Luxor until we freed him from virtual slavery. He was, I thought, a year or two older than Ramses. Nefret, our adopted daughter, was the third member of the youthful triumvirate. Golden, fair instead of dark, open and candid instead of secretive, she and her foster brother could not have been more unalike. Her upbringing had been even more extraordinary than his or David's, for she had been raised from birth to the age of thirteen in a remote oasis in the western desert, where the old religion of Egypt was still practised. We had gone there a decade ago, at considerable risk to ourselves, in search of her parents, who had vanished into the desert, and we had no idea she existed until that unforgettable night when she appeared before us in the robes of a high priestess of Isis, her gold-red hair and rose-white complexion unmistakable evidence of her ancestry. I often wondered if she ever thought of those strange days— and of Tarek, prince of the Holy Mountain, who had risked his life and throne to help us get her back to England. She never spoke of him. Perhaps I ought to be worrying about her, too. I knew why David's dark eyes were so sad and his face so sombre. He had become engaged this past winter to Emerson's niece, Leah. 
and saw less of her than a lover's heart desired. Leah's parents had been won over to the match with some difficulty, for David was a purebred Egyptian, and narrow-minded English society frowned on such alliances. I was thinking seriously of going to Yorkshire for a time, to visit Walter and Evelyn, Leah's parents, and have one of my little talks with them. Nefret's cat, Horace, did his best to trip Ramses up when they came into the room together. But since Ramses was familiar with the cat's nasty tricks, he was nimble enough to avoid him. Horace detested everybody except Nefret, and everybody except Nefret detested him. It was impossible to discipline the evil-minded beast, however, since Nefret always took his part. After an insolent survey of the room, Horace settled down at her feet. Emerson was the last to join us. He'd been working on his excavation report, as his ink-speckled shirt and stained fingers testified. "'Where is team?' he demanded. "'It'll be in shortly. Come and sit down,' Nefret said, taking his arm. She was the brightest spot in the room, with the lights shining on her golden head and smiling face. Emerson loved to have her fuss over him. Goodness knows he got little fussing from me these days.' and his dour face softened as she settled him in a comfortable chair and pulled up a hassock for his feet. Ramses watched the pretty scene with a particularly blank expression. He waited until Nefret had settled onto the arm of Emerson's chair before joining David on the settee, where they sat like matching painted statues. Was it perhaps the uncertainty of our future plans that made my son look as gloomy as his love-struck friend? I determined to make one more effort to break through Emerson's stubbornness. I was in receipt today of a letter from Annie Quibble, I began. She and James are returning to Cairo shortly to resume their duties at the museum. Emerson said, <clears throat> and stirred sugar into his tea. I continued. She asked when we are setting out for Egypt, and what are our plans for this season. James wished her to remind you that the most interesting sights will all be taken if you don't make your application soon. I never apply in advance, Emerson growled. You know that. So does Quibble. That may have served you in the past, I retorted, but there are more expeditions in the field every year. Face it, Emerson, you must apologise to Monsieur Maspero if you hope to get... Apologise, be damned! Emerson slammed his cup into the saucer. It was the third cup he had cracked that week. Maspero was in the wrong. He was the only one with the authority to stop Davis wrecking that bloody tomb, and he bloody well refused to exert it. Despite the bad language and the sheer volume of his reverberant baritone voice, I thought I detected the faintest tone of wavering. I recognized that tone. Emerson had had second thoughts, but was too stubborn to back down. He wanted me to bully him into doing so. I therefore obliged him. That may be so, Emerson, but it is water over the dam. Do you intend to sit here in Kent all winter, sulking like Achilles in his tent? What about the rest of us? It's all very well for David. I'm sure he would prefer to remain in England with his betrothed. But will you condemn Ramses, to say nothing of me and the fret, to boredom and inactivity? Ramses put his cup down and cleared his throat. Uh, excuse me. Emerson cut him short with an impetuous gesture. A benevolent smile wreathed his well-cut lips. Say no more, my boy. Your mother is right to remind me that I have obligations to others. Obligations for which I will sacrifice my own principles. What would be your choice for this season, Ramses? Amana? Beni Hassan? I will leave it to you to decide. He took out his pipe, looking very pleased with himself, as well he might. I had given him the excuse for which he yearned. It was what I had intended to do, but a certain degree of exasperation prompted me to reply before Ramses could do so. I believe the Germans have applied for Amana Emerson. Why cannot we return to Thebes, where we have a comfortable house and many friends? Because I swore never to work there again. Emerson moderated his voice. But um, if it would please you, Ramses... You know your opinion carries a great deal of weight with me. Thank you, sir. 
Ramsay's long, dark lashes veiled his eyes. Nefret had brought several of the new kittens. Like Horus, they were descendants of a pair of Egyptian cats we had brought home with us years before. One of Horus's few amiable attributes was his tolerance of kittens, and he endured their pounces and bounces without protesting. But when one of them knocked over the cream pitcher, he was the first at the puddle. Emerson, who was fond of cats, except Horus, found this performance highly amusing, and he was wringing out the kitten's tail with his napkin when Gargery appeared with a hand-delivered note. "'Well, will you listen to this?' I exclaimed. "'The Carringtons have asked us to dinner. "'Or, such affrontery, they will be happy to come to us at our convenience.' <laughs> "'Emerson growled and Ramses raised his eyebrows. "'There was no response at all from David, who probably hadn't even heard me. "'Nefret was the only one to respond verbally. "'The Carringtons, how odd. "'We've had nothing to do with them for years.' Not since Ramsay's presented Lady Carrington with a mouldy bone from the compost heap, I agreed. It seems they wish us to meet their niece, who is visiting. Nefret let out a shout of musical laughter. That explains it. Ramsay's, do you remember the girl? She was at the reception we attended last week. The reception you forced me to attend. Ramsay's eyebrows, which are very thick and dark and expressive, took on an alarming angle. I cannot say that the young woman made a lasting impression on me. You obviously made a lasting impression on her, Nefret murmured. Don't be ridiculous, Ramsay snapped. Nefret gave me a wink and a conspiratorial grin, and I considered my son thoughtfully. His curly black head was bent over the kitten he'd picked up, but his high cheekbones were a trifle darker than usual. Another one, I thought... He had pleasing looks and nice manners, thanks to me, but the persistence of the young women who pursued him was unaccountable. "'You must remember her,' Nefret persisted. "'Dark-haired, rather plain, with a habit of tilting her head to one side and squinting up at you. "'I had to detach her by force. She was hanging onto your arm with both hands. "'May I be excused, mother?' Ramses put his cup down with exaggerated care and got to his feet. He did not wait for a reply. Holding the kitten, he left the room with long strides. After a moment, David, who had followed the exchange with furrowed brows, went after him. "'You shouldn't tease him, Nefret,' I scolded. "'He does nothing to encourage them, does he?' "'Not this one.' Nefret's laughter bubbled out. It was funny, Aunt Amelia. She thought she was being so adorable. And poor Ramses looked like a hunted fox. He was too polite to shake her off. Well, this is one invitation I can decline with pleasure, I declared. Would that all our difficulties were so easily solved. Emerson? Confounded people, Dame. I am not the one who is making difficulties. It only remains for Ramses to make up his mind. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Ramsay sat on the edge of his bed with his head in his hands. Another day had passed without his having got the courage to tell his father the truth. He looked up at the sound of a tentative knock at the door. Come in, dammit, Ramsay said. Some people might interpret that as less than welcoming, said David, standing in the doorway. Would you rather be alone? No, I'm sorry. Come in and close the door before Nefret takes it into her head to follow you. You can't go on treating her like this, Ramses. You've been avoiding her as if she were a leper and snapping back at her whenever she speaks. You know why. David sat down next to him. I know that you love her, and you won't tell her so. I don't understand why you won't. You aren't usually so obtuse, David. How would you feel if a girl you thought of as a dear little sister sidled up to you and told you she was desperately in love with you? David smiled his slow, gentle smile. She did. But you were already in love with Leah when she spoke up, Ramses argued, and her announcement can't have come as a complete surprise. Don't tell me there weren't sidelong looks and blushes and... Well, you know the sort of thing. Supposing you hadn't returned her feelings, then how would you have felt? Embarrassed, David admitted after a while. 
Sorry for her. Guilty. Horribly self-conscious. And that is exactly how Fred would feel. She thinks of me as a rather amusing younger brother. You've heard her just now, teasing me about that confounded girl, laughing at me. He propped his chin on his hands. I've got to get away for a while, away from her. It's that hard, David asked. Being with her? It's bad enough seeing her every day, Ramsay said despondently. If only she weren't so damned affectionate, always patting and hugging and squeezing my arm. She does that to everybody, including Gargery. Exactly. It doesn't mean a damned thing, but I can assure you that it doesn't affect Gargery as it does me. He couldn't tell David the worst of it, the burning jealousy of every man who talked to Nefret or looked at her, because at one time he had thought she was beginning to care for David. He had dreamed of killing his best friend. A peremptory pounding on the door brought him to his feet. It's Nefret, he said. Nobody else knocks like that. He opened the door and stood back. Shouldn't you be changing for dinner? he asked pointedly. Nefret flung herself down in an armchair. Shouldn't you? I'm sorry I teased you about that wretched girl, but really, Ramses, you're losing your sense of humour. What's the matter? Ramses began. I don't know why you should suppose... She cut him off with a word she would not have used in his mother's presence. Don't you dare lie to me, Ramses Emerson. You and David have been eyeing each other like conspirators. Brutus and Cassius, creeping up on Caesar with daggers drawn. You're planning something underhanded, and I insist on knowing what it is. Don't stand there like a graven image. Sit down, you too, David, and confess. She was enchanting when she was angry, her cheeks flushed and her eyes wide and her slim form rigid with indignation. A lock of hair had come loose. It curled distractingly over her forehead. Ramses clasped his hands tightly together. Then her eyes fell. I thought we were friends, she said softly. We three, all for one and one for all. We three, friends. If he had had any doubts about what he meant to do, that speech dispelled him. After all, why not tell her? She wouldn't care. Friendship can endure separation. A friend wants what is best for her friend. Only lovers are selfish. I want to go to Germany this year to study with Ehrmann, he said abruptly. Nefret's jaw dropped. You mean not go to Egypt with us this autumn? Obviously I can't be in two places at once. She put out her tongue at him. Why? I need some formal grounding in the language. Formal recognition. A degree from Berlin would give me that. The speech came glibly. He had practised it a number of times, preparatory to delivering it to Emerson. I've learned a lot from Uncle Walter, but Ehrman is one of the best, and his approach is different. He thinks I can earn a doctorate in a year, given my past work. I enjoy excavating, but I'll never be as good as father. Philology is my real interest. Hmm... Nefret stroked her rounded chin, in unconscious imitation of Emerson when deep in thought. Well, my boy, that is a stunner, but I don't understand why you've been so secretive. It's a reasonable ambition. Ramses hadn't realised until then that he had been hoping against hope she would object. Obviously the idea of a long separation didn't disturb her unduly. Friends want what is best for friends. I'm glad you agree, he said stiffly. She raised candid blue eyes and smiled at him. If it's what you want, my boy, then you shall have it. You haven't got up nerve enough to tell the professor, is that it? Yes, well, Cardus is one of my worst failings. David's elbow dug into his ribs, and Nefret's smile faded. I didn't mean that. You're afraid of hurting him. That's what I meant. Sorry, Ramses muttered. We all feel that way, Nefret assured him, because we love him. But sooner or later he's got to accept the fact that you and David and I are individuals with our own ambitions and wants. 
What is it you want? Ramses asked. She shrugged and smiled. Nothing I don't have. Work I love. A family. The best friends in the world. I'll help you persuade the professor. We'll miss you, of course, won't we, David? But it's only for a year. She got to her feet. Just leave it to me. I'm going to break it to Aunt Amelia first. Then it will be all of us against the professor. If worse comes to worst, I'll cry. That always fetches him. He had risen when she did. They were standing close together, only a foot apart. She put out her hand, as if to give him a friendly pat on the shoulder. He took a step back and said, Thank you, but I don't need anyone else to do my dirty work for me. I'll tell Father tonight at dinner. She let her hand fall, flushed slightly, and left the room. Ramses, David began. Shut up, David. Damned if I will, David said indignantly. She was offering to help in her sweet, generous way, and you froze her with that cold stare and speech. What did you expect, that the idea of being parted from you for a year would miraculously arouse latent passions? It doesn't work that way. After a moment, he added, Go ahead and hit me if it'll make you feel better. Ramses uncurled his fists and turned to the desk. He opened a drawer, looking for a cigarette. I'm sorry, David said, but if you don't get over your habit of bottling up your feelings, you're going to explode one day. For God's sake, Ramses, you're barely twenty, and the family wouldn't hear of your marrying anyhow. Give it a little more time. Always the optimist. You don't see it, do you? You wouldn't, though. You don't want anything more from her than she is capable of giving you. What I want may not be there at all. He offered the packet to David, who took a cigarette and leaned against the desk. Are you still harping on that? Far be it for me to deny that you have to beat women off with a club. But there must have been a few who didn't react. The fret is one of them, so far. It doesn't mean she's incapable of love. Ramses felt himself flushing angrily. Believe it or not, I'm not that egotistical. Maybe you're right. I hope so. But doesn't it seem strange to you that a woman of twenty-three has never been in love? Not even once. Lord only knows how many men have been in love with her. She flirts with them, practices her little wiles on them, makes friends with them, and then turns them down flat when they get courage enough to propose to her. All of them. That's not natural, David. And don't tell me I wouldn't have known. The fret's not the sort to hide her feelings. The signs are unmistakable, especially to the eyes of a jealous lover, which, God help me, I am. After all, we don't know what happened to her during those years before... He broke off, and David gave him a curious look. The years when she lived with the missionaries in the Sudan. What could have happened with them looking after her? It was the story they had concocted to explain Nefret's background when they brought her back to England. Not even to David had Ramses told the true story of the lost oasis with its strange mixture of ancient Egyptian and Meroitic cultures and Nefret's role as the priestess of a heathen goddess. Like his parents, he had sworn to keep the very existence of the place secret. You're on the wrong track, I tell you. David leaned back, long legs stretched out, face sober. I believe that, in this case, I can claim to understand her better than you. I had to make the same transition from one world to another, practically overnight, from a ragged slave, beaten and filthy and starved, to a proper young English gentleman. He laughed. There were times when I thought it would kill me. You never complained. I didn't realize. I ought to have done. Why should I complain? I had to wash more often than I liked and give up habits like spitting and speaking gutter Arabic and going about comfortably half-naked. But I was at least familiar with your world, and I still had ties to my own. Can't you imagine how much more difficult it was for Nefret, growing up in a native village completely isolated from the modern world? It must have been like Mr. Wells's time machine, from primitive Nubia to modern England, in the blink of an eye. Perhaps the only way she could manage it was to suppress her memories of the past. I hadn't thought of that, Ramses admitted. 
No, you are obsessed with her uh, sexuality, if I may use that word. It's a perfectly good word, Ramsay said, amused by David's embarrassment. I think you've gone a bit overboard with the English gentleman rule, David. Perhaps you're right, but it doesn't help. Being away from her for a while will let me get my feelings in order. Maybe you'll fall in love with someone else. David said cheerfully. A pretty little fraulein with flaxen braids and a nicely rounded figure and... All right, all right, I'm going. Just think about what I've said. Ramses put down the vase he had raised in mock threat and sat on the edge of the bed with his chin in his hands, remembering. David's words had brought it all back. The strangest adventure of his life. They didn't speak of it, but he thought about it often. How could he not, with the daily sight of Mefret to remind him of how she had come to them? They had made plans to work in the Sudan that autumn. The region south of Egypt, from the second cataract to the junction of the Blue and White Niles, had been for ten years ruled by the Mahdi and his successors, religious fanatics and reformers. The Europeans, who hadn't managed to flee, were imprisoned or killed, along with a good many of the local inhabitants. Emerson had wanted for years to investigate the little-known monuments of the ancient civilizations of Nubia, or Kush, to give the region another of its many names. He believed that the Napatan and Meroitic kingdoms had been more powerful and vibrant than most Egyptologists admitted, genuine rivals to the ancient Egyptian monarchy instead of barbarian tribesmen. When the reconquest of the Sudan by Anglo-Egyptian forces began in 1897, he talked his wife into following the troops as far as Napata, the first capital of the kingdom of Kush. Then came the appeal on behalf of Willoughby IV, a friend of Emerson's who had vanished with his young wife during the conflagration of the Mahdist revolt. Emerson had scoffed at the message, which purported to be from Forth himself, and gave directions to a remote oasis in the western desert filled with treasure. For once, Emerson had been wrong. The message was genuine, and the map correct. After Reginald Forthright, Forth's nephew, set off into the desert in search of his uncle, the Emersons followed, accompanied by a mysterious stranger named Kemet, whom they had hired to work for them. It had been a disastrous trip from start to finish, the camels dying one by one, his mother falling ill, all their men except Kemet abandoning them in the desert without water or transport. Ramses had been ill too, sunstroke or heat prostration or dehydration, he supposed. One of his last memories of the journey was the sight of his father, lips cracked and tongue dry, plodding doggedly through the sand with his wife in his arms. They would never have made it if it hadn't been for Kemet, who went ahead to bring a rescue party. As they learned when they reached the isolated oasis, ringed in by cliffs, Kemet's real name was Tarek, and it was he who had carried the message from forth to England. It was some time before they found out why. He would never forget his first sight of Nufret, wearing the white robes of the high priestess of Isis, with her hair flowing over her shoulders in a river of gold. She had been thirteen, the most beautiful creature he had ever seen. Now that he was older, he was better able to assess the flagrant romanticism of that image and its effect on a ten-year-old boy. But he still thought she was the most beautiful creature he had ever seen, as brave and clever as she was lovely. Tarek had been in love with her. He had as good as said so. For who could see her and not desire her? Yet he had kept his word to her dead father, who had wanted her to return to her own people. Realizing he could not get her away without help, Tarek had made the long, perilous journey to England in order to bring the Emersons to the lost oasis. In doing so, he had risked his life and his throne. He had been a fine-looking young man, chivalrous as a knight of legend. It wouldn't be surprising if Nefret still cherished his memory. God damn him, Ramses thought. How can I or anyone else compete with a hero like that? 
Tarek had fought like a hero, too, sword in hand to win his crown. They had repaid part of their debt to him by helping him in that struggle, each in his or her own way. Emerson had been at the height of his powers then. Not that he'd lost many of them, and some of his exploits rivaled the achievements of Hercules and Horus. Another hero, thought Emerson's son. And now I've got to tell him I won't go with him this year. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. So vehement was Emerson's initial reaction to Ramsay's news that his shouts brought Gargery, John the footman, Rose, and several of the housemaids rushing in to see what had happened. Our relationships with servants are somewhat unusual, thanks to Emerson's habit of treating them like human beings and their profound affection for him. Once they learned what had occasioned his wrath, every single one of them felt entitled to join in the conversation, on one side or the other. Rose, of course, supported Ramsay's, and so did Gargery, offering himself as Ramsay's replacement, which infuriated Emerson even more. The housemaids were swept off by Rose before they had a chance to say very much. Still, the consensus was clear, and Emerson had some justice on his side when he shouted, "'You are all against me!' Nefret had warned me in strictest secrecy of what Ramsay's meant to do, so I had had a little time to get used to the idea. I was somewhat surprised at the strength of my initial disappointment. I had got used to having Ramsay's around. He was a great help to his father.' However, a mother wants what is best for her child, and at least the news explained why Ramses had been behaving so oddly. So I had promised Nefret I would help persuade Emerson, and of course my arguments carried the day. He'll get himself in trouble all alone over there. You know he will, was Emerson's final attempt to sway me by appealing to my maternal instincts. He always does. He always did. However, as I pointed out to Emerson, he did anyhow, even when he was with us. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Now that his decision had been accepted, and the time of his departure drew near, Ramses found it easier to deal with Nefret's constant presence. It wouldn't be for long, he told himself. Nevertheless, he spent most of his time in his room, ostensibly working. David had gone off to Yorkshire, radiant at finally having received an invitation from his beloved's parents. Ramsay suspected his mother had had a hand in that. One warm August afternoon, he had just finished a tricky translation of a hieratic text when Nefret knocked at his door. She had honoured his request that he be left alone to work, and compunction smote him when he saw her sober face. "'Am I interrupting?' she asked. "'No, not at all. Come in.' He stepped back and gestured her to a chair. She sat down, clasping her hands between her trousered knees. Her face was flushed with heat, and her loosened hair clung wetly to temples and cheeks. The open neck of her shirt bared her slim throat, and offered a distracting suggestion of rounded curves below. Ramses went back to his desk, ten feet away, and leaned against it. Rather warm to be riding, isn't it? he asked. She made a face at him. It doesn't take Sherlock Holmes to deduce that that's what I was doing. May I have a cigarette? Ramses lit it for her and retreated again. Something's wrong, he said. Tell me. Are you sure I'm not bothering you? It's nothing, really. I probably imagined the whole thing. It would bother me very much if you didn't feel you could come to me with anything that worries you. I'm sorry if I've been... Don't apologize, my boy. I know why you've been hiding in your room. You do? You don't want to face the professor. Oh. Don't let him upset you. He'll get over it. I know. Well... Well, I did go riding, as you deduced. On the way back, I stopped at Tabirka's Pyramid. It took Ramses a few seconds to focus on the unexpected subject. Impatiently, she elaborated. 
to Birka, Tarek's brother, who came to England with Tarek. We buried him in the clearing where he died and raised a little pyramid. I know. I was surprised, that's all. I haven't heard you mention him or Tarek for a long time. Do you go there often? Every now and then, Nefret said evasively. Or was it only his jealous fancy that she sounded evasive? It's a peaceful, pretty place. May I have another cigarette? Ramsay supplied it. She scarcely ever smoked. What happened? he asked. It was warm and very still, Nefret began. Not the slightest breeze. All of a sudden the leaves rustled violently, and I heard a voice, distant and hollow, as if it came from deep underground. Ramses, it spoke in the language of the holy city. The lost oasis, Ramses said, stalling for time. We called it the city of the holy mountain. The words, and the way she pronounced them, warned Ramses that he was on dangerous ground. Her head was bowed and her shoulders stiff, as if in anticipation of laughter or scepticism. Casually, he said, I know. What did the voice say? I didn't understand every word. It was a greeting, I think. She looked up. You believe me? You don't think I imagined it? I don't believe you heard the car of poor young Tabirka calling to you from the next world. Neither do you. You've better sense. Perhaps someone is playing tricks. Of course, Nefret said, with a sigh of relief. That's the obvious explanation, isn't it? But you can't imagine how uncanny it was, Ramses. I got away as fast as I could. I don't usually run away, you know. How well I know. She returned his smile with a look so bright and grateful, he felt like a mean hound. Had he been behaving so churlishly that she had hesitated to approach him? She had come to him, though, not to his mother or father. That was a hopeful sign, and thank God he'd had the sense to say the right thing. Let's go and have a look. He held out his hand. The fellow may still be hanging about, or he may have left some trace of his presence. Thank you, my boy. She took his hand and squeezed it. For believing me. Ramses gently freed his hand. We'll walk, shall we? It isn't far, and we can move more quietly on foot. Tall elms lined the narrow path through the woods. The leaves hung limp and still in the warm air. As they went on, the shadows darkened. A thunderstorm was brewing. Clouds piled up in the eastern sky. The place did have an uncanny atmosphere, especially in stormy weather, for the strange little monument in the glade was a pyramid in the Cushite style, steeper-sided and smaller than those of Egypt. Few people knew of it, and those who did took it to be one of the fake antiquities once popular with English gentry who had an interest in Egypt. On one side was a small enclosure in imitation of an offering chapel. Ramses had himself inscribed on the lintel the hieroglyphs that gave the dead boy's name and titles, and a short prayer invoking the goodwill of the gods of the judgment. Tabirka deserved an easy journey to the next world. He'd been murdered by Nefret's cousin, who had tried every dirty trick in the book to keep the Emersons from bringing her back to threaten his inheritance. Ramses really didn't expect to find anything or anyone. She had most probably been daydreaming a little, putting herself in a fanciful mood, and had misinterpreted the sound of an animal or bird. He was caught completely off guard when a hard body crashed into him, knocked him flat, and fell heavily on top of him. Winded and bruised, Ramses stared up into the dark face that hovered over him. It split in a wide, terrifying grin, and hands reached for his throat. Nefret was yelling and raining blows on the fellow's back with a branch. It didn't seem to have much effect. Ramses found breath enough to yell back. Get out of the way! He brought his hands up in time to slam the other man's forearms apart, rammed an elbow under his chin, heaved him up and over onto his back, and scrambled to his feet. The fret lowered the branch. Nicely done, my boy, she said breathlessly. Thank you. 
Ramsay stood poised, ready to kick out if his erstwhile opponent showed signs of continuing the fight. The fellow was rubbing his throat, but he was still grinning, and his lean body, clad only in a kilt-like lower garment, was completely relaxed. Ramsay stared in mounting disbelief. With his dark skin and bizarre costume, he was as out of place in an English woodland as a tiger in a drawing room. There was something familiar about the aquiline features. Tarek was right, the stranger remarked. You have become a man. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. We have entertained a number of unusual guests in our home, but never had I seen one so extraordinary as the young man who was in the drawing room with Ramses and Nefret when I came down to tea. Barefoot and bareheaded, his body uncovered except for a brief skirt or kilt, he might have stepped out of an ancient Egyptian tomb painting. I stopped short, and Ramsay said, Mother, may I present Prince Merison? He is the brother of Tarek, whom you surely remember. I am seldom at a loss for words, but on this occasion I was unable to do more than emit a wordless croak of surprise. Nefret hurried to me and took my arm. Aunt Amelia, are you all right? Sit down, please. A nice hot cup of tea, I gurgled, staring. The young man raised his hands to shoulder height and bowed. It was the same gesture shown in innumerable tomb paintings, a gesture of respect to the gods and to superiors. He was far more at ease than I. Well, but he had been prepared for me, and I certainly had not been prepared for him. A nice whiskey and soda instead, said Ramses. He sounded a trifle sheepish. I apologize, mother. I didn't think to warn you. Not at all, I replied, taking the glass he handed me. Will you take a chair, Mr... Uh, uh, does he speak English? I speak very good, was the cool reply. It is why Tarek sent me. Tarek sent you? I repeated, stupidly. Yes, Sitakim, I am honored to see you. They tell many stories about you in the holy city and about the father of curses, and the brother of demons, and the lady Nefret. Father of curses was Emerson's Egyptian sobriquet, and well-deserved, I should add, as Sitakim, Lady Doctor, was mine. We had been known by those honorifics when we were last in the Holy City. If I remembered correctly, Ramses had not at that time acquired his nickname of Brother of Demons, a tribute to his supposedly supernatural talents. Merison must have heard Ramses referred to by that name during his journey to England, perhaps from Egyptians in London who had given him directions to Amarna House. I nodded acknowledgement, sipping my whiskey and trying to collect my scattered wits. The young man bore a certain resemblance to his brother, with his well-cut features and well-made frame— or rather, I told myself, his brother as I remembered him. He must be about eighteen, the same age Tarek had been ten years ago. It is good to see you too, I said, politely, if somewhat mendaciously, for I suspected his arrival meant trouble. It wasn't likely that Tarek would send an emissary all that long, dangerous way, simply to say hello. Uh... Ramses, perhaps you can lend our guests some clothes. I have clothes. English clothes. The boy indicated a bundle at his feet. I will put them on. It was a question, not an offer. I rose to the occasion, as any good hostess should when confronted with well-meaning eccentricity. Smiling, I shook my head. Not if you'd rather not. The weather is extremely warm. Nefret, who had exhibited growing signs of impatience, burst out, "'Aunt Amelia, perhaps you can persuade Merison to tell us why he's here? I doubt that he undertook that long, arduous journey simply to make our acquaintance.' "'My thought exactly,' I agreed. "'He has not confided in you and Ramses?' "'No. He was too busy fighting with Ramses,' Nefret said caustically. 
The boy grinned engagingly. Tarek said Ramses would now be a man. I wished to see what sort of man. You found out, said Ramses curtly. The overt antagonism and the touch of braggadocio were so unlike him, I looked at him in surprise. Merison only smiled more winningly. And she, a little bow in the direction of Nefret, she is even more beautiful than Tarek said. She is not your wife. Ramsay's countenance became even stonier. Nefret said, I told you we are brother and sister, in affection if not by birth. Realizing, as did I, that the monarchs of the holy city, like Egyptian pharaohs, often married full or half-sisters, Nefret amplified the statement. I am no man's wife, Merison, nor about to be. Now that we have settled that, I said, what is the message, Merison? It is for the father of curses. Oh, dear, I murmured. Ramses, will you go and get your father? You needn't mention the identity of our guest, I added. Ramses smiled and went out of the room, leaving the door open. And you, Nefret, I went on, might just warn Gargery before he brings the tea tray. I don't want any more cups broken. He knows, Nefret replied. We met him in the hall. He was absolutely thrilled. He would be, I muttered. I heard the rattle of the tea cart, which was coming at a great pace. Emerson got there before it. I could tell from his appearance that he'd been hard at work, for he had removed as many of his garments as was proper. His shirt was open and the sleeves rolled above the elbow, bearing his muscular forearms. What's all this? he demanded. Ramsay said. His eyes lit upon the prince, who had risen and was making his obeisance. Ah, oh, said Emerson, without so much as blinking. A visitor from the Lost Oasis. Sit down, my boy, sit down. I am... Emerson, the father of curses, the boy breathed. Now that I see you, I know the stories are true, that you drove a spear straight through a man's body and killed another with your bare hands and fought a hundred men with sword in hand to help Tarek to the throne. Emerson drew himself up to his full height, basking in the admiration that filled the young man's eyes. At the bottle already, be body, he inquired, smirking at me. I looked accusingly at Ramses. He shook his head. Ramses preferred equivocation to prevarication, so I had to believe he hadn't mentioned our visitor to his father. The tea cart rattled in, propelled by Gargery. He was alone. Either the maids had been too timid to face the visitor, or, what was more likely, Gargery had seized on an excuse to prolong the service of the genial beverage so that he could listen to our conversation. I had no intention of discussing our visitor's purpose in Gargery's presence, so I dismissed the latter, telling him we would wait on ourselves. He left the door slightly ajar. I slammed it and heard a muffled yelp. I then turned my accusing gaze on my son. You told your father? No, mother, honestly. Emerson, how dare you pretend you aren't surprised? Emerson tried to keep a straight face, but he could not. I saw him through the study window, he admitted with a grin. Almost fell off my chair. Well, well, you are welcome in my house. What is your name, my friend? You may leave off bowing he added graciously. The young man drew himself up. I am Merison. I bring a message to the father of curses from Tarek, my brother and my king. Emerson held out his hand. I do not have the writing, the boy admitted. It was lost when the slavers took me, but I know the words. I will speak them. Come to me, my friends who once saved me. Danger threatens and only you can help me now. Curse it, I thought. Glancing at Ramses, I saw my sentiments mirrored in his normally inexpressive face. The expression, tightened lips, narrowed eyes, was fleeting. Emerson, it was just like him, responded with chivalrous, unquestioning enthusiasm. Certainly, certainly. How can we do less? Emerson, I said repressively, you might at least ask what sort of danger Tarek is in before you commit yourself and us to what you once referred to as a hare-brained adventure. I agree, said Ramses. That was quite different. 
Emerson exclaimed. On that occasion, we were following a rumour and a questionable map, and that villainous servant of Reggie Forthright's had poisoned our camels. This time... Professor... Nefret jumped to her feet. Pardon me, but could we for once stick to the point instead of arguing? Aunt Amelia has asked a sensible question. Merison, what is the danger that threatens Tarek? It is a strange sickness. Not one of our priests can cure it. It comes and goes away, and each time it leaves the sick one weaker. Two times Tarek has fallen ill. He is a strong man, and it will take long to kill him. But now the child is sick too. He is Tarek's heir, his only true son. It is for him Tarek sends to you. Good Lord, Nefret gasped. The little boy can't be more than ten years old. We must go, of course. Let's hear a little more about this, Ramsay said coolly. How long has it been since you left the Holy Mountain? Surely you didn't cross the desert in the heat of summer. I understood what he was getting at. The journey must have taken weeks, if not months. It might be too late for Tarek and his child. Nefret understood, too. Her face paled. What difference does it make? she asked passionately. There is a chance we might be in time. A chance we must... I am not denying your premise. Ramsay's voice was like icy sleet on flame. But we need to learn all we can before we decide what to do. Tell us about your journey, Madison. It was a riveting narrative, for the boy spoke with considerable eloquence. He had left the Holy Mountain in the season of Peret, winter, with only six companions. It was a small force to face the peril of the desert, but no more could be spared, for they went in secret, braving the old law of the Holy Mountain that forbade contact with the outside world on pain of death. The others were members of the royal bodyguard, strong men armed with swords and bows. They'd been on their way for several days when they met the caravan, thirty men and as many camels driving a forlorn line of bound captives. Slavery had been officially abolished and the trade vigorously suppressed, to the credit of Britain, let it be said. But as we all knew, the caravan still crossed the desert with their miserable human cargo, bound for the slave markets of Khartoum and Wadi Halfa, and the Egyptian oases. The villains knew that if they were caught, it would go hard with them. They had immediately fired upon the small band of strangers. The others they killed, the boy said calmly, but me they took alive. Yes, I thought sickly, they would. Most of the slaves were women and children and youths of both sexes. He was a handsome boy and well made. The older men would not bring so high a price, and they might be dangerous to their captors. So was medicine, as they were to learn. When they searched his camel bags, they found the rings of gold Tarek had given him to pay his way to England, and beat him to make him tell where he had got them. Though injured and frightened, he had wits enough to invent a convincing lie. He and his companions were treasure hunters, looters of ancient tombs. They had found this cache in a crumbling ruin far to the south, but there was nothing else there. They had taken it all, so the slavers left off beating him for fear of spoiling the youthful good looks that would bring a high price in the market, and ordered one of the women in the caravan to tend his wound. He pretended weakness and meekness, biding his time until his wound had healed, and he had learned enough of their whereabouts and their destination to make escape feasible. The woman knew a little English and helped him to learn some Arabic. It was she who told him of the soldiers of England who fought the slavers and of the town on the great river where they were stationed. By one means or another, and I thought I could guess one of those means, he persuaded her to help him get away, promising that if he found the soldiers, he would guide them back and win freedom for her and the others. She passed on to him all she could learn from those who knew something of the region, and on a moonless night... When they were less than a day's journey from the great river, Merison stole a camel and fled, leaving two men dead. I found the soldiers, he said, so I kept my word to the woman and had my revenge and my reward. They told me I was a brave lad and gave me money. It was not enough, 
I was on the Great River, but deep in the south, in the country they called Sudan. I worked, yes, and I stole, when it was safe to do it. But it took me many months to make my way here. If I have failed my king, it is on my head. The narrative had held us spellbound. Emerson had taken out his pipe, but had been too absorbed to light it. Now he cleared his throat. You've not failed. Few men could have acted with such courage and wisdom. Quite right, I said, though it was clear that my commendation meant little as compared with that of Emerson. Hero worship brightened the young man's face. Obviously, the stories of Emerson's prowess had become part of the folklore of the Holy Mountain, and I must admit that it would not have been necessary to enlarge them beyond the bare facts. Months, Nefret said. At least five months. And it will be another month before we... We'll discuss it later, I said, for dusk was creeping into the room. Ramses, will you show our guest to his room? Our room, any room, and find him appropriate attire? I don't care what, so long as he is more or less covered at dinner. I'll show him, Lefret said, getting to her feet. David's clothes will fit him better than yours, Ramses, and he can have David's room, at least for the time being. Is that all right, Aunt Amelia? Yes, my dear, thank you for asking, I replied. She took him by the hand and led him out. Father, Ramses began. Emerson held up a peremptory hand. Not here. Come to the library. Leaving Gargery, pouting as he cleared away the tea things, we followed Emerson to the designated chamber. He went at once to a cupboard next to the fireplace and took out a heavy steel box, which he unlocked. After rummaging through the papers it contained, he removed a yellowing document and spread it out on the desk. The three of us studied it in silence. The markings were still clear, numbers and several enigmatic symbols, the picture writing of ancient Egypt. We had used a copy of this map to reach the Holy Mountain ten years ago. After our return with Nefret, I had wanted to destroy it. Emerson had refused. One never knows, he had said. The time may come, he had said. Now I wished we had destroyed it. It was not often I recalled the details of that terrible journey, the heat and blowing sand, the constant thirst and the treachery of the men we had hired. I had no memory of the final days, since I had fallen ill and was unconscious when Tarek's rescue party found us and took us the rest of the way. Our departure from the Holy Mountain had been made in haste and in darkness, but I retained one very vivid memory— Looking back as we rode away, in constant fear of pursuit, I saw the encircling mountain range rising up against the stars like the ramparts of a medieval castle. A castle ablaze, for fire rose from the central portion like a volcano in eruption. We had left Tarek still fighting for his throne, though he had assured us that most of the opposition had fallen. We had an unspoken agreement not to talk of the place, but I had often wondered how matters came out. Well... At least we knew that Tarek had conquered. Emerson was the first to speak. It will take weeks to collect supplies and mount an expedition. In any case, we could not possibly start out before September. The desert heat is simply too great. If we decide to go. He looked expectantly at me. So you're having second thoughts, are you? I inquired. I'm not a complete fool, Emerson retorted. Of course it would solve the problem of where we mean to work this season. Unquestionably, I agreed, with a certain degree of irony. The hazards of the journey and the uncertainty as to what we will find when we get to the Holy Mountain, supposing we do get there, add up to a strong possibility that we will never have to face that particular problem again. It wouldn't be as risky this time, Emerson mused. We were limited as to camels and men, and weren't sure that the map was accurate. That's true, I admitted. I don't suppose I could persuade you to... Remain behind? Don't be absurd, Emerson. I knew you'd say that. Well, Ramses, you've been very silent. I will quite understand if you prefer to spend the winter in Germany, as you... Uh... Ramses interrupted him with an Arabic word that made Emerson's eyes widen. 
Good God, my boy, where did you learn that one? he inquired. You know I intend to go with you, Ramsay said furiously. Yes, said Emerson, trying not to smirk. You know why I've hesitated. Yes, Emerson's smile faded. I too would prevent her if I couldn't, but it's impossible. Tarek was a friend, close as a brother. Moreover, she is a trained physician, and this mysterious illness may be one she can diagnose and cure. Short of locking her up, which is illegal as well as impractical, I can think of no way of excluding her, can you? Ramses turned on his heel and walked to the window. He stood with his hands clasped behind his back, looking out into the twilight. Finally, his rigid shoulders relaxed, and when he turned, he had his face under control. No, I can't. She went off with Merison so she could talk to him about Tarek, you know. He'll fire her up even more, especially if he tells her about the child. He is a remarkable young man, Emerson said, and it was an epic journey. He couldn't have survived without those same qualities of wit and courage that marked... Ramses cut in. Did you believe his story? Why should we not? I exclaimed in surprise. We have only his word... Ramses began pacing up and down. There are a number of things about his narrative that bother me. He'd been in Kent for several days before we found him, camping out near Tabirka's Pyramid, waiting for one of us to come to him. Perhaps he was shy about approaching the house, I suggested. But I admit attacking you was a rather odd way of introducing himself. Oh, I can understand that, Ramses admitted grudgingly. I might have done something equally idiotic when I was his age, especially if I'd been in strange surroundings, uncertain and a little afraid. Win or lose, you've had the satisfaction of asserting your manhood. If you'll forgive me for saying so, my dear, you are in no position to criticise, I said. To judge by his appearance, he is only a year or two younger than you, and you've not entirely conquered your habit of... <clears throat> said Emerson loudly. What makes you doubt his story, Ramses? I simply pointed out that it cannot be substantiated. Oh, bah, said Emerson. He began ticking off points on his fingers as he mentioned them. He resembles his brother. He speaks the language. He knows of our earlier visit, and... He coughed modestly. What we did there. In detail, how else could he have learned these things? I don't doubt that he comes from the Holy Mountain, or that he wants us to go there. It is his motive that is unproven. We've nothing in writing, not even Tarek's alleged letter. Your point is valid, I admitted, and there are a number of other points that, in my opinion, require to be explained. We need not make a decision this instant. I assure you, Ramses, that I will bring to bear all my expertise at subtle interrogation. Yes, mother, Ramses said. Ha, said Emerson. Put the map away, Emerson. It is time to dress for dinner. I am dressed, said Emerson, inspecting his ink-speckled shirt. See here, Peabody, you don't expect me to get myself up in boiled shirt and black tie, do you? I took him away. Ramsay said he would lock the map in the dispatch case, and we left him brooding over it with a particularly vulturine air. I allowed Emerson to expostulate for a while before informing him that, no, I did not expect him to assume formal evening wear, but that he might at least change his shirt and brush his hair. He did so without further argument, humming cheerfully and tunelessly. I supposed the song was one of his favourite vulgar music hall ditties, but no one could have recognised the melody. I knew why he was in such a pleasant frame of mind. Emerson enjoys adventure for its own sake, and his archaeological brain was all afire at the prospect of examining again the unique monuments of the lost oasis, a culture frozen in time, so to speak, for it had had almost no contact with the outside world since the 4th century A.D., when refugees from the fallen capital of Meroe found their way there, joining earlier immigrants from the late dynasties of ancient Egypt. Furthermore, Merison's proposal had relieved Emerson of the necessity of settling on an excavation site for the coming year, and it had put an end to Ramsay's plan of spending the winter in Germany. 
I selected a rather becoming gown of my favourite crimson, for, to be honest, I needed to keep my own spirits up. No matter what precautions we took, the journey would be difficult and dangerous. And what would we find at the end of that journey? A dead child and a dying king, the end of a dynasty, with pretenders crawling round the bodies like flies. Even if we could make our way there without incident, our reception was in doubt. We too had broken the law of the Holy Mountain by the very act of leaving it. And we had stolen their revered high priestess. Chapter Two "'What shall we do about David?' Ramses asked. The leaves outside the windows of his room dripped with water. Pale sunlight had replaced the misty rain of early morning. It was the first time we had had an opportunity to speak in private since the arrival of our strange visitor. Over the past two days, I had become increasingly uneasy about him, and Ramses was the only member of the family who appeared to share my reservations.' Nefret's warm heart had been won by the hope of helping her old friend and his child, and Emerson had yearned for years to return to the Holy Mountain. Now Emerson would get his wish. The expedition was a settled matter. It had never been in doubt, really. No matter how slim the chance of success, the attempt must be made. How could we, as Britons, do less? Noblesse oblige, and the debt we owed Tarek admitted of no other choice. That debt was visible to us daily, Nefret herself. Had it not been for Tarek's braving the long, perilous journey from the Holy Mountain, we would never have found her, and our own fate would have been dreadful. The women of the Holy Mountain, like those of ancient Egypt and Meroe, married and began bearing children when in their early teens. One of the men who had sought her hand was Tarek's brother, a thoroughly despicable individual who might well have succeeded in taking Tarek's throne and his life and Nefret, had we not been present to defend our friend. She would have lived out her life as the unwilling but helpless wife of a cruel despot, instead of brightening ours. All the same, there were a good many complications that needed to be addressed, and Ramses was obviously the only other one who was capable of thinking sensibly about them. "'David is only one of the many complications that need to be addressed,' I said, and looked round for some flat surface on which I might seat myself. Rose had tidied the room that morning, but it was already in the state of utter confusion that prevails when Ramses is its occupant.' Apparently he had rummaged through the bureau drawers and the wardrobe in order to find garments he considered comfortable. These consisted of a collarless shirt that had seen better days and a pair of stained trousers I could have sworn I had directed Rose to throw away, since the stains would not come out. I did not know what chemical substance had caused them and preferred not to ask. The garments that hadn't passed muster hung over various articles of furniture. The bed, the chairs, and the desk were covered with books and papers. Two kittens were chasing each other up and down the draperies. Oh, sorry, said Ramses, observing my intent. He scooped up the papers from a chair and dumped them on the heaped desk, from which they immediately fell to the floor. Sit down, mother. Well? You share my reservations, I know. Let us address them in order. I took a piece of folded paper from my pocket, and Ramsay's grave face relaxed into a smile. One of your famous lists? Certainly. I unfolded the paper and cleared my throat. Do you remember, Merrison? From our first visit to the Holy Mountain, I mean. The question obviously did not take Ramsay's by surprise. No, but he was only a child, the son of a lesser wife of the king, and we didn't meet all the members of the royal family, thanks to the jolly old custom of polygamy. It was extensive. True. The factors your father mentioned the other evening make it probable, if not absolutely certain, that he does come from the Holy Mountain. The next question is, how did he find his way across the desert without a map? He answered that. You remember the oasis that is seven days' journey from the Holy Mountain? The only water along that arid track? Tarek keeps a garrison there to watch out for strangers. Once Merrison and his companions had got that far... They had only to head east, toward the rising sun. They were bound to strike the Nile sooner or later. 
it would have been hard to miss it. And he counted on us to guide him back, I mused. A rather dangerous assumption, that one. Tarek knew we had a copy of the map, but we might have lost or destroyed it. It would have been worth taking the chance if Tarek was desperate enough. Ramses began pacing, his hands clasped behind his back. The confounded boy's story makes sense as far as it goes. Anyhow, we haven't any choice but to respond. The question is how to go about it in the safest possible way. The fewer people who know of our plans, the better. That includes David. You'd prefer he did not accompany us? Ramses leaned against the desk and ran his fingers through his hair. It was one of the few signs of perturbation he permitted himself. One infatuated young female had gushed about the Byronic look of those tousled black curls. In my opinion, they were simply untidy. I reached up and brushed them back from his forehead. Ramses shook his head impatiently, as if dislodging a fly, and went on. I would prefer that no one go except father and me. You needn't protest, mother. I'm well aware that you would never consent to be left behind. Neither wouldn't have read. But David, so far, knows nothing about this. He'd come, of course, without an instant's hesitation. But he's very much in love and newly engaged. And if Leah knew what he was walking into, she'd be beside herself. God knows our normal excavation seasons are wild enough. But at least we don't go looking for trouble. Well, usually we don't. You needn't go over the arguments, I said with a sigh. I've considered them myself, plus the fact that David could not contribute anything to the expedition except his stout heart and strong hands. Does he know about the lost oasis? Not from me. Uncle Walter and Aunt Evelyn know. That was unavoidable, I said defensively. Your Uncle Walter is a philologist. Once he heard Nefret speak in the language of the Holy Mountain, he recognized its relationship to ancient Egyptian, and Evelyn's suspicions were aroused by some of Nefret's uh, unusual habits. It seemed safest to tell them the whole story and ask them to take an oath of secrecy, which, to the best of my knowledge, they've never broken. How do you propose to prevent David from coming out with us as he has always done? Did you know that Constable, the publisher approached him in London about doing a series of paintings for a popular book about Egypt. Really? He never mentioned it. He didn't mention it to me until just before he left for Yorkshire. He was afraid I'd urge him to accept and abandon my own plans, rather than leave father without half his staff. Emerson wouldn't have taken that well, I agreed. Hmm. I believe you've found the answer to this particular dilemma. It would be a wonderful opportunity for David, a chance to build a reputation of his own, without being dependent on us. But it would mean keeping our real purpose a secret. We'll have to do that in any case. The kittens were rolling around on the floor in mock battle. One of them let out a squeak of protest, and Ramses went to separate them. Holding the victim away from its rougher sibling, he went on... When we returned in 98, we agreed that the very existence of the place must remain unknown. But although our fiction passed muster with the general public, there were a few people who wondered whether we were telling the whole truth. People who remembered Willie Forth's theory about a lost oasis in the Western Desert. People like your journalist friend, O'Connell, who had learnt from the officers of the military camp at Sanam Abu Dom about Forth's nephew Reggie setting off in search of him. We should be all right if we can keep such people from making the connection between that last journey and our intention of heading again for the Sudan. The greatest danger is Merison himself. He paused for breath, having spoken with unusual quickness and passion. Glancing at my list, I said approvingly, I commend you, Ramses, on stating the facts almost as logically as I might have done. Thank you, Mother. You had, of course, already considered all those points. I gave him a sharp look, but his face was quite grave, not even a little quiver at the corners of his mouth. I had, yes, those and others. I fear your father has not. He is inclined to ignore difficulties once he has set his mind on something. I will have a little chat with him. Will you speak to Nefret? Ramses went to the window, where he stood looking out. Your opinion would carry more weight with her. Do you think so? Yes, said Ramses, without turning. 
She's out there now, with medicine, practising archery. They were on the lawn, with half the household watching. When I went onto the terrace, the maids scattered in various directions, trying to look as if they'd had business in that part of the house. But Gargery stood his ground. A proper sport for a young lady, he announced. If I may say so, madam, it shows off a pretty figure to best advantage. I did not reprimand him for this familiarity, since a look of almost paternal pride warmed his plain features. She did look very pretty in her neat, divided skirt and shirtwaist, her hair clubbed back and bound with ribbons. She loosed the arrow, which flew straight to the target, though not to its centre. Merison said something to her in a low voice. She laughed and looked up at the terrace, where Gargery was clapping his hands enthusiastically. "'Good afternoon, Aunt Amelia. Thank you, Gargery, but Merison says I need more practice.' "'I'd like to see him do better,' Gargery declared, scowling at the critic. Nefret offered the bow to Merison. He folded his arms and shook his head. "'It is a woman's bow.' "'Stop for a bit, Nefret.' I said, you look very warm, and I'd like to talk to you. She handed the weapon to Merison and came up the steps to the terrace, wiping her wet forehead with her sleeve. I got rid of Gargery by asking him to get Nefret something to drink and went straight to the point, before he could come running back. She looked surprised when I mentioned David's offer from the publisher. He didn't tell me either. How nice. It would be just the thing for him. I'm afraid I hadn't given the matter much thought, Aunt Amelia. But you are absolutely right. The fewer people who know our plans, the better. Can we keep them secret, do you think? I'm about to consult Emerson on that subject. Once we have worked out the details, we will have a little council of war. I took it upon myself to beard Emerson in his lair, the library. When I told him what Ramses and I had agreed upon... He gave me an outraged stare. I will need David Cursett. Copying the reliefs in the temples and tombs of the Holy Mountain is of paramount importance. Emerson, will you try to get it through your head that this is not an archaeological expedition, but a rescue mission? We will be lucky to get there at all, much less get away again. How can you think of risking David's life? We are risking the lives of Ramses and Nefret, Emerson pointed out. He sounded a trifle subdued, though and his brow was furrowed. Only because they were made aware of the situation by Merison before we could prevent him. David is not aware of it. Given a free choice, he would much rather remain in England this winter with Lear. You must convince him he will not be needed. How? Emerson demanded. He knows how useful he is to me. I doubt that, since you have never paid him a compliment. Emerson looked blank, and I went on in mounting exasperation. As soon as we announce the date of our departure, all our friends, including Walter and Evelyn, are going to ask where we mean to work this winter and why we are leaving so much earlier than usual. What do you propose to tell them? I do not propose to tell anyone anything, said Emerson haughtily. I never discuss my plans in advance. Not even with Walter? Hmm. Emerson fingered the cleft in his chin, leaving a smear of ink on that admirably modelled member. I suppose you have a few ideas. You always do. Naturally. Everyone knows that you are in a temper with Maspero. It would be quite in character for you to declare you won't excavate in Egypt this year. Our movements will be observed and commented upon, and we must have a sensible reason for travelling to the Sudan. For instance, a survey of the Meruitic sites with a view to future excavation. Mm, that might work, Emerson admitted with the dam at Aswan about to be raised. A number of the sites will be under water all or part of the time. He put down his pen and smiled at me. As always, Peabody, you are the voice of conscience and common sense. I confess that I hadn't given that aspect of the case much thought. You'd better, I retorted. The compliment and the smile had softened me, but I felt it advisable to hammer the point home while Emerson was in a chastened mood. Covering our tracks won't be easy, but it must be done. Otherwise, we will have a pack of journalists, archaeologists, and treasure hunters on our trail. Not to mention Walter and Evelyn. Emerson's fingers twitched. He had only agreed with me so that I would go away and let him get back to work. 
Confound it, Peabody. Your suggestion about excavating in the Sudan makes perfectly good sense, and I am willing to accept it. There is no reason why anyone should doubt the story. Why are you anticipating difficulties that don't exist? Better safe than sorry, Emerson. I might have known you would answer with an aphorism, Emerson grumbled. Oh, the devil, do as you like. I leave it to you to cover our tracks, as you put it. I'd thought he would. I have made one of my little lists, I explained, removing the paper from my pocket. Emerson grinned reluctantly. I thought you would. The first thing is to get Merrison away from here as soon as possible. That we have had such a visitor is known to the servants, but even Gargery, with all his poking and prying, has only the vaguest notion of where he came from or why. Gargery has not enough experience to realise how unusual he is, in appearance, language and manner, but I assure you, it would not take David long to begin wondering about him. That's sensible, I suppose, Emerson admitted. What do you propose to do with him? Send him on ahead of us to Egypt and to Wadi Halfa. On his own? He got here all the way from the Sudan on his own. Emerson frowned, and I said impatiently, We will supply him with ample funds and specific directions. The longer he remains, the greater the danger that someone will become curious about his antecedents. What if Kevin O'Connell should drop in without warning, as he is inclined to do? What if Evelyn and Walter should decide to pay us a visit? One word from medicine in the language of the Holy Mountain, and Walter's linguistic antennae would be quivering. Hmm. I must admit, Emerson admitted, that you have made a point. Very well. I will take the boy to London and make arrangements. What else? You will announce your intentions to the Department of Antiquities. Yes, Emerson, you must. It might be a good idea for you to write to Mr. Breasted. He is back in Chicago, I suppose, and ask him about his survey in Nubia last winter. It must all be open and above board. I propose that we announce we are going directly to Meroe. It is 300 miles south of Napata, where we were working in 97, and from which we disappeared into the desert, as the journalists so poetically put it. That should put people off the track. It will put us off the track, too, by a long distance, Emerson protested. We needn't actually go to Meroe, I said impatiently. So long as people believe we are not going to Napata. Merrison was rather pleased than otherwise to leave us. We were not very entertaining company for a lively lad whose ideas of amusement were quite different from ours. I hadn't seen fit to mention to Emerson that one of the reasons why I had wanted him out of the way had to do with the housemaids. After all, what was there for him to do? We had forbidden him to leave the grounds, and the library was of no interest to him. The men of the Holy Mountain were noted archers, but he had haughtily refused to display his skill, claiming we had no bow worthy of his strength. From time to time, Ramses resignedly consented to wrestle with him, but those sessions did not last long since Ramses was uncommonly rough with him. After one such encounter, which ended after approximately thirty seconds, with Merrison doubled up like a worm, whooping for breath, Nefret remonstrated... Ramsay's only response was a curt, he asked for it. This did not improve relations between Ramsay's and Nefret, but even she did not object when Emerson took the boy up to London in order to put him on a boat to Port Said. His necessarily extended journey from the Sudan to Cairo and thence to England had familiarised him with the country and the language, and he assured us that he had made friends along the way. I suspected from his complacent smile that most of the friends were female. He appears to be taking this delay rather lightly, said Ramses, after we had said farewell to the travellers. One would have expected him to urge us to press on. Why do you constantly find fault with him? Nefret demanded. We promised we would follow as soon as is humanly possible, and he knew we would keep our word. Ramses shrugged and looked particularly enigmatic. Seeing that Nefret was about to pursue the matter, I said, He has the fatalism of his people, a quality we might well be advised to emulate at this time. What has happened has happened. We cannot change the past. Nefret, have you any idea what this mysterious illness might be? 
It was Nefret's turn to shrug. Merison wasn't much help when it came to describing precise symptoms. It could be something as simple as malaria, or something as deadly as an unknown tropical disease. What did you two talk about then? I asked, for I had wondered before. All sorts of things. Her eyes shifted, avoiding mine. He is immensely curious about England. And I, said Ramses, have been immensely curious about the Holy Mountain. Things must have changed a good deal in ten years, but I wasn't able to get much practical information out of him. Did you have better luck? There haven't been that many changes, Nefret said, somewhat defensively. I find that hard to believe, said Ramses, raising his expressive eyebrows. When we took our hasty departure, Tarek had not yet overcome all those who opposed him. His brother Nasterson was dead, but forthright, your renegade cousin, was still on the loose, and so was the old high priest of Amun who had supported Nasterson. I also questioned Merison about them, I said. He claimed he had never heard of Reggie forthright. What's so surprising about that? Nefret demanded. Merison was only seven or eight years old at the time. Reggie must have been caught by Tarek and executed, as he well deserved. The high priest of Amun, too. He was the ringleader of the rebels. There was also a social revolution, Ramses persisted. Tarek wanted to improve the living conditions of the Reckitt, who were no better than slaves. I drew a dead blank when I asked Merison about that. He doesn't strike me as interested in social reform, I remarked, and it is possible that the changes Tarek hoped to make were frustrated by the dead hand of tradition. If Emerson is correct in believing the Reckitt were the original inhabitants of the Holy Mountain, they have been enslaved for centuries, ever since the first Egyptians arrived there. What a sad commentary on human nature that the strong do not succour and assist the weak, but rather... How will you put it, mother? said Ramses. I took the hint. Ah, oh, well, we'll learn the truth when we get there. Ramsay said under his breath, If we get there. Emerson returned from London to announce he had sent Merrison on his way and that the boy appeared to be looking forward to the journey. He doesn't lack self-confidence, I'll say that for him, was Emerson's comment. Before I got him on board, I took him to the museum, and he... For pity's sake, Emerson, why did you do that? I demanded. I was under the impression that we wanted to keep him away from people who might suspect his origins. Oh, said Emerson, self-consciously. Well, but it's all right, people do. The only person he ran into was Budge, and he wouldn't know a Bishari tribesman from a Bedouin. That is pure nonsense, Emerson, and you know it. Budge may have attained his position as keeper of Egyptian and Assyrian antiquities because of his underhanded methods of acquiring artefacts for the museum. But he has been often in Egypt and the Sudan. Didn't he ask you about medicine? What the devil did you go there for? I only wanted to show the boy a few objects and get his opinion, Emerson said defensively. Budge was his usual self, supercilious and insulting. He completely ignored the boy. Oh, really? What precisely did Mr. Budge say? Um... You see, as it happened, we were in the section devoted to Meroitic material, and uh, Budge um, asked where you meant to work this year. Emerson can only be pushed so far. My accusatory tone brought a wicked sparkle to his sapphirine orbs. Curse it, Peabody! You told me to be open and above board about our plans. Well, I said... David is due tomorrow, and we are overdue for a conference. Shall we meet in the library in half an hour? When Emerson got there, now divested of his travelling attire and wearing comfortable rumpled garments, we were waiting for him. Emerson looked at me, settled at his desk with my papers spread out in front of me, and went at once to the table where the decanters were kept. Whiskey and soda, Peabody, he inquired. It's too early, Emerson. No, it isn't, Peabody. Here. I admit, Emerson went on, settling into a comfortable, overstuffed chair near the bust of Socrates, that perhaps I acted a bit roughly by taking 
Merrison to the British Museum. I allowed professional curiosity to overcome me. I wonder, Mother, said Ramses, if we have fully considered the implications of this venture. No doubt you will enlighten us, I remarked. Let the boy speak, Peabody, said Emerson, taking out his pipe, without, if you please, interrupting him. Thank you, Father. I've been thinking it over, and I've reached the conclusion that this expedition must mark the end of the Holy Mountain's isolation, or at least the beginning of the end. It was bound to happen sooner rather than later. The lure of the lost oases of the Western Desert has never faded, and lately there seems to have been a resurgence of interest. The Journal of the Royal Geographical Society had an article only last month about the Zerzura problem. But the lost city of Zerzura is a legend, I exclaimed. I remember reading about it in the Book of Hidden Pearls, which is nothing more than a medieval collection of fairy tales. It's a little more than a legend, Mother, as you are well aware. The fellows of the Royal Geographical Society are too hard-headed to give credence to legends, but many of them believe there are undiscovered oases in the Libyan desert. In another few years, if the technology continues to improve, as it has done, someone will develop a motor car that is capable of desert travel, and that will extend the possible range of exploration. As for our trip, I would take certain risks for Tarek but I would be damned if I will take the risk of mounting any but a large-scale expedition. It is to our advantage to keep our purpose secret beforehand, since we don't want a pack of curiosity seekers and treasure hunters following us. But if we do get there and return, the men who accompany us will spread the word. We can hardly imprison or intimidate all of them. He straightened, hands still in his pockets, and looked challengingly from me to Nefret, who was biting her lip to his father, who was placidly smoking his pipe. It's the truth, isn't it? Yes, I admitted. But that would be a catastrophe, Nefret exclaimed. Once the Holy Mountain is known to the world, it'll be exploited by treasure hunters and adventurers. And archaeologists, said Emerson, scowling. Men like Budge, who will tear the place apart, collecting artefacts for his cursed museum. No doubt you have anticipated this little difficulty, Peabody, and have considered methods of preventing it. I have a few ideas. However, I went on before Emerson could express his scepticism, I see no point in discussing them in vacuo, so to speak. At present we have no idea what sort of reception we will receive or what conditions we are likely to encounter. We are agreed, are we not, that until we reach the point of no return... I don't like the sound of that, Emerson muttered. The point at which we set out on the final journey. That's not much better, Peabody. Oh, Emerson, do be quiet, you know what I mean. Until our expedition is ready to go into the desert, we should be able to keep people in the dark as to our real goal. We've discussed this in general, but we must work out the details. What we must do, what we must say, and to whom it must be said, in order to add verisimilitude to an otherwise... All right, Peabody, all right. Have another whiskey and don't quote Gilbert and Sullivan at me. By the time David arrived the following afternoon, we had put together a convincing fiction. Though we did not really cover all the contingencies, and I had an uneasy feeling... I would have called it a premonition, if Emerson did not object to my using that word, that we hadn't anticipated everything. At first, David could talk of nothing but Leah. Her grace, her sweetness, her beauty, the interminable years that must pass before he could call her his. She was not yet eighteen, and, as he admitted, he was in no position to support a wife. Not until after dinner, when we retired to the sitting-room for coffee, did he ask about our strange visitor, concerning whom he had heard from Gargery. Yes, a most interesting young fellow, Emerson said, fussing with his pipe. His grandfather is an old acquaintance of mine, a sheikh of a village in the Sudan, who sent the boy to England to um, broaden him, and uh, incidentally to tell me about some interesting ruins uh, west of Meroe uh, that have never been investigated. I have therefore decided to spend the autumn in a survey of upper Nubian archaeological sites. 
I won't be needing you, David, so you may as well accept that offer from Constable. David looked bewildered, as well he might. Emerson's open, candid nature is not suited to deception. Instead of working up to his conclusion with a wealth of confirmatory detail, he had simply thrown it at David. But, sir, he stammered, that is, how, how did you... I don't understand. It's very simple, said Emerson, to whom it was. When he makes a decision, he expects everyone will accept it. I don't need you. Constable does. David turned in silent appeal to Ramses, who said easily, I told father about the offer from Constable David. He agreed that it was an opportunity you shouldn't miss. But your plans, David began, have nothing to do with yours, Ramses cut in. Father means to leave almost at once, and we will finish the most important part of the survey within a few months. I'll go to Germany in January. Nefret took David's hand and squeezed it. Leah will be so happy. She was in tears when she spoke of your leaving. She was? The idea of Leah in tears brought moisture to David's soft brown eyes. Oh, she'd have sent you off with a brave smile, but, said Nefret, her heart would be breaking. I thought she was carrying the pathos a little too far, so I said briskly, So that is settled. Why don't you ask Gargery to see if he can place a telephone call to Yorkshire, so you can tell Lear the good news? I'd better find out whether Constable are still interested, David said slowly. They are, I said. David turned to stare at me. Having put my foot in my mouth, I attempted to extract it. I took the liberty of ringing them up yesterday, I explained. Mr. Constable was delighted. I uh, wanted to be certain the position was still open before I, uh, we discussed it with you. I see, David said. I hope you don't mind, dear. Not at all, Aunt Amelia. It was good of you. His eyes moved from me to Ramsay's. Come up for a talk? I saw Ramses brace himself. He hated to lie to his friend, but I knew he would do it if he had to. And he would have to. David was still hesitating, and no wonder. The story we had concocted was the best we could come up with, but trained copyists would be at a premium on such an expedition, and here we were proposing to do without one of the best. Do you think we convinced him? Lefret asked, after the two boys had left the room together. Convinced be damned said Emerson. He will do as he is told. What the devil! One would suppose a young lover would leap at the chance to be with his betrothed. Eh, Peabody? What a romantic you are, Emerson. Whatever Ramsay's arguments, they achieved the desired end. David demurred no longer. He went up to London to confer with the publisher and returned bursting with excitement about his assignment. A series of portraits of Egyptian kings and queens based on statues and, in some cases, actual mummies. But, of course, prettified, as David put it, for modern tastes. He and Ramsay's and Nefret poured over volumes of photographs and engravings, selecting the representations David meant to use. They all appeared to enjoy this. A good deal of laughter and a few rude comments issued from David's room when they were there together. Perhaps it was the imminence of separation that made them so fond with one another. Even Ramsay's was less aloof, submitting to Nefret's impulsive sisterly embraces with a smiling grace he had not exhibited for a long time. He had his reclusive moments. From time to time he would go off on long, solitary rambles across the countryside, returning soaked with perspiration and scratched by brambles. I thought he was overdoing it, and said so. He replied that he was trying to get in fit condition for the arduous labours that lay ahead. If by fit he meant thin, he certainly achieved that condition. Rose wrung her hands over him and had Cook make all his favourite dishes. By the time we left England, he was as brown and as lean as one of the ancient wooden statues in the Cairo Museum. You look more and more like Count Hesse Ray, Nefret remarked. She poked him in the chest with a slim forefinger. Ow, you feel like him too. Solid wood. I take that as a compliment, said Ramses. He's not a bad-looking chap. Shall I grow a moustache to further the resemblance? No, I don't like moustaches. Or beards. You may have to put up with them, 
said Emerson, who had listened to the exchange with interest. He gave me a challenging look and fingered the cleft in his prominent chin. Can't waste water shaving in the desert. Emerson is always looking for an excuse to grow a beard. I refused to rise to the challenge, but I made sure his razors were packed. Once we had announced our departure, Walter and Evelyn came hurrying from Yorkshire to pay us a farewell visit. They brought Leah, naturally. David said no more about accompanying us. Love, if I may be permitted a poetic metaphor, settles like a warm blanket on the brain, smothering the critical faculties. Walter was not so easily horn-swoggled, a most expressive slang word which I had learned from Cyrus Vandergelt. He managed to corner Emerson and me one afternoon while Nefret was entertaining Evelyn. This is your first visit to the Sudan in a long time, he began. Uh, yes, said Emerson. We wanted then to excavate at Meroe, as you recall, I said, realizing that Emerson was not up to the task of convincing deception, since the expeditionary armies had not got that far in 97, and the southern Sudan was still in the hands of the dervishes, we were forced to settle for Napata. Now we have the opportunity to do a comprehensive survey of the region, and I'm told that conditions have improved greatly. Yes, I see. So you've no intention of returning to... you know the place. Walter, you are letting your imagination run away with you, I declared. Why on earth would we do such a foolish thing? There are a number of nice ruins in Nubia, including pyramids, and they are vanishing at alarming speed. Our primary duty is to preserve and record those specimens of the past. Emerson believes that the remains of the ancient city of Meroe lie under the sands. What a contribution to science its discovery would be. I've never heard such a pack of lies, not even from you, Peabody, said Emerson after Walter had left us. If you think over what I said, Emerson, you will do me the credit of conceding that I did not tell a single falsehood. I never do, unless it is absolutely necessary. I heard nothing from Kevin O'Connell. Inquiries produced the information that he was in hospital in Switzerland, having fallen off a mountain while following up a ridiculous rumour that the remains of the Ark of the Deluge had been seen there. I was not at all surprised. Kevin specialised in ancient curses and wild invention. After almost dying of exposure, he was making a good recovery. But it would be some time before he could return to work. I sent him a nice box of glacade apricots from Fordham and Mason. One of the advantages of our itinerary, one of the few advantages, I should say, was that we couldn't possibly take a cat along... One or another of them, starting with Ramsay's lost but never-to-be-forgotten bastard, had usually accompanied us to Egypt, but travel in the Sudan was still inconvenient and complicated, and the very idea of Horus riding a camel through the desert for two weeks boggled the mind. Neither Horus nor Gargery approved of the former's staying at Amana House, and we left both of them sulking. On the day of our departure, we stood at the rail of the steamer, waving farewell to those who had come to see us off. The family had turned out in force, including two of Lear's brothers. Johnny and Willie were as alike as two peas, with their father's refined features and their mother's fair hair. But their temperaments were quite different. Willie was a serious soul, and Johnny was as ebullient as a schoolboy. He was livelier even than usual that day, playing the clown to keep spirits high, for parting is always painful. He had one arm round David's shoulders and the other round Lear. The twins had been unwavering in their support for the lovers. Their influence, as much as my own, had helped to win over their parents. Catching my fond eye, Johnny raised his voice to a bellow. Don't worry, Aunt Amelia. We'll make sure they behave themselves. He directed a low-voiced comment to David who blushed. The ship moved away. David cupped his hands round his mouth and called out to Ramses, Good luck, my brother. Good luck in what? Nefret asked. Nothing in particular, Ramses replied. 
Carefully, he detached the little hands that clung to his arm. Excuse me, I must unpack. If we could have proceeded directly from Port Said to the Sudan, avoiding all our friends and acquaintances, I would have been sorely tempted to do so. I have no moral objection to prevarication when it serves a good end, but... As I had learned from painful experience, it is cursed difficult to avoid slips of the tongue. I was not worried about Ramses, who could look St. Peter straight in the eye and lie, nor even about Nefret. Emerson was my chief concern. When in a temper into which he is easily provoked, he is apt to blurt out the most appalling statements. To have behaved so unusually would only have invited speculation— which we had to avoid at all costs. A few days in Cairo, collecting supplies, a few more days in Luxor with our Egyptian family, Abdullah's kin, telling them the news for which they hungered and preparing them for our removal to the Sudan, and then we would be on our way. We should arrive at Wadi Halfa by the first week in September. Another fortnight should complete our preparations, and by that time the weather would be, if not comfortable, endurable. My complacency received its first check when we docked at Port Said, and I beheld a too familiar form amid the throng of porters, custom house officials, and souvenir sellers who vied for the attention of the arriving passengers. It was impossible to mistake Daoud, Abdullah's nephew and assistant Rais. His elaborate turban towered a full head over those of the people around him, and his large, benevolent face bore a smile of welcome. I had to look again before I recognized the slighter man who stood next to him. Selim, Abdullah's youngest son, seemed to have grown several inches since the previous spring, and the beard he had decided to grow in order to give him greater authority as Abdullah's successor had got out of hand. It was neatly trimmed, Selim was a handsome man and something of a dandy, but it stretched clear down to his breastbone. The devil? said Emerson. What are they doing here? I didn't telegraph. People did, did you? No. I returned Dowd's salutation. Slouching against the rail, Ramsay said, The Cairo newspapers print the passenger lists of incoming boats. The word spreads. I assumed you had anticipated that, mother. Nefret chuckled. Just look at Selim's beard. Hmm, said Emerson, staring enviously at the appendage. Dowd was at the foot of the gangplank when we descended. He never pushed or shoved, for he was the gentlest of men, unless provoked. He simply moved forward with ponderous inevitability, clearing a path. Not the slightest shade of reproach marred the sunshine of his smile, but after he had gone off with Ramses to deal with the luggage and the customs people, Selim bent a freezing frown upon me. Why did you creep into the country like thieves without telegraphing us? "'We wanted to surprise you,' Efret said, taking hold of his arm. "'Selim, the beard, magnificent!' Selim preened himself, but his grievance was too strong to be so easily overcome. "'We heard it from Mohasib, who had been told by Abdul at the Winter Palace, "'who overheard a guest reading it from the newspaper. "'For us to get news of you from such people shames us. "'And why is David not with you?' And why have you not told me where we will be working? And what... Don't lecture me, curse it, Emerson shouted. At least not in public. Good God, you sound just like your father. There was a slight tremor in his manly voice when he pronounced the last words. He cleared his throat. Hmm. Well, Peabody, what are we going to do with this insubordinate young rascal? I had been against taking Selim and our other devoted men into the unknown. None of them, including Amdallah, had gone with us on our first trip to the Sudan, since we'd been working in what was technically a war zone. The military authorities refused to give them permission. However, the situation had changed. Emerson and Ramses had pointed out, with depressing logic, that we would have to take some of them at least as far as Meroe in order to support the story about a survey. A point they had not made, which was now apparent, was that Selim would wax even more insubordinate if we attempted to go off without him. "'Tell him our plans,' I said with a sigh and a smile. "'I hope you don't mind waiting, Selim, until we are on the train. 
I want to get out of this pestilential place and into the comforts of shepherds as soon as is possible. Selim folded his arms. The Amelia is ready for you, Sit. Fatima is there now. How did you manage that? I asked with sincere admiration. We had left the Dehabiya in dry dock. Selim must have bullied, bribed and threatened at least a dozen people to get it ready so quickly. All signs of pique forgotten, Emerson grinned and slapped the young man approvingly on the shoulder. He hates hotels. I am your rice, said Selim. The best rice in Egypt, now that my father is no more. Come, I have the tickets for the train. The train takes six and a half hours from Port Said to Cairo. Emerson and Ramses promptly removed coats, hats, waistcoats and cravats. And after an apologetic glance at me, Lefret unfastened the top buttons of her frock and pushed her sleeves up. As sand sifted into my collar and mixed with perspiration to form a gritty paste, I reflected that this was only a faint foretaste of the discomfort we could expect as we went farther south. We had never been in Egypt so early in the season. I now remembered why. At first, Selim was not enthusiastic about working in the Sudan. However, when I said he and the others need not accompany us, since we could easily find local workers, his beard positively bristled. Did you hear that, Daud? he demanded. They say we must stay behind. No, no, said Daud placidly. Where the father of Kursus goes, we go. Where is it he is going? Emerson went on at length about the pyramids at Meroe and their ruinous condition and the need to record what was left of them before they fell apart. It was familiar stuff to sell him, and Dow didn't really care. When Emerson ran down, after quite a long lecture, Selim nodded and stroked his beard. So, it should be an interesting adventure. Local workers we can hire, as you say. But you will need trained men to supervise them. How many? There was not room for six in a single cab, especially when one of the six was Daoud, so Nefret asked Selim to ride with her. Very little disturbed Daoud's placid temperament, and he had accepted our explanation of David's absence with a nod. A man must earn money to support a wife. He will work hard and make her happy. When will they be married? They must come to Egypt for that. I listened with a smile, but only half an ear, while he proceeded to plan the wedding, interrupting himself occasionally to thrust his head out the cab window and announce Emerson's presence in stentorian tones. Emerson was not at all put out by this, since he likes his presence to be known, and he was constantly hailing old acquaintances, of whom he has a great many in Cairo. After a rather vulgar exchange with one of these, he turned to Ramses. So much for making an inconspicuous entry, he remarked. Half the population of Cairo already knows we are here, and the rest will know by evening. This caught Dowd's attention. The presence of the father of curses is like the sun rising over the desert, he announced. Even a blind man feels the warmth of his presence. Bah, said Emerson. We went to the docks at Bulak, where the Amelia lay among others of her kind. Not as many as in past years, alas, for the private de Habia was no longer the favoured method of travel. Cook steamers and the railroad had made tourism a popular business. In my opinion, the change was not for the better. What had once been a leisurely educational trip through the most fascinating country in the world had become a whirlwind tour with no time to inspect the sights and very little contact with the local population. Cook's people went about in flocks like silly sheep, bleating and herded by their guides. They ate English food, lived in rooms furnished in English style, spoke only English, complained constantly, and bargained mercilessly with individuals whose daily income was a few pennies. I must confess I rather enjoyed seeing such a group set upon by the importunate peddlers and vendors and donkey boys. Fatima was waiting for us. There were rose petals in the wash basins. After a week in Cairo, we had completed most of our necessary business, and there had been no word from medicine. Where can the boy have got to? I demanded, as we prepared for a little shopping trip. 
I needed a new parasol, and Emerson another pair of boots. I hope nothing untoward has befallen him. I told you we ought to have sent him to lodge with one of your acquaintances in Cairo. No, you didn't, Emerson snarled. He was not of the opinion that he required another pair of boots. A few contacts with our acquaintances, the better, you said. He was correct. I had said that. You did tell him to leave a message for us here, announcing his safe arrival in Cairo? I told him to leave word at Shepherd's, since I had anticipated we would be staying there. As you know, they informed me there had been no such message, and that they would send on any that might arrive. Are you sure he understood? Nefret asked anxiously. She and Ramses were not going with us. She had met a most interesting lady, a Syrian physician, and had hopes of persuading her to participate in a scheme dear to Nefret's tender heart, a clinic which would offer medical services to the miserable prostitutes of Cairo. Gazing into the mirror, she tipped her hat to one side, frowned, and tipped it to the other side. We don't really need him, Ramses was sprawled on the sofa. We have the map, maps rather. It was a good idea of yours, mother, that each of us should carry a copy. Good heavens, you aren't proposing we abandon Marison, are you? Nefret demanded. He may be ill, injured, lost. He can't find his way back without us, Emerson said, his brow furrowing. Striking the Nile without a map is one thing. Finding a single, isolated spot in the middle of the desert. He'll turn up, I said firmly. A message might easily have been mislaid. If we do not hear from him by the time we reach Halfa, I will uh, take steps. In fact, I was at something of a loss as to how to proceed without involving the police or Emerson's network of Egyptian gossips. Nefret turned from the mirror. Ramses, if you're coming with me, kindly assume proper attire. I want to make a good impression. You are impressive enough already. You don't need me decked out in a stiff collar and tie. Ramses retorted. Please. She knelt by him and looked up into his face, dimpling and fluttering her lashes. Practicing, are you? Ramses inquired. Oh, all right. Be back in a minute. When he returned, he was wearing a new tweed suit I had forced him to purchase in England, a collar coat that reached clear to his chin, and a nice straw boater. What did this do? he inquired. Nefret studied the effect. Her lips twitched. You look absurd. It's the latest thing, Ramses protested. I know. It just doesn't suit you, somehow. She removed the hat and ran her hand over his head, smoothing his ruffled black hair. That's better. Thank you. Can I leave off the collar? It's choking me. Nefret shook her head, laughing. I appreciate the effort, dear. Would you do suffer for me? You haven't the least idea, said Ramses. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. The lady doesn't dwell in a very elegant neighborhood, Ramses remarked, as Nefret led him deeper into the old city. She can't afford better, Nefret said. It's perfectly respectable. I don't see why you and Selim insisted on coming with me. She glanced over her shoulder at Selim. The lane was too narrow for all three to walk abreast, especially with donkeys and camels contesting the right of way. Ramses had to admit she was right, though. Unlike the infamous Red Blind districts, this part of Cairo was safe enough. It was just poor and overcrowded and dirty. Every foot of ground was built upon, the old buildings rising two or three stories high and nudging one another on both sides. There was no place to bury trash and no one to carry it off, so it was simply left to lie until an occasional rain washed the worst of it away. Piles of donkey and camel dung added their pungent odours to the sour, sweet smell of rotting fruit. Skirts raised, Lefret picked a path through the mess, and since she had declined to take his arm, he fell a little behind so he could stare at her, her walk, the tilt of her head, the knot of golden hair at the nape of her neck, without making herself conscious. David believed he had changed his mind about avoiding the fret. Avoidance had been a selfish and cowardly way out of a situation that was no one's fault. He'd always known this. So, when he told David he'd decided to stick it out, 
cultivate patience and enjoy the friendship that had meant so much without demanding more. He'd been partially sincere. The series of noble-sounding clichés had gone over well with David, innocent that he was, and they had succeeded in convincing him that Ramses was not making a sacrifice on his account. He couldn't have said what warned him. A flash of movement out of the corner of his eye, a fleeting impression of a face. He gave Nefret a hard shove and twisted aside, not quite in time to avoid a stinging slash across the arm he had raised to protect his face. Turning in the same movement, he saw the boy crouched, facing him, white teeth bared. The weapon he held had a wicked shine, and it was considerably longer than a typical Arab knife. Pedestrians backed off, leaving a clear space for the combatants. Selim forced his way past a donkey loaded with pots and reached Nefret, who'd been flung with considerable force against a shop front. She had breath enough left to swear, though. Don't get in his way, Selim warned, catching hold of her. Merison's smile broadened. I give you time to take out your knife. I don't need a knife, Ramsay said in exasperation. A hard kick sent the weapon flying out of Merison's hand. It squelched onto the muck of the roadway, and Ramses slammed his foot down on it. What the hell do you think you're doing? he demanded. Merison cradled his bruised fingers tenderly in his left hand and looked up at Ramses with reproachful black eyes. It was only a game to see if you are as good with a knife as with your hands. I did not mean to cut you. It was an accident. Nefret pushed Selim away. Are you hurt, Ramses? The greatest damage is to my expensive new coat, Ramses said sourly. Mother will have a few words to say about that. Nefret took his word for it. There wasn't much blood visible against the brown tweed of his sleeve. Ramses caught Merison by the neck of his galabilla and hauled him to his feet. My finger is broken, Merison complained, extending a rigid digit. Try that again, my fine young friend, and I'll break all ten of them, Ramses said. I am sorry, Merison said earnestly. It was only a game be damned. The fret snapped. Let me see your finger. It's not broken, only bruised. I want you to go straight away to the Dehabiya and report yourself to the father of Cassis. Can I trust you to do that? Oh, yes. Merison's smile was seraphic. Not on your life, Ramsay said, tightening his grip. I will deliver you personally, my lad. The fret, do you go on with Selim? Selim had retrieved Merison's weapon, just in time to prevent a hopeful scavenger from making off with it. It would have fetched a fair price, the blade shone steely grey, and the hilt was decorated with strips of gold. Merison made a grab for it. Ramses knocked his arm down. God damn it, he said. How long have you been carrying that around with you? If it fell into the wrong hands... He feared it already had. Selim had wiped the blade clean and was examining it curiously. I've never seen one like it, Ramses. Too long for a knife, too short for a sword, and too richly decorated. Who is this man, and where does he come from? I'll introduce you properly at a later time, Ramses said. Go with Nefret. Perhaps we should help you take Merison to the Dehabia, Nefret said uncertainly. Dr. Sophia is expecting you. I assure you, Nefret, I can manage him all by my little self. Merison, I'll break your arm if you give me any trouble. Merison made no attempt to wrench away from Ramsay's grip. He was as cheerful and unrepentant as a little boy who has smacked someone with a snowball. Maybe rough-and-tumble wrestling was a custom of the holy mountain I missed, Ramsay's thought. But in most of the cultures in which he was familiar, you didn't attack without warning and with a sharp blade, unless you meant to damage the other fellow. He had directed Selim to take charge of the sword knife and keep it out of sight, a galabia being more appropriate for such concealment than European trousers. Be careful you don't slash your leg, he had added. And Nefret had said, laughing, or something else, I'll rig up some sort of scabbard for it when we're at Dr. Sophia, Selim. She had inspected Merison's finger, but she hadn't even bothered to look at Ramsay's arm. What did you expect, Ramsay's asked himself, that she would rush to you, all a-quiver at the sight of your blood? The answer was no, not Nefret. It wasn't the first time, 
but she might have been a little less nonchalant and a little harder on Merison. Where have you been staying? he asked, cutting into a vivacious description of Merison's opinion of Cairo, too big, very dirty, and the women all hiding behind veils. We may as well collect your luggage before we go on. Ramses knew the place. It was one of the better quality lodging houses for natives. Merison swaggered off to get his suitcase, and the proprietor greeted Ramses obsequiously, but without surprise. He said you would come, you or the father of curses, he explained. Did he indeed? He said the father of curses would pay. Merison came back carrying a heavy case, which Emerson must have brought for him in London. His unrepentant smile made Ramses want to shout at him, but this was not the time nor the place to ask what Merison had done with the generous funds Emerson had given him. Nor was there any use berating him for the damage he had done with his boasts and his extravagance. It was too late now. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Chapter 3 Emerson claimed the boots were too tight. They were certainly tighter than the old pair, which had been battered into shapelessness by several seasons of hard usage. The bootmaker assured him the fit was perfect, and I reminded him that new boots are always a trifle stiff, and we had a little discussion. We then proceeded to the umbrella maker, Emerson limping ostentatiously. I always purchase my parasols at the same shop, the manager has become accustomed to my requirements, which were, I admit, somewhat unusual, a heavy steel shaft and a sharpened tip. For all-round utility, nothing beats a good stout parasol. It serves as a sunshade, a walking stick, and, if necessary, as a weapon. Persons bent on mischief do not expect to be struck by a lady with a parasol. This, as I hardly need point out, gives the lady the advantage of surprise. An additional advantage was the superstitious awe with which some Egyptians regarded the implement. Dowd's tales, a few of them true, had woven an aura of magic about the parasol. And in some quarters, it was only necessary for me to brandish it in order to cow an adversary. That afternoon, the parasol served a more conventional purpose, for the sun was hot. Emerson refused its shade and removed himself a little distance to avoid being prodded by the spokes. So we were forced to converse in shouts to be heard over the bustle of the street. A good deal of the noise was occasioned by animals. There were a few motor cars in Cairo, but most of the traffic was four-footed horses pulling cabs, donkeys pulling carts, camels heavily laden with everything from sacks of grain to packing cases and complaining bitterly as is a camel's wont. Choked by dust and miserably warm in the proper garments I had assumed, I finally fell the parasol and poked Emerson, who had stopped to chat with one of the dirtiest individuals I'd ever beheld, and who had slung round his neck a tray of the most dubious scarabs I'd ever seen. Let's take a cab, Emerson. What for? Emerson demanded. The dirty peddler salamed and handed me one of the scarabs. It appeared to have been chipped out of a chunk of limestone by a person whose artistic taste was as impaired as his eyesight. I handed it back to him. Emerson, who had removed his coat and lost his hat, studied me more closely. A bit warm, my own. Why are you wearing those confounded tight-fitting clothes? Because I chose to do so. Ah, said Emerson, recognising a certain tone in my voice. In that case... He handed over a few coins, in exchange for information received, I suppose. Since he refused to accept a scarab, bade the peddler an effusive farewell, and hailed a cab. "'What did your unwashed friend have to say that was so interesting?' I asked. Emerson pushed the parasol out of his way and settled himself on the seat next to me. "'He asked why we were going to the Sudan instead of remaining in a civilised country.' Good gad, does every beggar in Cairo know? We made no secret of that part of our plan, Emerson reminded me. Even if we had, the supplies we'd been collecting would tell the tale, especially the money. One doesn't carry that amount of coinage about unless one is going into a remote region. He hesitated for a moment. However, he also inquired whether we were looking for gold. 
Oh, dear, I said in dismay. I don't like that at all, Emerson. What put such a notion into his head? Emerson fingered the cleft in his chin. People, people are saying the usual sort of vague speculation. It may not mean anything, Peabody. People have lurid imaginations, especially where we are concerned. Archaeologists have always been suspect, my dear. It is difficult for people to understand why they waste time looking for broken scraps instead of treasure. Upon reaching the Amelia, I would have hastened to change had not Mahmoud the steward intercepted us and informed us that Ramses requested that we join him in the saloon immediately. He's back already, is he? Emerson inquired. Is no Mishor with him? Light of Egypt was Nefret's beautiful Arabic name. No, father of curses, Mahmoud rolled his eyes. But someone else is. Two others were, in fact. Daoud had dropped by. He'd become fond of the English custom of tea and appreciated Fatima's sandwiches and biscuits. In his courteous fashion, he was attempting to carry on a conversation with Merison, while Ramses watched them both in silence. Emerson let out an exclamation of surprise and relief when he saw Merison. The boy at once got to his feet and began bowing. Ramses was somewhat slower to rise. Good afternoon, mother. Good afternoon. Where did you find him? Emerson demanded. He did not find me. I found him, said Merison complacently. Ramsay's lips tightened infinitesimally. I had observed he was still wearing his coat, which he generally removed as soon as he was in private. The clues were sufficient. Very well, Ramsay's, I said. Take off your coat. I see you've already damaged it. What happened? And where is Nefret? Gone on with Selim to her appointment. Ramsay's shrugged out of the garment. We uh, ran into medicine along the way, and I brought him back with me. Sorry about the coat, mother. Perhaps it can be mended. Not your shirt, though. The left sleeve was stiff with dried blood. What happened? I did it, Merrison admitted. I did not mean to. It was only a game. He put his arm in the way. Careless of me, said Ramses. Dowd's broad brow wrinkled. We do not use knives here unless we mean to kill, he said severely. Be careful, boy or I will show you how we play such games. It's all right, Daud, Ramsay said. Merrison gave Daud a hostile glare. The cut was shallow. I cleaned and bandaged it while Ramsay's gave us a brief account of the encounter. Emerson listened in silence, his gaze moving from one young face to the other. Merrison began to squirm under that keen regard. It was the wrong thing to do. In the city of the Holy Mountain. We don't do that sort of thing here, said Emerson mildly. Why are you still in Cairo? I have no more money, Father of Curses. The ticket for the train costs much money. He gave Emerson a broad, innocent smile. You had ample funds for the entire journey to Wadi Halfa, said Emerson, in the same quiet voice. What did you spend it on? I did not spend it. I was robbed here in Cairo. There are many thieves here. He was certainly right about that. However, this statement was in the same category as others he'd made, reasonable but not susceptible to proof. Under interrogation, he said that he'd just recently discovered that we were on the Amelia and had been about to present himself when he saw Ramses and Nefret leave the boat. He followed them, meaning, as he explained earnestly, to give them a little surprise. While he was explaining, Nefret and Selim came in. She acknowledged Merrison's bows with a rather curt nod and Dawood's greeting with a hug, then took the pins from her hat and tossed it onto a chair. I deduce there was no trouble or Merrison wouldn't be waving his arms so energetically, she said. I told Mahmoud to serve tea. Ramses, are you all right? Flaunting my bandages for the purpose of inspiring sympathy, said Ramses. It was my fault for getting my arm in the way. Ha, ah, said Selim. Modestly turning his back, he flipped up the skirts of his robe and removed an object which he handed to Emerson. Someone, presumably Nefret, had wound bandages round the blade, but the shape and design of the hilt were familiar to me, as they were to Emerson. Why didn't you tell me you had this, Merrison? 
he inquired. It was not your affair, father of curses, said Merison, repeating a phrase he had probably heard from me addressed to Gargery. Emerson ignored this bit of impertinence. How did it escape the attention of the slavers who robbed you? I stole it back before I escaped. It is sacred to me. Mahmoud came in with the tea tray, which he placed on the table in front of me. He stared curiously at Merison. I could understand why. On the surface, Merison could have passed as an Egyptian. Egypt is a country of mixed races, and Cairo has examples of all of them, from fair-skinned Berbers to the darker tribes of the South. The young man was wearing ordinary Egyptian dress and red leather slippers, but there was something about him. Perhaps the word was arrogance. He was a prince in his own land, and although he had undoubtedly met with contempt and ill-treatment since he left it, his self-esteem hadn't been damaged. He had demonstrated increasing resentment of our questions and implicit criticisms. Rising, he fixed us with a frown. I will go to my room now, he announced, and stalked out. My room, in point of fact, remarked Ramses. The lad has got a bit above himself, hasn't he? He reminds me of you, I said, pouring tea. Good Lord, Mother, I was never that rude. No, I conceded, but there were times when you looked down your nose at me and curled your lip in precisely that fashion. He is young and a stranger in a strange land, and arrogance is sometimes a way of disguising an underlying sense of insecurity. Don't talk psychology, Peabody, Emerson muttered. Arrogance is one thing. Attacking a friend without warning is... A custom of the Holy Mountain, Nefret said. We all looked at her in surprise. She flushed a little. I'd forgotten. The younger men used to challenge one another with daggers and short swords, rather like a duel, to prove their manhood and test their alertness. Hmm, said Emerson. I suppose they also boasted of their scars like German university students. Damn fools. He stripped off the makeshift sheath and examined the blade. Steel. They had only iron when we were last there. A good many things have changed, I expect, I began, and almost swallowed my tongue when I caught the eye of Selim, who was poised on the edge of his chair, holding his cup like an offensive weapon. Where is there? he inquired. Have you told me the truth, father of curses? Daoud let out a rumble of protest. The father of curses does not lie. Emerson might have blustered with Selim, but the trusting gaze of Daoud brought a faint blush to his tanned cheeks. Um, he said, uh, that is, um, Peabody. He did not want to lie to Daoud. He wanted me to do it. The best I could do was resort to the tale Emerson had told David, that Merison was the son of a sheikh who ruled a remote village in the southern Sudan. It had passed muster with David, but David had never set eyes on Merison, or on that unusual, distinctive sword. So it is not to Meroe that you go, but to this village, Selim persisted. It must be remote indeed, for never have I seen a weapon like that one. Do all the people of this village attack a friend without warning? Emerson felt it incumbent upon him to say something, and this question he could answer without being guilty of more than a bit of fudging. No, no, he said heartily. The sheikh is an old friend and a man of honor. There will be no danger, said Daoud calmly. We will be with them, said him. He and Selim were staying with relatives, since there was no room on the Dahabiyya. After they had taken their leave, I reached for a cucumber sandwich, but Daoud had eaten them all. Curse it, I remarked. That wretched boy has already caused trouble. How many other persons do you suppose have seen that blood-blooming sword? We'd better send him on his way at once, before someone familiar with the remote villages of the Sudan gets a look at him. I presume he will need to be resupplied with clothing and other necessities. Ramses, can you... He doesn't need anything more, Ramses replied. At my suggestion, we stopped by the house, where he's been lodging, and collected a handsome calfskin suitcase filled with clothes. I purchased them for him in London, Emerson muttered, so it wasn't the people with whom he lodged that robbed him. They would have taken the lot and probably knocked him over the head. 
What sort of place was this lodging house? Ramses glanced at me. Respectable enough. They wouldn't have dared rob him. He denounced he was a friend of the father of curses. And that information will spread too, I said with a sigh. The sooner we get him on his way, the better. I wonder who else knows about the Emerson's interesting protégé. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Ramsay's wondered too. Their carefully crafted plot was beginning to leak like a sieve, and Merrison was the one poking holes in it. He had searched Merrison's suitcase over the latter's furious objections, and had found several items which, according to Merrison, had also been retrieved from the slavers, including the scabbard for Merrison's sword, an object even more remarkable than the sword itself, with inlaid gold foil over thin strips of wood. He didn't doubt the proprietor of the hotel had also searched the boy's luggage, and he hated to think what the fellow made of that little item, and how many people he had told of it. Ramses wasn't surprised that Merrison should boast of his acquaintance with the famed and feared father of curses, despite the fact that Emerson had emphatically ordered him not to do so, except in a dire emergency. But it was the one thing they had hoped to avoid, their connection with a mysterious youth from an unknown place. There'd been no emergency, just Merrison being his normal, boastful self. The fact was that he didn't like Merrison much, and not only because he'd got tired of being jumped on. He knew the real reason for his antipathy, Nefret. She and Merrison had spent a lot of time alone together, conversing in the language that she spoke with increasing fluency. Ramses hadn't been invited to join them. From the first, Merrison's behaviour toward her had a quality that set Ramses' teeth on edge, though he would have been hard-pressed to define it. Deferential, verging on gallant at times, friendly, verging on familiar at others. He wondered if he would ever get over being jealous of every man she talked to. Emerson and he took Merrison and the suitcase to the station next day and put him on the train to Aswan, with his ticket in his hand and his ears ringing with Emerson's instructions. Emerson was no fool. He, too, had had his doubts about the purported theft of Merrison's money. "'You have more than enough to get you to Wadi Halfa in comfort,' he said sternly. "'Go to the house of my friend Sheikh Noor din and await us there. "'If you fail me in this, Merrison. I will not fail you, Father of Curses, I swear. Merrison had got over his fit of pique and was his smiling, self-confident self. He was wearing European clothes and a tarbouche and might have been a young clerk or minor official if one didn't look closely at him. He patted his flat belly. I have the money belt. If they wish to rob me, they will have to take it from my dead hand. Very well, very well, said Emerson. Ma salame. A good journey. Merrison turned to Ramses and held out his hand. It is the English custom, yes, to show goodwill. To show you have no... What are the words? Hard feelings? Ramses took his hand. It would have been rude not to, though his feelings were far from soft. Good luck, Merrison. They stood in silence, waiting until the train left. Almost tea time, said Emerson, consulting his watch. Let's go, eh? Go on without me, father. I have an errand. Ah, said Emerson. His heavy brows drew together. I trust you're not planning anything foolish. Not at all, sir. I'll be back in time for dinner. His errand took him to the Jazeera Sporting Club. His father refused to go near the place, since it was an aggressively British institution in the heart of Cairo, complete with golf course, tennis courts, and beautifully landscaped grounds. Ramses maintained his membership at the Jazeera and the even more exclusive Turf Club for purely practical reasons. The foreign community, especially the male half of it, frequented both, and they were good places to pick up the sort of gossip his mother probably wouldn't hear from her lady friends. The Jazeera admitted some foreigners, including upper-class Egyptians, and Ramses knew that when his unquestionably upper-class friend was in Cairo, he generally played golf or tennis at the club before taking tea there, habits he had acquired when he was up at Oxford. He wasn't on the terrace when Ramses arrived, so Ramses settled himself at a table and surveyed his surroundings. 
He might have been at an English country house, for the lawn was emerald green and the flower beds were bright with the flowers his mother grew in England, roses and zinnias, petunias and marigolds. A mixed group was playing croquet, the men stripped daringly to shirt sleeves and braces, the ladies in long white dresses and corseted to within an inch of their lives. Ramses wondered idly how they could walk, much less swing a croquet mallet. There was no doubt about it. The female was a lot tougher than the male. Girlish shrieks of laughter arose. Apparently, some women had to giggle over every stroke, successful or missed. Nefret's laughter was low-pitched and full-throated, and when she missed a stroke or a target, she didn't laugh. She swore. Finally, he saw Faisal coming toward the terrace. Strictly speaking, he was entitled to be called Prince Faisal, since his father was Sheikh Basur, the honoured and influential leader of an important Bedouin tribe and an old friend of Emerson's. Emerson's old friends had become something of a joke in the family. They were scattered up and down the Nile, from Cairo to Khartoum, and after meeting some of the more disreputable of them, Ramses had wondered about the kind of life his father had led during his bachelor years. Emerson didn't talk much about it, at least not to his wife and son. Faisal was a handsome, hawk-faced young man, and his clothes had obviously come from Bond Street. He carried a tennis racket, and he hailed Ramses with genuine pleasure. "'I heard you were back,' he remarked. "'How oh, your distinguished father, and your honoured mother, and your beautiful sister.' They finished the formal exchange of compliments and queries and ordered tea. Ramses wouldn't have minded something stronger, but Faisal was as well known for his piety as for his athletic prowess. He was the unofficial tennis champion of the club and a first-rate shot. "'So it's the Sudan, is it?' Faisal inquired. "'Why there? I thought you were all settled at Thebes.' Ramses shrugged. "'My father had a falling out with Maspero. "'And he's punishing the rest of you by dragging you off to Meroe? "'Or are you looking for Zerzura?' Ramses managed to conceal his surprise. "'It's a myth.' he said negligently. The white city where the king and queen sit sleeping on their thrones, and the key to boundless treasure is in the beak of a carved bird. I thought you'd have abandoned that fantasy by now. The fabled city of the little bird is a fairy tale, no doubt. Faisal's long, aristocratic fingers stroked the side of his cup. But there is an unknown oasis out there, Ramses. Wilkinson mentions it, and Gerhard Rolf got as far as the edge of the Great Sand Sea before he had to retreat to Siwa, and he broke off, smiling. Did I bore you senseless talking about it last time we met? Ide fix does come to mind, says Ramses, returning his smile. Perhaps, but I'll find it one day, Ramses, wait and see. If it weren't for my father, I'd start out tomorrow. He'll give me permission one day, so don't you go finding it first. Wouldn't dream of it. Whatever gave you the idea we were planning such a thing? Him. Faisal indicated a man sitting alone at a nearby table. He was bareheaded, his hair and beard grizzled, his face brown as a nut and seamed with scars. Newbold calls himself Hunter Newbold. Do you know him? Slightly. You don't like him? Not much. The man's wandering gaze met that of Ramsay's. His lips drew back in what was probably intended to be a friendly smile, and he rose and came toward them, limping a little. He was of short stature, but powerfully built, with arms so disproportionately long they looked like a gorilla's. "'Mind if I join you, gentlemen?' he asked. He seated himself without waiting for a reply, leaned back in his chair, and hoisted his glass. He wasn't drinking tea. "'Good to be back in civilization,' he declared. How many elephants did you slaughter this time? Ramses inquired. Newbold let out a hearty guffaw. A few, why not? There are plenty of the brutes, and the ladies will have their ivory combs and hairbrushes. Peaceful, herbivorous brutes, who didn't attack unless they or their young were threatened, unlike human beings. Newbold was the type of great white hunter Ramses particularly despised. The man was in demand because he always found impressive game for the parties he led into the interior. But there were a number of unsavoury stories about him, 
rumors that he abandoned his bearers when they became ill or too weak to travel, tales of wounded animals left to die slowly and painfully when pursuit was dangerous and worse. It was said that not all the ivory he brought back came from beasts he had killed. The previous owners had been handed over to the slavers, who still operated in remote regions. Like everyone else in Cairo, Newbold knew Ramsay's views about hunting. His smile was derisive. He drained his glass and snapped his fingers to summon a waiter. Join me in a whiskey, Mr. Emerson. And you, Your Highness, what will you have? Lemonade? Faisal nodded his thanks. So you didn't find King Solomon's diamond mines? This, he added, glancing at Ramses, is another man with an idée fixe. Africa's full of them, Ramses said. Laugh all you want, Newbold grunted. Africa's also full of unexplored territory, and some of the legends must have a basis in fact. Maybe I've been looking in the wrong area, been thinking of transferring to the Sudan. There are no diamonds there, Ramses said. But there's other things. Newbold ordered a third drink, or maybe it was his fourth or fifth. The whiskey had begun to affect him. His eyes glittered and his face was flushed. When I was in Madi Halfa, I had an interesting story about a native boy who came out of the western desert carrying bars of gold. You wouldn't know anything about that, would you? I hear you and your notorious family are heading for the Sudan. We are planning to excavate, Ramsay said, trying to hold on to his temper. Newbold laughed offensively. Like the last time you were there. Where'd you find the girl? In some rich sheikh's harem? She must have cost you a pretty penny. Ramsay's chair fell over as he rose. Several people turned to stare, and Faisal put a restraining hand on his arm. He's drunk, Ramsay's. Newbold, you damned fool, watch your mouth. Newbold wasn't that drunk. He studied Ramsay's with cool calculation. You wouldn't hit a crippled old hunter who's more than twice your age, would you, boy? Not even when he offends your outdated notions of chivalry toward women. A knight in shining armour, eh? Ramses shook off Faisal's hand, and Newbold got unsteadily to his feet. All right, I apologise. See you in the Sudan. Stay out of his way, Faisal advised, as Newbold wove an erratic path toward the door of the clubhouse. The limp was new. Ramses hoped it was an elephant that had gored him. Can you imagine telling my father to stay out of the way of a miserable swine like that? He had got the information he wanted. Or rather, the information he had hoped not to get. His notorious father wasn't going to be happy about it, and neither was his equally notorious mother. Thus ends this excerpt. From Manuscript H. Dear me, I said, how disconcerting. I suppose we ought to have anticipated... I certainly did not. Emerson chewed fiercely on the stem of his pipe. We'd been enjoying a little preprandial libation in the saloon when Ramses came in. Didn't you ask the swine from whom he heard about Merrison? Everybody knows he has dealings with slavers, Ramses said. I assumed... You're right, father. I ought to have pursued the matter. I lost my temper. You? Nefret inquired in exaggerated surprise. What on earth did he say to bring about that astonishing result? Something about you, perhaps, I said. You'd better tell us, Ramses. The point is not his precise words, but what they implied, said Ramses. Merrison and his bloody... Excuse me, mother. His gold coupled with our declared intention of returning to the Sudan, has reminded people of our last trip to that region and its result. Mother's ingenious story about finding the fret with a group of kindly missionaries didn't prevent evil-minded persons from gossiping. No, I agreed, remembering some of the gossip that had reached my ears. It had run the gamut of bad taste, from speculation about Nefret's parentage to prurient hints of harems and white slavery. But at least no one postulated an unknown country of vast treasure. That isn't precisely true, Mother, said Ramses, who seemed determined to look on the dark side. The people who knew Willie Forth had heard of his dream of finding a lost civilization, and before Reggie Forthright set off in search of his missing uncle, 
he confided in half the officers at Saddam Abu Dhamm. He also babbled to budge, I said, remembering with dismay a conversation I'd had with that gentleman and several of the officers all those years ago. I do hope you and young Ramses are not going with the professor when he sets off in search of the lost oasis, Budge had said, with a hypocritical look of concern. He had meant it as a joke, a jeer, rather, intended to make Emerson look foolish. But Budge was no fool, however much Emerson might deride his scholarship. Having seen Merrison, was he clever enough to put the pieces together? A dismal silence ensued. The boat rocked gently at anchor. The sunset colours had died and the stars had come out, though we had to take them on faith, owing to the mixture of mist and smoke that hung over the city like a dark blanket. Very well, I said, giving myself a little mental shake, for I'd been about to give way to unpleasant forebodings. Let us consider the worst possible scenario. Who else might harbour suspicions about our real purpose? Aside from Selim... Ramses inquired. He saw the damned... Excuse me, mother. The sword. Madison's landlord probably searched his luggage, which contained several interesting items in addition to the sword. The slavers had seen the gold, and unless they managed to hide it before they were caught, the soldiers saw it too. Emerson let out a heartfelt swear word. What about Prince Faisal? He wouldn't interfere with us. But he's in communication with other would-be explorers, and you can be sure our movements are of interest to many of that lot. Good gad, said Nefret in alarm. Explorers, Egyptologists, slavers, the military. Uncle Walter and Aunt Evelyn, of course. And heaven only knows how many random gossips in the antiquities game in Cairo. What are we going to do? Emerson sucked reflectively on his pipe. It had gone out. He made a face and knocked the ashes out into a receptacle. Our best hope now is to move fast enough to stay ahead of possible followers. The only alternative would be to squat round the pyramids of Meroe, digging innocently and industriously until they give up. We can't do that, Nefret exclaimed. We've lost enough time already. I suppose now we will actually have to go to Meroe in order to throw people off the track, I said with a sigh. That will mean further delay transporting ourselves and our gear back north to Nabata. Don't worry about that, said Emerson. I have it all worked out. Ramsay's eyebrows shot up. I hope, Father, you don't intend to strike out into the desert from Meroe. Last time we left from Jebel Barkel, and the route given by the map starts there. Calculating a new route. I have it all worked out, Emerson repeated. Leave it to me. Oh, dear, I murmured. Your lack of confidence cuts me to the quick, Peabody, said Emerson. How soon can we be ready to leave Cairo? If the rest of you will condescend to help me supervise the packing, two, possibly three more days. Certainly, certainly, said Emerson. Ha, huh, I said. Do we take Selim and Daoud with us? And what about the Amelia? We cannot elude Selim, said Ramses. Any effort to do so would only increase his determination to follow us. Supposing we send him and Dawood off to Luxor tomorrow, with instructions to gather a few of our men and proceed at once to Aswan. We will stick to the story about the interesting ruins west of Meroe until it is no longer possible to conceal our real purpose. You mean to go straight through to Aswan, then, without stopping in Luxor? Emerson asked. Are you asking me, sir? Ramsay's dark brows tilted up in surprise. You seem to have been more on top of this business than the rest of us, Emerson said. Perhaps I have a more suspicious nature than the rest of you. One of Ramsay's rare smiles warmed his thin face. More suspicious than your mother's? Give her a whiskey, Ramsay's. She appears to have fallen into a stupor. What? I said with a start. No, thank you, Ramsay's. It's time for dinner. I had been in a kind of stupor, induced by sheer consternation, for as we discussed the persons who might know of the lost oasis, a name blazoned itself on my brain in letters of fire. Walter and Evelyn had known, and so had one other individual. 
I had told him of it myself. To do myself justice, I hadn't been aware of his true identity at the time, for his masquerade, as one of my old friends, had been perfect. We had first encountered him when he tried to steal the Dashur treasure out from under our noses, and over the years he'd become our most dangerous opponent. He was one of the cleverest men I had ever met, well informed about the antiquities, which he specialized in stealing, a master of disguise, and a criminal of the deepest dye. Sethos, the master criminal. Rallying, I directed Mahmoud to serve dinner. There was no point in mentioning our old nemesis to Emerson, who resented Sethos all the more because of the latter's professed attachment to me. No, there was no need. I had learned how to identify him now, and if he had the audacity to show his face, one of his many faces, I would know him and expose him. We got Selim and Daoud off to Luxor and made arrangements to have the Amelia follow at her own pace. It took longer than I'd hoped to gather our supplies, even with Emerson threatening the merchants. I hadn't had to equip an expedition of this nature for a long time. Everything from mosquito netting to tinned biscuits had to be purchased in Cairo, since we couldn't count on finding them south of Aswan, and we had to maintain the pretense that we were bent on archaeological excavation. Cameras and photographic plates, paper and writing supplies, surveying instruments, medicines. The list was endless, and I kept adding to it. Emerson had his own list, and so did Nefret. The delay was maddening, even though prudence would have dictated an even longer delay because of the heat. My sense of urgency had been held at bay hitherto by the impossibility of earlier action, but now that we were closer in space and time to the moment of truth, the more impatient I became. When there is a dangerous or unpleasant task ahead, one, I at any rate, wants to get it over with. I began to feel as if we were trapped in a web of surmise that spread daily. The merchants with whom we dealt gossiped about us, and it proved impossible to avoid all our old friends, who came round or sent round offering advice. Emerson's reputation for unreasonableness served us well with the latter, they had no difficulty in believing he had settled on the Sudan rather than go hat in hand to Monsieur Maspero. On the day before our departure, we were in receipt of a telegram from Sir Reginald Wingate, the Governor-General of the Sudan, inviting us, in the most courteous terms, to call on him in Khartoum. The devil, said Emerson, does he expect us to go four hundred miles out of our way to pay him a social visit? He expects us to inform the Sudanese government concerning our plans, Ramses replied. As other expeditions have done, Wingate has always been interested in Egyptology, and he runs a tight ship. Tight bar, said Emerson. He let... No, he encouraged Budge to rip the pyramids of Meroe apart. Brest had told me some of them had been levelled to the ground, and others had huge holes dug through. He crumpled the telegram in his hand and threw it on the floor. So much for Sir Reginald, I thought, wondering if we would have his people after us too. Despite the improvements in transport and communication, travel in the Sudan was still slow and complicated. Between Aswan and Khartoum, the swift flow of the Nile is interrupted by six cataract regions, where navigation is perilous, if not actually impossible. From Wadi Halfa, at the foot of the second cataract, a railway track ran across the desert to Abu Hamed and thence along the river to Khartoum. But there was still no railway line in the 200 miles between Aswan and Wadi Halfa. To fill this gap, the government ran a regular service of paddle wheelers from Shellal, the terminus of the Cairo-Aswan line. It was at Shellal, a few miles south of Aswan, that Emerson had instructed Selim to meet us, and I was not surprised to find him and the others waiting on the platform when the train pulled in. They crowded round, embracing and greeting us, and it was good to see their friendly faces. Selim had selected the best of our men, and the best was very good indeed. There were three of them, Ali, who was in his early twenties, Ibrahim, still strong and stalwart at forty, and Hassan, Selim's cousin. Selim had wanted to bring more, but Emerson had refused. The fewer lives at risk, the better. 
The village of Shellal has few amenities, since travellers do not linger there. Either they are boarding trains to the north or boats to the south, or they're making an excursion to the temples of Philae, now, alas, under water most of the year. Selim and our fellows had found lodgings, which they were very pleased to leave, since they did not measure up to the standards of cleanliness to which they were accustomed. I had a feeling they would not approve of the boat, either. The government steamers are comfortable and well-maintained, but Emerson, being Emerson, rejected them in favour of a dilapidated boat owned by a friend of his. The stern wheel looked as if it was about to fall off, and the rice, whose name was Farah, was so cross-eyed that both eyes appeared to be staring straight at the end of his nose. When I expostulated, Emerson reminded me that we meant to have as little as possible to do with the government. "'He has you there, Aunt Amelia,' said Nifret, as Emerson went off with Farah and Daoud to direct the loading of our baggage. She took off her broad-brimmed hat and fanned away a swarm of gnats. "'Don't worry, I brought quantities of insecticides and disinfectants. "'Shall we go on board?' "'Not until we have to,' I said with a slight shudder. "'So, Selim, what do you think of us, one?' "'An ugly place,' said Selim promptly. "'Not like Luxor.' "'That is pure parochialism,' I retorted. "'Selim, who did not know the word, widened his eyes at me. "'It is a pretty town, with many points of interest. "'The dam is interesting,' Selim conceded. "'I talked to one of the engineers, who told me how the sluices work. "'They are all open now, because the river began to rise in July. "'But they will be closed one at a time until winter.' His cultivated air of superiority had been replaced by the enthusiasm he displayed toward mechanical and engineering subjects, and I knew he would go on and on about the cursed dam unless I stopped him. "'Who was this person?' Moncrief said Selim. "'He was a friend of Emerson's, and he said he hoped he would see you all when you were in Aswan. "'How long will we stay here?' Emerson means to get off at once, I said, mentally adding another group of curious persons to the list. Moncrief was a pleasant fellow and a dreadful gossip. We may as well inspect our quarters and start cleaning them. Selim, I must help the men load, said Selim, retreating in haste. I suppose it is difficult to keep a dock neat and tidy. This one looked as if no one had even tried. Nifret and I picked our way through rusting tools and coils of rope, puddles of oil that shone greasily in the sunlight, and other objects I will not mention, to a shady spot beside one of the loading sheds. There was a good deal of bustle. Not only our men, but porters carrying cargo, and several individuals in European clothing who appeared to be passengers. Either they were in too much of a hurry to wait for the government steamer, or they had bargained with Farah for a lower fare. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. As he stood watching the loading, Ramses was conscious of what his mother would have called a hideous premonition. He knew what had caused it. There were too many people, the wrong sort of people, preparing to board Farah's wretched vessel. The scene was familiar to him, porters trotting back and forth with their heavy loads, their half-naked bodies gleaming with sweat. Their complexions ranged in colour from pale brown to deep black, and their features showed the mixture of races found in the region. Arab and Bagheera, Dinka and Shiluk. A few women were present, carrying trays of fruit and trinkets they hoped to peddle to the travellers. Some wore the enveloping black burko, but most of them were unveiled, their bodies more or less covered with strips of bright fabric, one bare-breasted damsel, whose hair was interwoven with gold coins, caught his eye and smiled. He knew better than to return the smile, not with his mother ten feet away. Normal, all of it. What wasn't normal was the fact that the would-be passengers were not locals. One group of four were talking loudly in German. Another man, obviously English, wore military uniform. Then the premonition focused onto someone who was pushing through the crowd. He stepped back, stooping a little in the hope that Newbold wouldn't see him, hoping even more that the hunter didn't intend to take the boat. It was a forlorn hope. Newbold started toward the gangplank. 
He had to stop to let several porters come down, and then Ramses caught sight of the woman who was with him. She had stopped when he stopped. A little behind him, her head bowed. It was covered by a loose scarf, which she had drawn across her face. Newbold held her arm in a grip firm enough to wrinkle the fine linen fabric of the robe that concealed her body from throat to ankles. They were slim, brown ankles, circled with heavy gold bands hung with coins. Her wrists and slender fingers were also ringed with gold. The porters dawdled. In no hurry to pick up additional loads, Newbold cursed their slowness, and the woman let out a little cry of pain and let go her scarf in order to tug at the fingers squeezing her arm. Not a woman. A girl. Surely no older than sixteen. He had expected that from the delicacy of her bare ankles and the slender curves moulded by the hot wind against her linen garment and by his knowledge of Newbold's tastes. But he hadn't expected a face of such sweetness, her lips gently curved, her dark eyes enhanced by long lashes and winged brows. He wasn't aware of having moved until he stood beside them. Let go of her, he said. Newbold gave an exaggerated start of surprise. Oh, it's you. Is the rest of the family here? I told you to let her go. You're hurting her. Am I? Oh, dear. I certainly didn't intend to. Sorry, Daria. This is young Mr. Emerson, the famous Egyptologist. She looked up at him from under her lashes and smiled. Ramses took off his hat. Salam alaikum, Sit. Newbold's grin broadened. Your mum would be proud of your manners. She speaks English. Answer the gentleman, Daria. Good morning, sir, she murmured. Pretty creature, isn't she? Newbold ran a possessive hand over her sleek black hair and played with the end of her veil. I bought her in Khartoum. Ramses knew the man was goading him, but he didn't entirely succeed in hiding his disgust. Newbold howled with laughter. Just a joke, he sputtered. Slavery is against the law. You don't suppose I'd break the law, do you? Her dad and I came to an agreement, with her consent, of course. Isn't that right, Daria? You wanted to be with me. Face calm as that of a lady saint in a painted icon, she nodded and responded unresisting to the pressure of Newbold's hand as he guided her up the gangplank. Newbold's complacent grin filled Ramses with impotent fury. Slavery was against the law, but there was no interfering with the old tribal customs, which included arranged marriages and the sale of women by the men who owned them. The girl took this for granted, he reminded himself. Perhaps she had gone uncomplaining to the effendi who had loaded her with ornaments. And perhaps the compliant father had been one of Newbold's fabrications, her origins might have been less innocent. There was something about the way she moved, hips swaying and little feet stepping daintily, and she certainly knew how to use those wide, dark eyes. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. It took the rest of the day to load our boxes, so we weren't able to get off until the following morning. By that time, Nefret and I, and two of the crewmen whom I had commandeered, had cleaned out the worst of the dirt in the three minuscule cabins that had been assigned to us. Our fellows would have to sleep on deck with the crewmen, but Selim assured me they didn't mind. That evening we dined on board, in what Farah proudly referred to as the saloon. It was spacious enough, though the windows had obviously not been washed for months. I got out the serviettes I had brought, since I assumed, correctly, that Farah would not think of supplying them. Most of our fellow passengers were present. One was a youngish fellow in uniform, who was not for a change an old friend of Emerson's. He knew us, though, and after he had introduced himself as Captain Moroni, returning to his post at Berber after a few weeks' leave in Cairo, he reminded me that we had met once before. No reason why you should remember me, ma'am, he said modestly. I was assistant to the veterinary surgeon at Sanam Abu Dom back in 98. You were good enough to advise him about treating the camels. 
quite a coincidence that we should meet again in the Sudan. Isn't it? I said, and left him to Emerson. Four of the others, two married couples, were tourists, though they would have disdained that description. Male and female alike, they were amusingly similar in their looks. The ladies had shoulders almost as massive as those of their husbands, and all four faces were wrinkled and brown from frequent exposure to the sun. Frau Bergenstein merrily informed me that they called themselves the wild birds, for they flew to the farthest reaches of the world. They had climbed Mount Kenya, crossed the Negev by camel, padded dugout canoes down the Niger to the Atlantic, and searched for the tomb of the Queen of Sheba in Ethiopia. I fully expected she would mention Zerzora, but she did not. So I left her to Ramses, at whom she had been rolling her rather protuberant eyes. We were about to settle down to the meal when another passenger entered. He had a neatly trimmed grizzled beard and a frame almost as muscular as Emerson's, though he wasn't so tall. Emerson let out an oath at the sight of him, and Ramses turned rudely away from Frau Bergenstein. He came straight to me and bowed. I have not had the privilege of meeting you, Mrs. Emerson, but I am acquainted with your husband and son. Newbold is my name. I have heard of you, sir, I said stiffly. I don't doubt you have, he smiled, the lines at the corners of his eyes multiplying. But I hope you will not be prejudiced against me by anything your son may have told you. Mr. Emerson, I am happy to have this opportunity to express my regrets for my ill-chosen words at our meeting in Cairo. I had, I am ashamed to admit it, I had... Taken too much to drink. Intoxication is not usual with me in my profession. It is a danger one cannot afford. But when I return to civilization after months of privation, I occasionally celebrate too well. Accept my profound apologies. That depends on what the devil you're doing here, said Emerson. It was the same thing I had wondered about, but Emerson doesn't always have the sense to keep his thoughts to himself. The statement was, in my opinion, unnecessarily provocative, and I attempted to mitigate its effect. He's on his way back to Central Africa, I presume. Is that not the case, Mr. Newbold? Another safari to arrange? Precisely, Mrs. Emerson. It is still early in the season, but I'm expecting a group of gentlemen from England in two months' time. I have some personal business to carry out before I meet them in Cairo. Ramsay's tight lips parted. Isn't the young lady dining? As a proper young Muslim lady, she prefers to dine in our cabin, Newbold said smoothly. Naturally, I respect her wishes. Ramses did not reply. After a moment, Newbold went to take a seat at the far end of the table. Curse it, said Emerson. Has the bastard got a woman with him? What's she like, Ramses? Young, was the curt reply. Pretty? Nefret asked. Yes. Shameful, I declared. Perhaps if I were to have a word with her... Leave it alone, mother, said Ramses. She's no helpless innocent. How do you know that? Nefret demanded. Colour rushed into her cheeks. Have you met her before? Surely you didn't encounter her during one of my frequent visits to the Cairo brothels? Ramses snapped, his face as flushed as hers. No, and I didn't try to seduce her either, if that's what you meant. For pity's sake, Ramses, lower your voice, I exclaimed. You too, Nefret. I cannot understand why you are both getting so worked up. Nefret, your implied accusation was unjust, as you must be aware. Ramses, you ought not have let it upset you. You know she didn't mean it. Apologise, both of you. As usual, Nefret was the first to respond. She was quick to lose her temper and just as quick to repent, whereas the reverse was true of Ramses. He sat with his head bowed, refusing to meet Nefret's eyes. She put her hand on his. I do apologize, Ramses, she said sweetly. It's just that I get so angry about the filthy game of prostitution and the poor women who are forced to practice it. I was lashing out at random, not at you, my boy. I beg your pardon for being unable to tell the difference, said Ramses. Ramses? I said, warningly. It's all right, Aunt Amelia. It was my fault. 
Nifret declared. She gave his taut, unresponsive hand a little squeeze. I couldn't help wondering what the girl had done to crack that impenetrable self-control of his. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. After dinner, his mother convened an emergency council of war. Ramses had thought he was the only one to question the presence of so many unusual passengers, but he might have known his mother would be equally suspicious. Any or all of them could be following us, she declared. It looks as if we must go on to Meroe after all. There's no doubt in my mind about Newbold's intentions, said Emerson, chewing on the stem of his pipe. He's after us, all right. What precisely did he say to you that day at the club, Ramses? Ramses had no choice but to repeat the conversation in its entirety. His hearers reacted precisely as he had expected. But once Emerson had got over his outrage at Newbold's implications about Nefret, You didn't punch him in the face? Why the devil not? He was able to bring his keen intelligence to bear on the more dangerous implications. Between what he picked up at Wadi Halfa and what he undoubtedly learned in Cairo, he's got enough, by his filthy standards, to justify following us. He won't get far, Emerson added smugly. I have a plan. I trust, said his wife, giving him a baleful stare, that it does not involve putting Mr. Newbold in hospital. You could get yourself in serious... Kindly refrain from interrupting me, Peabody, Emerson growled. If worse comes to worst... I would have no compunction about uh, temporarily immobilising the fellow. But I do not believe it will prove necessary. What about the girl? Nefret asked. Her only reaction to Newbold's insult about her had been a shrug. Why would he bring her along? To satisfy his own filthy appetites, said Emerson, with a snap of his teeth. He was only partly right. Ramses was reading in bed later that night, or trying to... The lamp flame swayed distractingly with the movement of the boat. The soft creak of a hinge made him look up, and he saw the door of his cabin open, just enough to allow a slim, dark form to slip through. He jumped up, dropping the book. What are you doing here? What do you suppose? She closed the door and came toward him. She wore only a simple shift, sleeveless and low-cut, and she had left off her bangles and headscarf. Her hair fell in jetty waves over her bare shoulders. Ramses snatched up the shirt he had tossed over a chair and put his arms through the sleeves. If he learns you've come here, he'll kill you. He sent me. She stopped a few feet away. A flood of fury and disgust choked him for a few seconds. I see. Let me stay for an hour or two. Then I can go back and tell him I did my best, but failed. He tried to control his anger. It wasn't her fault. But at that moment, he was almost as furious with her as with Newbold. Let me get this straight, he said softly. He told you to offer yourself to me in exchange for information about our plans. And you agreed? The contempt in his voice brought a dark flush to her face. I had no choice. I have told you the truth instead of the story he ordered me to tell. That I fled from him because he was drinking and would have hurt me. I was supposed to plead for your protection and embrace you, and... She looked very young and helpless and desirable, with the warm lamplight stroking her slim curves. Newbold had selected precisely the right woman to appeal to his protective instincts, and to the others that might have succeeded them if he had taken that slender, trembling body into his arms. Because he was fighting those instincts, he spoke harshly. What makes you suppose I won't accept the offer? and give nothing in return. I don't babble to the women I take to bed. The colour in her face deepened. You may believe me or not. I have told you the truth. Wait, Ramsay said, as she turned toward the door. Curiosity and ashamed consciousness of his cruelty had replaced anger. I'm sorry. Sit down, over there in that chair. You didn't have to tell me. Why did you? Sit down, please. I won't touch you, I promise. He perched on the edge of the bed, as far from her as he could get. She studied him thoughtfully, and then a curious little smile curved her lips, and she did as he had asked. You don't have to stay with him, Ramses said. 
My parents will help you. To find a respectable husband or become a servant. The pretty mouth hardened. She looked suddenly a good many years older. I have my own reasons for staying with Newbold. He is not unkind. When he twisted my arm today, it was to get your attention. I had already deduced that, Ramses muttered. She went on in the same detached voice. I told you the truth because you would not have believed the lie. You are already suspicious of him, as you should be. Who are you? Ramses demanded. You're no village maiden. Where did he find you? She rose, tossing the black locks back from her face in a movement as graceful as it was practiced. It has been long enough, she said. He won't doubt that you refused me. He said you might take me because you are young and... How did he put it? Never mind, Ramsay said, feeling his face heat up. But he considers you weak and a naive romantic, as he expressed it. So he will believe me. Will you tell your parents? What? The question caught him unawares. So Newbold considered him a weakling, did he? Yes, I shall. Don't go yet. You haven't answered my questions. She moved with quick grace, reaching the door before he could rise. She looked back at him over her shoulder, frowning a little. You wanted me, I could tell. Why did you refuse? Were you afraid of your mother finding out? That's right, Ramsay said wearily. His other reasons would have made less sense to her. She was out the door before he could stop her. Just as well, he thought, Riley. Newbold hadn't been so far wrong, damn the man. He had to tell his parents, but the very idea made him cringe, for it would mean admitting that his first unthinking assumption had been based on a contemptible combination of male ego and physical desire. Nefret would certainly spot that, even if his parents didn't. He felt his face burning and picked up his book, but it failed to distract him. Her English was excellent and her appearance extraordinary. Where had she come from? There was European blood in her veins, or Persian, or Circassian. And was the true story only a subtler lie? Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Chapter 4 The government steamers take two days to cover the stretch between Shellal and Wadi Halfa. It took us four. However, the region through which we passed was fraught with interest, and the prevailing north wind was pleasantly cool under a shaded awning. Without entering into details which the majority of my readers would find tedious as well as extraneous, I should explain that the area had been called by a number of different names over the centuries. The Land of the Bow, Kush, Nubia, the Sudan, to mention only a few. The Meroitic civilization flourished in southern Nubia after the fall of the earlier Kushite kingdom at Napata. Ruins of all periods abounded, for the conquering pharaohs of ancient Egypt had been succeeded by kings of Napata and queens of Meroe, and by Greek and Roman invaders. Christianity had raised its churches and Islam its mosques. Sitting on deck, we studied them through field glasses, and Emerson mumbled discontentedly, "'There'll be nothing left of them in another century, Peabody. Those villains at Aswan keep raising the water level.' Additional entertainment was provided by bits of the boat falling off. Obviously, this was not an unusual occurrence, for the crewmen remained unperturbed as they retrieved most of the bits and tied them back on. On one occasion, we came to a dead halt in the middle of the river, and it required some brisk steering by Farah to keep us from going aground while the engines were being repaired. Selim, who could not keep away from machinery of any kind, assisted in the repairs. He came back to us, shaking his head in mingled horror and admiration. I do not know how this boat has stayed afloat, he declared. The engine is held together with wire and rust. Even this somewhat alarming encounter did not bring two of our fellow passengers on deck. 
According to our captain, they were missionaries on their way to the southern Sudan. Wingate, the governor, had wisely restricted the ardor of these individuals in the Muslim areas, for Islam does not take kindly to proselytizers. Denizens of the pagan areas farther south were fair game, however, and it was thither our fellow passengers were bound. We did not set eyes on them until the last day, when we were only a few hours from Wadi Halfa. They had, as Captain Farah solemnly explained, bad stomachs. Elementary disorder had not prevented them from exhibiting their religious zeal. The partitions between cabins were flimsy affairs. Early evening, prayers and hymns echoed through the walls and went on so long that Emerson was eventually inspired to shout demands for silence. He could shout much more loudly than they could sing, so that put an end to the performances. Yet so uneasy had I become that I couldn't help wondering whether these persons were what they claimed to be. Sethos had a strange sense of humour, and it would be like him to disguise himself as a man of the cloth. When they finally appeared in the saloon on the morning of the day we were to dock, I stared unabashedly. They were not a married couple, but brother and sister, the Reverend and Miss Campbell. The lady was tall and slim, and in my opinion rather too beautiful for a missionary. She was plainly dressed, and her face was bare of cosmetics, but this only emphasized the delicate modeling of her cheekbones and the white brow framed by masses of auburn hair. Her voice was low, her accent well-bred, her manner frank and open, her smile engaging. She was certainly not Sethos. Nor was her brother, I decided. He was as ugly as she was beautiful, with scanty light eyebrows and a pathetic wisp of a beard. The eyebrows might have been plucked and bleached, and the lumpy nose a result of putty and grease paint, but the shallow jaw, only partially veiled by the beard, and the narrow shoulders were not those of the man I had known. I judged him to be a good many years her senior. His voice was almost as high as hers, and as I had discovered, neither could carry a tune. At first I could not understand why he should take such a girl— to whom he was clearly devoted, into such a remote and perilous region. Then psychology offered a clue. When she addressed a few courteous words to Ramses, her brother immediately interrupted. You are travelling with us as far as Khartoum, I believe. What can you tell us about conditions in that region? Will we find the authorities receptive to our labours for the Lord? Emerson had taken a dislike to Mr. Campbell even before he met him, over and above his general dislike of missionaries. With characteristic bluntness, he replied, The authorities, yes. Other conditions are not so receptive. I wonder, sir, why you would risk your sister's health, possibly her life, in such an insalubrious region. Her life belongs to God, sir. She was called to this mission of rescue, as was I. Rescue? Bah, said Emerson. How do you know it was God who called you? The heathen walk in darkness, but must be brought to the light. The Reverend Mr. Campbell's eyes, magnified by the lenses of his eyeglasses, took on a fiery glow. They are believers in black magic and fetishism. I have heard of practices of immorality that shocked me to the depths of my soul. Concubines, orgies. Nakedness, Emerson said helpfully. The women go about bare to the waist, and some of them are quite Emerson, I exclaimed. We must get our gear together, Lefret intervened tactfully. She'd been looking at the other girl with sympathetic interest. Is there anything I can do for you, Miss Campbell, in the way of medical assistance? Farrah said you'd been ill. I have a well-equipped medicine chest and some training. The young lady replied with proper expressions of gratitude, saying she was almost recovered. Mr. Campbell did not appear to be listening. His eyes were half-closed and his lips moved as if in silent prayer. The man was a religious maniac. In his eyes, his sister was as much a prisoner as any Muslim woman, belonging not to him or any other man but to God. He hadn't complete faith in God as a chaperone, however. He would risk the health, even the life of his sister, rather than take the chance of her meeting a young man whose attentions might weaken her zeal. As we chatted, there was a hail from on deck. 
Did he say crocodile? Miss Campbell asked eagerly. I've never seen one. Here's your chance, then, replied Emerson, who was looking for an excuse to end the encounter. Shall we go up and have a look? Everyone wanted to have a look. Crocodiles had almost vanished from Egypt itself, and they were becoming rare in this area. Passengers and crew crowded round the rail. The landscape had opened up, and the river was broad. Behind the flood plain, with its green fields and groves of palm trees, the desert rose in a series of terraces, pale yellow in the morning light. Here and there, wadis had cut their way through the soft sandstone. The river had begun to subside, leaving long sandbars strewn with flood debris, reeds and pieces of wood and fallen logs. The German quartet aimed cameras, and Newbold pushed one of the sailors out of his way. His companion was not present. I hadn't set eyes on her the entire trip. I don't see, Miss Campbell began. There, said Ramses, pointing. She let out a gasp of delighted horror and leaned forward as one of the logs opened its jaws and slid from the bank into the water. Two others followed. Ramses, who happened to be standing next to the girl, put his arm round her waist. Be careful. Campbell, on her other side, let out an exclamation of protest and snatched her away from Ramses, who immediately stepped back. Watching them, I failed to see what happened. I only heard a scream and a splash and an outcry from the watchers. Selim's voice rose above the others. Hassan, help him, father of curses. Stop the engines, Emerson called. He caught Selim in an iron grip and pushed him back. No, Selim, leave it to... Curse it, Ramses. Ramses climbed onto the rail and dived. He began swimming toward the flailing arms and distorted face of poor Hassan. The boat shuddered to a stop, but the pair were already some distance astern, and beyond them the surface of the water was broken by a triangular wake with a long, ugly head at its apex. "'Throw them a rope!' I shrieked, though to be sure I feared it would not do much good. The crocodile and Ramses were converging on Hassan, or rather, on the spot where he'd been. There was no sign of him now. Ramses went down after him, and so did the crocodile. Blood stained the muddy surface of the water. Miss Campbell screamed and fainted gracefully into the arms of her brother, who stood staring in paralysed horror. Then I realised Emerson was gone. Not into the water, surely. I would have seen him jump. I was about to call his name when he came running, thrust the watchers aside, including me, and stood with his feet braced and his arms extended. He was holding a heavy pistol. The water boiled and bubbled, and all three heads reappeared. Ramses appeared to be supporting Hassan, who appeared to be unconscious. The crocodile appeared to be in some distress. It rose half out of the water, jaws snapping. Emerson fired. There was a hideous bellow from the wounded animal. Ramses was swimming, strongly but too slowly, burdened as he was with Hassan. Emerson took careful aim and fired a second and third time. How he managed to hit the thrashing target I cannot imagine, but the third shot finished the creature. It sank like a stone amid a spreading crimson stain. "'Get a rope to them, Peabody,' said Emerson, moving neither his eyes nor the pistol. "'I will just make sure the other beasts don't take a hand.' Or should I say, a jaw? How can you jest, sir? Campbell demanded in a shaken voice. You should be praising God for his infinite mercy. Well, you see, I don't know yet how merciful he has been, said Emerson coolly. Peabody! Yes, my dear, at once. We got them on board. Hassan was a dead weight, unconscious and bleeding heavily. After a quick look at him, Nefret whipped off her belt and fashioned it into a tourniquet. Hassan's left leg ended in a bloody stump. "'Oh, my God!' I gasped. "'The crocodile had him by the foot?' "'Yes,' Ramses dropped to a sitting position, knees raised and head bowed. He was streaming with water and gasping for breath. "'How is he?' "'Dawood, sell him, get him to my cabin and put him on the bed,' Nefret ordered." I'll operate there. Hurry. He's lucky to be alive, Emerson said grimly. Once a crocodile gets hold, he rolls and drags his victim down. Ramses, how did you persuade the creature to let go? 
Knife, said Ramses briefly. He was still short of breath. Lost it. We will get you another, a better, the best that can be found, said Selim, his voice unsteady. Hassan was his first cousin. You saved his life. Not me, said Ramses. All I could do was distract the brute. He pushed the wet hair back from his face. Never believed those white hunter stories. Hassan and I would both be crocodile food but for father. I was too damned slow, muttered Emerson. I should have carried the damned pistol instead of leaving it in my suitcase. But who would have supposed? You aren't hurt, my boy. No, sir. Thank you for asking, he added. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow, exclaimed the Reverend Campbell. I took Emerson away. At Wadi Halfa, we had to go through the laborious business of unloading and transporting our baggage a second time. The steamers lie too close to the railway station, but thanks to Emerson's preference for a semi-derelict vessel, we had missed the Saturday train. There was not another until the Thursday. All to the good, declared Emerson, unquenchably optimistic. It will take a while to make arrangements for Hassan's care. We cannot simply walk off and leave him. Obviously not, I replied. There is a hospital here, I believe. What's it like? I leave it to your imagination, my dear. I would rather trust the evidence of my own eyes, Emerson, I retorted, mopping my brow. There had been a nice breeze on the river, but now that we were standing still, the heat was really horrid. The market at Halfa is one of the best in the Sudan, Emerson said. You will want to do some shopping, Peabody. Will I? You always do, my dear. Remember, this is the last good-sized town we will encounter. Kalabsha, the stop for Meroe, hasn't much beyond a railway station and a rest house. What about Berber? Ramses asked. Oh, well, we won't be getting off the train at Berber, will we? No sense in wasting two or three days there. Straight on to Meroe, that's the plan. What are you shouting for, Emerson? I inquired. Was I? No, I wasn't. He tried the door of the station house and found it locked. A crowd had gathered, drawn by the arrival of the steamer and the hope of earning a few piastres. They were talking excitedly among themselves. Then one of them advanced and bowed. Welcome, Father of Curses. Is it indeed you? I were, Emerson replied. Myself and no other. Salam alaikum, Yusuf Sawar. Send someone to fetch the station master, will you? It was not long before this individual came hastening up. He was, of course, an old friend. While Emerson exchanged greetings and gave instructions to him, I felt a touch on my arm and looked round to see Mr. Newbold. His hat was in his hand, and behind him stood a veiled female figure. "'May I beg a favour, Mrs. Emerson?' Newbold asked. "'I must make arrangements for the transfer of our luggage, "'and I don't like to leave my daughter unattended in such a crush of men.' "'You're what?' I exclaimed, staring in open curiosity at the slender, silent figure. "'Ramsay said—' "'Oh, dear,' Newbold murmured. "'I'm afraid I yielded to the temptation to tease your son just a bit.' Daria is my child, whom I have only lately found again. It is a sad story, which I will tell you one day. Will you look after her, only for a few minutes? Your presence will deter anyone from approaching her rudely. He moved away before I could answer, but of course only one answer was possible. Curiosity as well as compassion demanded acceptance. It is kind of you said a soft voice from behind the fabric she had drawn across her face. "'You speak English?' An unnecessary question, since she obviously did. "'Let us step aside,' I went on, "'out of the way of all these people.' There were a number of questions I wanted to ask her. Why was she a practising Muslim when her father was Christian? Not that he was much of a Christian, if the rumours I had heard were true— 
What was the sad story? Why, if modesty of attire were her aim, was she wearing garments that set off rather than concealed a nicely rounded figure and comely features? It was costly attire, linen as fine as the fabric worn by queens and pharaohs in ancient times, a thin silken scarf covering her head and the lower part of her face, and she was absolutely clanking with jewellery. Courtesy prevailed, however, and as we withdrew, I contented myself with saying only, You are on your way to Khartoum, I presume? It is a long, arduous journey. Is there anything that I can do to make it easier for you? She lowered the fold of silk that had concealed her nose and mouth and looked at me in surprise. Ramses had understated the case. Pretty did not do the delicate features and tinted lips justice. Her skin was as fair as that of a southern European. The wide, dark eyes were skillfully outlined with coal. Why should you offer to do that? she asked. Good, I said, pleased. You are direct. I like that. Why? Because you are a woman and young and a fellow human being. No matter how thoughtful your uh, father may be, he is a man, and men do not always understand the needs of women. My brief hesitation before the word father passed without comment. I felt certain Newbold had lied to me about the relationship and that the story he had told Ramses was the true one. Even he would not have had the temerity to introduce me to his concubine. Most ladies would have refused in withering terms. In that, he did me an injustice, of course. You are kind, she said again, but I need nothing. Your son was kind to me, too. Did he tell you that I came to him in his cabin? Yes, he did, I replied. The big, dark eyes widened. I believe she expected the question would come as a shock, which it certainly would have done had Ramses not told us what had happened. It hadn't been easy for him. I understood why, of course, and now that I had seen the girl, I understood even better. He had been attracted and tempted, quite natural in my opinion, and all the more credit to him for resisting. Unfortunately, Nefret had not seen it that way, and I had to insist she apologize. He said he intended to tell you, but I wondered if he would have the courage. No one could accuse my son of lacking in courage, I replied somewhat acerbically, nor in the instincts of a gentleman. Do you wish to be free of that man? I assure you that my husband and my son, to say nothing of myself, are capable of ensuring that, if you wish it. Mother, said a voice behind me. Ramses walks like a cat, and I had been too interested in the conversation to notice him approaching. Please come with me. Father is ready to leave. I can't just yet, I explained, turning to meet a scowl almost as dark as one of his father's. Mr. Newbold asked me to stay with uh, the young lady until he comes back. Ramses looked round. It was certainly a rather rough crowd, and a noisy one, as would-be porters shoved and shouted, vying for the attention of the passengers. Torn between his chivalrous concern for females, instilled in him by me, and his obvious dislike of the young woman, he hesitated. The girl had not replaced her veil. There are your friends. Come looking for you, she said, with unmistakable mockery. Another young lady. The young lady was Miss Campbell, accompanied, of course, by her brother. Miss Campbell was buttoned up to the chin, her prim white collar and cuffs wilted by the heat, and her hair concealed by a broad-brimmed hat. She looked miserably hot, compared with Daria, in her loose garments and light headscarf, and her conspicuous respectability made the other girl look even less respectable. They eyed each other, and then, as if a signal had passed between them, both turned and stared at Ramses. Mr. Campbell noisily cleared his throat. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Emerson, but would you be good enough to come and talk to those porters? I can't seem to make them understand me. I'll come, sir, said Ramses with relief. Mother... Daria murmured, "'There is my father coming. 
Thank you, Mrs. Emerson, for protecting me, though it was unnecessary. You are welcome, I said. Goodbye and good luck. Miss Campbell took out a limp white handkerchief and wiped her perspiring face. Is she really? Oh, dear. I feel rather... Come out of the sun, I said, putting an arm round her swaying form. Your attire is quite unsuitable for this climate, you know. It is suitable for her position, said Mr. Campbell, and let out a bleat of alarm as she sagged heavily against me. I could do no more than keep the girl from falling, for she was a dead weight. Ramses, I gasped. After a wary glance at Mr. Campbell, who was wringing his hands ineffectually, Ramses lifted the young woman, who had gone quite limp. Now what shall I do with her? Ramses demanded. There's no place to put her down. Sit on that packing case and continue to hold her, I instructed. Mr. Campbell, if you wish to be useful, open my parasol and hold it over her. Over her head, you silly man. As I spoke, I unfastened Miss Campbell's collar, took the pins from her hat, removed that article of clothing, and began fanning her with it. Ramses had laid her as flat as possible, across his knees, one arm under her shoulders. Her head had fallen back, and she looked quite pretty and pathetic, with her loosened hair framing her face and her lips half-parted. I fully expected Campbell to protest, not only the loosening of the girl's clothing, but the intimate proximity of a young man. However, he obeyed my orders without comment, his face anxious. Perhaps, I thought, it has finally dawned on the idiot that he is risking her health, even her life. She was showing signs of returning consciousness when Nefret came hurrying toward us. What on earth? she began. It's just the heat, I think, I said, as, with an exclamation of concern, she bent over the young woman. Get some water. The application of this substance to face and throat soon brought Miss Campbell round. When she became aware of her position, a deep blush warmed the pallor of her face, and she tried feebly to stand. Mary, Mary, dear, her brother cried, attempting to support her. Lord, we are in your hands. Help us, guide us. You'd be better advised to ask me for help. I said irritably. I presume you've made no arrangements for lodgings here? No, I didn't suppose you had. Take your sister to the government rest house, get her out of those hot clothes, and apply copious amounts of water internally and externally. Ramses will carry her if she cannot walk. Dowd, Ramses said shortly. Oh, I said. Yes, that would be better. We got them off with their luggage such as it was, two suitcases and a small valise. Dowd carried the girl as easily as if she had been a kitten, his large, friendly face wearing a reassuring smile. When he came back to announce they had settled in, Emerson, who had completely ignored the little drama, was ready to proceed. Our packing cases had been stored, except for our bags, which our own fellows had taken in charge. Peabody, my dear, I expect you are anxious to uh, change your clothing and bathe. I bathed this morning, I retorted. Not much of a bath, in muddy water, in a basin. But I doubt the government rest house here offers more elegant facilities. Who said anything about the rest house? Emerson offered me his arm. Oh, no, Emerson, I said firmly. Not your dear old friend Mahmoud. What was his name? El Araba, said Emerson. I don't know why you should protest, my dear. He was most hospitable. However, the poor old fellow is dead these many years. Well, wherever we're going, let's go, Nefret said impatiently. I want to make Hassan comfortable, and I refuse to deliver him to the hospital until I've seen what it's like. Wadi Halfa marks the border between Egypt and the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. Once a bustling military depot, it was now a pleasant, placid little town, capital of the Muduria, or province, of the same name. We left the German tourists arguing with the stationmaster and proceeded on foot toward the centre of town, which boasted a hospital and several government buildings. Over one of them, a low structure of whitewashed mud brick, shaded by trees, flew the British and Egyptian flags. My spirits rose at the sight. Is the Mudir an old friend, Emerson? I inquired, hopefully. 
Good God, no, said Emerson, as shocked as if I had implied he was well acquainted with Satan. The Modiers are all British officials. The local marmor is Noor ed Din. Splendid fellow. Met him while he was running guns to Cordofan. His place is down this way. We were expected, and were greeted with flattering enthusiasm by the marmor himself. The Nubians are a very clean people. The only exceptions I have known happen to be friends of Emerson's, which says more about my husband's notions of sanitation than about his friends. The marmor's house was spacious and tidy enough to suit even me, with thick walls of mud brick, some of which were adorned with elegant painted designs. His servants led us to a pleasant little suite of rooms reserved for guests, which included an actual bath chamber and several sleeping chambers. We got Hassan settled in one of them. He was full of morphine and only vaguely aware of his surroundings. There, said Emerson, isn't this better than the cursed government house? Plenty of privacy, you see. He gave me a meaningful smile, and no cursed missionaries singing hymns. Ramses had picked up his suitcase and gone off to find a room for himself. He was back almost at once, sans luggage. You'll never guess who I found, he said. That's not difficult, retorted Emerson. I told Merrison to meet us here and asked the mamour to look after him. Where is he? He was asleep, bare and innocent as a baby. I took the liberty of waking him and announcing our arrival. He'll be along as soon as he puts on some clothes. Merrison professed himself as delighted to see us, and indeed his broad smile and deep bows confirmed it. He had arrived in Halfa only two days before us. When Emerson inquired why it had taken him so long, he replied with wide-eyed candour that he had stayed over for a few days in Aswan to see the sights. Observing from Emerson's expression that this was not well received, he reached into the breast of his galabilla and produced a handful of coins. Here is the rest of the money you gave me, father of curses. Your expenses were heavy, said Emerson dryly. I bought gifts. Again he dipped into a pocket. For Nefret and the Sit. Strings of beads, very pretty and very cheap. Nefret and I went off to inspect the hospital. It consisted of two widely separated buildings, the smaller of which was the native hospital. I dare say the doctor was doing his best, but we declined his kind offer to add another bed to the overcrowded ward. The flies were as thick as raindrops in a brisk shower, and the temperature was in the high nineties. When we returned, I summoned the others, including Selim and Daoud, to a council of war. The first thing is to make arrangements for Hassan, I said, as Emerson dispensed whiskey. He had assured me our host had no objection to our indulging in this deplorable practice, so long as we did it in private. The hospital is impossible. He must be sent home as soon as he is able to travel, and one of us must stay with him. I wouldn't trust a stranger, however well-intentioned, to look after him properly. I can't, the fret said wretchedly. You know I can't, Aunt Amelia. But you can tell Ibrahim what to do, said Selim, and give him medicines. Among the medicines, I felt sure, would be the green ointment made by Daoud's wife Khadija, from a secret recipe passed down by the women of her Sudanese family. Hassan would have demanded it even if Nefret hadn't come to believe in its efficacy. So it was agreed. After Selim and Daoud had gone off to discuss the matter with the others, I said soberly, We will now be without two of our men. Was it an accident? Nefret looked up. Hassan said someone pushed him. He couldn't tell who. He may have been mistaken. Ramses was stretched out on the soft cushions of the divan. He was as agile as an eel underwater. Only that and the fact that the crocodile had been busy with Hassan had saved him from serious injury. But I suspected he hadn't come out of the encounter entirely unscathed. He had refused to allow me or Nefret to examine him. However, he had accepted a pot of the green ointment before he went to his room to change his wet clothing. There was a great deal of pushing and shoving, he said, without raising his head. It is an odd coincidence, though. And two cursed many suspects, Emerson muttered. 
Ramsey has mentioned several groups of people who might be aware of our ultimate goal, and by gad, two such persons have already turned up, the great white hunter and the military, in the person of that fellow who, by another strange coincidence, was at the camp when Reggie Forthright was confiding in all and sundry. The only ones we haven't encountered are representatives of the Egyptological community and the slavers. You could hardly expect the latter to show themselves, I said. My dear, a number of highly respectable persons deal on the sly with slave traders. You aren't suggesting that those stout German tourists are among them, are you? I don't like their looks, Emerson grumbled. They're too stereotypical to be genuine. As for the missionaries, you always suspect missionaries. That is because religious persons always use God as an excuse for unprincipled acts, Emerson retorted. We dined with the Mamour that evening, and, as courtesy demanded, stuffed ourselves with lamb and rice and couscous, dates and heaven knows what else. Repletion did not prevent Emerson from taking full advantage of our newfound privacy. The following day we sallied forth to visit the market. These markets are fascinating and very enjoyable once one gets over European squeamishness about bloody carcasses of butchered animals swarming with flies and streets littered with a variety of refuse. Our purchases were limited by practicality. Any perishable item, such as fruit and vegetables, would have rotted before we reached Meroe. Nefret indulged herself in a few strips of bright fabric, declaring that as soon as we were away from civilization, she intended to return to native costume. While we were drinking tea in a café, at the invitation of the Greek proprietor, an old friend of Emerson's, a procession went by, heading for the mosque. The personage of chief importance was riding a handsome black stallion and was escorted by several guards wearing gaudy uniforms and carrying long lances with gold and green pennants fluttering from their tips. Unlike the guards, who were upstanding, sturdy men, he was fat and puffy around the face, which was marred by deep lines of overindulgence and temper. Next to him rode a younger man, dressed as richly in silk and brocade. Emerson said, "'Hell and damnation!' Emerson's normal speaking tones are quite loud, and he did not bother to lower his voice. The older man turned his head. I had the feeling that he had been aware all along of our presence. His expression did not alter, nor did he stop. But the younger dignitary examined us curiously, turning his head and continuing to stare as he went past. Now there, said Emerson, saluting him with an ironic flip of his hand, is a fellow you should avoid if you can. "'Another old friend of yours?' I asked. "'That would be stretching it a bit. "'The last time I ran into him, we um, had a slight difference of opinion about... Um, "'Well, I was forced to incapacitate him and make a hasty departure from Darfur, "'where it was about a woman, I suppose,' I said. "'You make me sound like some sort of philanderer,' Emerson protested. "'She was only a girl who'd been stolen from her young husband and her family. "'When she appealed to me, I had no choice but to help her.' I know, my dear, I said affectionately. Emerson's soft heart and chivalrous nature are immediately apparent to any female. So are certain other attributes of his. But I had sworn never to reproach him for anything he had done before we met. Who is he? Lefret asked. Mahmoud Dinar, the Sultan of Darfur. The fellow next to him is his eldest son. He is the only independent governor in the Sudan, a reward for his remaining loyal during the Dervish Revolt. He pays a sizable tribute, though. He looks as if he can afford it, Nefret remarked. The slave trade pays well, said Emerson dryly. He turns a blind eye and collects his cut. Well, well... The only ones we're missing are a journalist and an Egyptologist. When we returned to the Marmor's house, we found a message from the Mudir, a Captain Barkdoll, inviting us to tea. Shan't go, said Emerson, removing his hat and unfastening the remaining buttons of his shirt. Oh, yes, we shall. I had intended to call on him. All open and above board, remember? You may be sure that if we don't turn up, he will come looking for us. 
Captain Barkdall was young and very conscious of his authority. His mouse-brown hair looked as if it had been parted by a razor, and his moustache was so perfect it might have been painted on. Since he had no hostess, he asked me to pour, which of course I did. "'You did not notify the Sudan agent in Cairo of your intentions, Professor Emerson,' he began. "'Why should I?' Emerson stirred sugar into his tea. "'I don't need his permission to excavate at Meroe, and I certainly don't require assistance from fellows like you.' Standing stiff as a poker, his cup in one hand and the other behind his back, Barkdall pressed on. "'I must ask you for a list of the supplies you brought and for your papers.' Ramses, who was also standing, looked from his father to the young officer and allowed a faint smile to curve his mouth. He knew what was coming. "'Papers be damned,' said Emerson amiably. "'You know who I am. Everybody knows who I am. "'Are you aware, sir, that the importation of rifles and ammunition of a three o three calibre is absolutely forbidden, "'and that you require a licence to hunt with other weapons?' Emerson rolled his eyes heavenward. "'License A,' he retorted with an audible sneer, "'entitles the holder to shoot elephant, hippopotami, rhinoceros, giraffe, antelope, "'and any other unfortunate animal that passes by. "'We, sir, do not hunt.' "'Barkdoll was, as I have said, quite young, "'and no match for Emerson's tactics. "'Then what have you got in those damned long wooden cases?' he shouted. "'I believe, sir.' said Emerson, in freezing tones, that you have forgotten that our lady is present. The young man glanced at Nefret, who was trying to look shocked. At my insistence, she had attired herself in a proper frock and flower-trimmed hat, and she looked like what she was not, an innocent, well-bred young English lady. I, I beg your pardon. I didn't mean... How does it happen that you are familiar with the contents of our baggage? Emerson demanded. We are British citizens, sir, and are not accustomed to being spied upon by our own people. No, I was told, go down to the station then and rip the cursed boxes apart, Emerson shouted. I will hold you personally accountable for any missing item or for any damage to our cameras and surveying equipment. Really, I said, rising. I had expected more courteous treatment from a British officer and a gentleman. Pray excuse us. Barkdoll wilted. Naturally, Professor Emerson, if I have your word... My word, said Emerson grandly, is my bond. Come, Peabody. Once we had left the house... What is in those cases, Emerson? I inquired. "'Rifles and ammunition of three o three calibre, of course,' said Emerson, "'stamping along with his hands in his pockets. "'The Mamour was more than happy to offer his hospitality to Hassan and Ibrahim "'for as long as they liked. "'Ibrahim was a quiet, easy-going older man, "'very much like his second cousin, Daoud, "'and he listened intently and intelligently to Nefret's directions.' We left him amply supplied with funds for the journey to Luxor, which would take place as soon as Hassan was able to travel. Thanks to Nefret's quick and vigorous intervention, the wound was healing without any sign of infection, and Selim had already begun designing an artificial foot for Hassan. On Thursday, we bade them farewell, and betook ourselves to the railway station, where we found our goods undisturbed. All the passengers from the boat were there, there was nothing surprising or suspicious about that, since they were all on their way to places farther south. I exchanged a few pleasant words with Captain Moroni before he took his place in the train. Newbold nodded and tipped his hat, but did not approach us. He hurried his companion into one of the cars. Her face was veiled, and her form completely concealed by her garments. The train was described as deluxe, with supposedly dust-proof dining and sleeping cars. Compared with my earlier travels by train in the Sudan, it was deluxe. There were actually windows in the carriages and reasonably good food to be had in the dining car. After luncheon, we went back to our compartment, taking Merrison with us. I didn't want him swaggering up and down the train, smirking at the women and inspiring the interest of people like Newbold. On the east ran a chain of bare, violet-coloured hills, and an endless stretch of stony desert, quivering with heat. 
the view was not inspiring, and the cars were not, in fact, entirely dustproof. I put my head on Emerson's shoulder and closed my eyes. I was just drifting off when Emerson got to his feet. Sorry, Peabody, he said, as I tipped over sideways. I did not realize you were asleep. We're almost there, so get your gear together. I sat up and stared out the window. There was nothing to be seen but sand, rock, and a few spindly palm trees. But what do you mean, we're almost there? Almost where? Not Meroway. It is at least Abu Hamed, said Emerson. Or, to be more precise, station number ten, just outside Abu Hamed, where we connect with the branch line to Karema. Karema, I muttered. Being still somewhat befuddled by drowsiness. What? Why? Nefret handed me a dampened napkin. Though somewhat rumpled and glowing with perspiration, she was as bright-eyed as... as I was not. Wipe your face, Aunt Amelia. So we are going straight to Napata and Jebel Barkel instead of on to Meroe? Very clever, Professor. Well, I thought so, said Emerson modestly. Throw any pursuers off the track, you see. They'll be expecting us in Meroway, and by the time they realize we aren't there, we will be on our way. And if any of our fellow travelers get off here, we will know them for what they are. The dampened napkin was most refreshing. I looked from Emerson, who was smirking in a particularly annoying fashion, to Ramses, whose thin brown face for once betrayed his feelings. They were not those of surprise. Amusement, rather. As a rule, I like seeing Ramsay's imperturbable countenance soften. Not on this occasion, however. You took Ramsay's into your confidence, I cried accusingly. But not me. How could you, Emerson? No, mother, Ramsay's protested. Honestly, father said nothing to me. It was, however, a predictable and logical course of action. Uh, as you no doubt... Uh, I'll go and alert Selim and Dawood and the other fellows, shall I? The train was slowing. I looked longingly at the seat, which opened into a nice, comfortable bed, a bed which I was destined not to enjoy, and put on my hat. Give Merison a poke, will you, Nefret? Goodness, I believe that boy could sleep through a sandstorm. Since the railway to Abu Hamid cut across the arid desert, miles from the river, a series of wells had been sunk to supply needed water. Station number 10 marked one of these. It merited no worthier name. There was nothing there, except the station itself, a grey wooden building from which any paint had long since been scoured away by sand and sun. The train to Karema was certainly not a train deluxe. In addition to the aged engine... There were only half a dozen carriages and a baggage car, but at least it was there, waiting for passengers when we drew to a stop. The inevitable small merchants hawked fruit and water and sand-sprinkled bread. At my suggestion, Ramses bought a supply of food, and Nefret persuaded the dining car steward to fill our water bottles with cold tea. The transfer of our by-now mountainous heap of baggage took some time, a few of the other passengers took advantage of the delay to get off and stretch their limbs. Among them were the Germans, who strode up and down, swinging their arms as if they were running a foot race. Several men in native garb bargained with the food sellers. They were the only ones who boarded the Karema train. While we waited, I saw a horse and rider, motionless atop a low dune some distance away. They were the most interesting objects in that dismal scene, and well worth looking at. Figures of pure romance. The noble steed posed as if ready to break into a gallop. The rider straight in the saddle. He was too far away for me to make out his features, but the sun, now past the zenith, shone on his long robes and the folds of the white kaffir that covered his head. In one hand he carried a long lance. As I stared, raising my hands to shield my eyes from the glare of the sun... The man raised the lance and shook it in greeting, or, which seemed more likely, menace. Emerson, I said, tugging at his sleeve, look there. 
Not now, Peabody, not now. Quickly, my lads, get those boxes aboard. Be careful with that one, Selim. It has the camera and plates. Well, Peabody, what is it? The horseman had gone. Nothing, Emerson. We took our places on the train. I have seen worse, though some of the windows would not open and others would not close. There were only two classes, first and worst. Except for our party, the train was almost empty, so we were able to spread out. Merrison announced he was going to find an unoccupied compartment and have a little sleep. You may wake me when we arrive, he informed Selim, who curled his lip but refrained from retort. How long? I asked Emerson wearily. Only ten hours or so. You may wake me when we arrive, I informed him. I thought sleep would be impossible because of the jolting and the insufferable heat. It did not seem to me that I slept, but suddenly, between one heartbeat and the next, I was in another place, a place I knew well. A cool breeze touched my face, and the sky was the pale translucent blue that precedes the rising of the sun. That rising was behind me, for I faced west, the western cliffs of Thebes, with the stately ruins of Deir el-Bahri to my left, and straight ahead the winding path that led to the top of the plateau and onward to the Valley of the Kings. I began to climb, as I had done so many times before. It is a steep climb, and I was breathing quickly when I reached the top, and there, coming toward me with long strides, was a man, tall and straight, black-bearded, his turban snowy white, the long skirts of his gullabilla wafting round him. Turn, sit, and see the sunrise, he said. I pressed my hand to my heart. It was beating hard, and not with the effort of the climb. Abdallah, is it really you? You look so young. He stopped a few feet away and smiled, his teeth white against the unmarked black of his beard. There is no time here, Sit. It is a dream. Did you not know? The happiest dream I have had for many a month, I replied, and it was the truth. Joy filled me like water overflowing a cup, leaving no room for grief or surprise or doubt. I laughed aloud and held out my hands to him, Still smiling, he shook his head, and something told me I must not move closer or touch him. Turn, sit, he repeated, and we will watch the sunrise again together. Of all the memories I had of Abdallah, this was the strongest, for as the years went on and his beard whitened, he found the climb harder being Abdullah, he would never have admitted it, so I had got into the habit of pretending I needed to stop and catch my breath before following the others to the valley where we were working. To see the molten orb of the sun lift above the eastern cliffs across the river and watch the light spread across green fields and rippling water, ruined temples and modern villages was a glorious experience. I had sometimes thought that if I were allowed to return to the world of the living... This was the place I would choose. After, of course, making sure Emerson was where I wanted him to be and the children were doing well. I turned obediently and felt his presence close behind me. He whispered something that sounded like an invocation and I said, Are you a sun worshipper, Abdallah? I always suspected you were something of a pagan. Then so are you, Sitakim. But let us not talk religion, which is a waste of breath. What in the name of God, whichever name it may be, has taken you on the road you now follow? Turn back before it is too late. So, you've returned to warn me, have you? I have, though that too is a waste of breath, said Abdallah grumpily. You do not heed warnings. You take foolish chances. It wasn't my idea, I retorted, and laughed again. His scolding and my defences were so wonderfully, realistically familiar. Impulsively, I turned to face him. He moved back a few steps. Why do you laugh like a silly girl, instead of listening to me? 
he demanded, scowling. Because I'm so glad to see you. I have missed you, Abdallah. Ah. Hmm. He stroked his beard and tried not to smile. The time allotted me is almost over, Sid. If you will not turn back, at least take care. Trust no one, not even the innocent. You are followed by enemies more than you know. Hot air replaced the cool breeze of a Luxor morning. I felt Emerson's arm round me and the wet cotton of his shirt under my cheek. So wonderful had been that vision that I was loath to see it vanish. Vision or dream or something more. It had taken away some of the pain of Abdullah's death. I smiled to myself, remembering his complaints. She's smiling, said Nefret's voice. Don't wake her. Emerson's grumble was his best attempt at a whisper. The heat seems to bother her quite a lot, Ramsay said, his even voice softened by concern. Father, can't you persuade her to remain at Jebel Barkel instead of... Certainly not, I said, and sat up. What time is it? A single lamp with a cracked shade smoked redly, casting gruesome shadows across the faces of my companions. Time for a bite to eat, said Emerson avoiding the question of how much longer the jolting journey would take. We have waited for you, my dear. It was clever of you to think of purchasing food. I knew you wouldn't think of it, I retorted. Have Selim and the others been supplied? Ramses assured me they had, and we tucked into the food with good appetite. You look much better, Aunt Amelia, Nefret remarked. You were smiling in your sleep. Did you dream of something pleasant? Quite pleasant, my dear. I saw... My voice cracked, and Ramses at once handed me a cup of tea. Sipping it, I reconsidered what I'd been about to say. There was no way I could convey the potency of that dream and its effect. They would think me silly and sentimental if I spoke of Abdallah. Emerson might pat me on the head. He means it to be comforting, but he pats too hard and musses my hair. I dreamed about Luxor, I explained. The cliff above Deir el-Bahri. The air was beautifully clear and cool, and the sun was rising. Emerson cleared his throat noisily. It won't be long before we are there again, Peabody, my dear. I promise. He patted me on the head. Ouch, I said. The interminable trip dragged on. I dozed fitfully in the circle of Emerson's strong arm. The fret had also succumbed, curling up on the seat with her head on Ramsay's lap. He was reading, or trying to, by the dim light, but he seldom turned a page. At last, the first faint blush of dawn lessened the darkness. There it is, Emerson shouted in my ear. Jebel Barkle! In fact, it was not. The great mountain temple of the ancient Kushites was still several miles away. However, the train was slowing, and I was willing to make allowances for Emerson's imagination. Ramses closed his book and put his hand lightly on Nefret's shoulder. She murmured and turned her head, her face rosy with sleep. Wake up, Ramses said. We're arriving. Mother, how are you feeling? Perfectly fit, I assured him. What now, Emerson? Everything is quite in order, said Emerson proudly. You remember my old friend, not Mustafa Emerson. I hoped he was dead. Peabody, said Emerson, in shocked surprise. I meant, that is to say, I thought he must be dead. Ramses had turned away, his hand raised to hide his mouth. He remembered Mustafa and my blistering comments on that gentleman's ideas of a comfortable dwelling. A tent in the desert, a cave in the cliffs, would have seemed like shepherds compared with the house Mustafa had furnished us. Oh, said Emerson, well, he's not. And there he is, right on time. Admirable chap. The years had left no mark on Mustafa, possibly because he had already been as wrinkled and cadaverous as he was likely to become, and as dirty. 
As before, he was so very glad to see us. It was difficult to resent the old fellow. There were real tears in his eyes when he embraced Emerson and saluted me. He praised Nefret's beauty and grace, looked wonderingly at Ramsay's, who had been a boy of ten at their last meeting, and burst into a litany of praise, with which I was becoming only too familiar. Just like your honoured father, tall and handsome and strong, pleasing the women with your... Quite, said Emerson, with a little cough. Well, Mustafa, I see you have a number of stout fellows ready to help us. This is our Rais Selim and his cousin Daoud and his cousin Ali. Karima was the end of the line. I watched the train empty. Apparently Emerson's ruse had succeeded, for I saw no European travellers. The other passengers were locals. During the train ride, I had tried several times to make Emerson tell me how he planned to proceed once we reached Napata. He had simply smiled with insufferable smugness. You said you would leave it to me, Peabody. I really regretted having done so, though to be fair, I do not suppose I could have improved on Emerson's arrangements. The route we had followed was not the one we had taken ten years earlier, when we arrived by steamer from Kerma. In other words, from the opposite direction. This part of the extensive region known as Napata was new to me, and I cannot say I liked the looks of it. Except for the depot, there was nothing at Karema except a collection of the round huts known as tuhuls. The palm branches of which they are woven offer hospitality to a variety of insect and rodent life. The inhabitants are very generous, and most would willingly turn out of their own houses in order to lend them, uh, hire out, I should say, to visitors. But intrepid travellers who visit this region are well advised to bring their own supplies, including tents. We had brought tents. It was a cheering thought. We will set up our first camp at Jebel Barkle said Emerson, stroking his chin. It is only a few miles farther on. Unless, people you would like to rest for a while. Mustafa has offered his... No! I exclaimed. That is, it is good of Mustafa, but I would rather go on. By what means of transportation, may I ask? Mustafa proudly indicated a variety of means... I declined to ride in the carts, which were already being laden with our belongings, and rejected a camel in favour of a gloomy-looking donkey. Mustafa had also provided two horses, which kept prancing and rolling their eyes in a menacing manner. I had the feeling Mustafa expected some entertainment from watching us attempt to ride the creatures. His face fell when Ramses, who can ride anything on four legs, sprang into the saddle and brought the balky beast under control with knees and hands. Emerson took the other horse. He had no trouble either. Even an obstreperous horse knows better than to argue with Emerson. Leaving the men to finish loading the carts, we proceeded on our way through the village. Before long, the holy mountain came into sight. It was an impressive natural feature, a flat-topped mountain of sandstone rising up over two hundred feet from the plain. At its base were the ruins of temples that had stood on that spot for over a thousand years, raised to the glory of the god amun Re, and numerous other deities. As we drew nearer, I saw that there was movement among the tumbled stones. "'What is going on?' I asked Mustafa. They are digging, Sitakim. He added in a tone of mild disgust, digging for broken stones and empty pots like you. They have found no gold. Emerson and Ramses were some distance ahead, but I heard Emerson's hell and damnation clearly. I believe Ramses attempted to restrain him, but he was in such a passion he paid no attention. He set the horse to a gallop. It was not a sensible thing to do, considering the broken ground. We went after him as fast as we could, but before we caught him up, the horse stumbled and Emerson flew over its head, landing with a thump at the feet of a man who had appeared from behind one of the broken walls. He was wearing European clothing and a pith helmet. With an exclamation of concern, he assisted Emerson to rise. Our worst forebodings had been fulfilled. The tally was now almost complete. The man 
was a confounded Egyptologist. Chapter 5 You aren't going to wash the damned camels, are you? Emerson inquired, in the tone of one who hopes for a negative answer, but does not really expect it. Certainly I am. Have you ever known me to shirk my duty to man or beast? These camels look extremely clean, said Emerson, in a last-ditch effort to stop me. Without wishing to be rude about a friend of yours, Emerson, I refuse to take on faith any object, animate or not, brought to us by Mustafa. Curse it, Emerson muttered. Well, don't expect me to help you, bloody nonsense. It was only a token protest. Emerson would never mistreat an animal or allow it to be mistreated. Besides, he knew I would go ahead anyhow. On my first visit to Egypt, I had discovered that most of the little donkeys bestrode by tourists suffered from sores and mistreatment. And I had made it a point ever since to wash and doctor all the animals we employed. I had to give Emerson credit. He had refrained from mentioning the dismal fate of the last batch of animals I had doctored. I had to give myself credit. It was not my fault that someone had put poison in my camel medicine. It won't take long, Emerson. I believe I have the hang of it now. This proved to be a somewhat optimistic assessment. I have reached the conclusion that it is impossible for anyone to wash a camel quickly and easily. Camels have perfectly vile tempers, and I could almost believe more joints than a normal quadruped. Ropes around the camel's legs and around its neck were held by our men, two to each rope, but this did not prevent the creature from protesting in its mournful howl and kicking for all it was worth. I stood on a little mound with a bucket of soapy water and my brush and scrubbed whatever part of the camel came within reach. Ramses and Nefret helped by rinsing the beast off while trying to avoid its flailing feet. They were both good with animals, but as Ramses remarked once the job was done, even St. Francis would have come a cropper with a camel. It was a rather vulgar way of putting it, in my opinion, but since he was wet to the waist and rubbing his shin, I allowed him a little leeway. We had been at our present camp at the Pyramid Field of Nuri for two days. It was across the river and several miles downstream from Jebel Barkal. Emerson had insisted we move on as soon as he identified the confounded Egyptologist. He had employed a more emphatic adjective. Fortunately, he had been somewhat winded by his tumble off the horse, so I was able to get to him before he burst into a denunciation of the unfortunate man, who I felt certain was guilty of nothing more than being where Emerson did not want him to be. I stuck to that opinion even after Mr. McFerguson, shaking hands all round and smiling broadly, mentioned that he had worked this past summer at the British Museum. Budge! growled Emerson, this being the first word he had breath enough to utter. No, sir, McFerguson, said the gentleman in surprise. May I say, sir, what an honour it is to meet you, and Mrs. Emerson, and young Mr. Emerson, and Miss Forth. Selim and Dowd, I said, indicating those two stalwarts, our rice and his able assistant. Mr. McFerguson shook everybody's hands again. He was a comical-looking man with a round blob of a nose and a long chin and ears that had spread out to remarkable dimensions as soon as he removed his pith helmet. "'Dear me, this is an unexpected pleasure,' said he, in a prim little voice, like that of someone's maiden aunt. "'I had heard you plan to work at Meroe.' "'Had you indeed?' said Emerson, who had been in receipt of several sharp pokes from my parasol. Yes, yes, word of your plans gets about, even to such a remote spot as this. I received a communication from Mr. Reisner only last week. Ah, I said, so you are connected with Mr. Reisner's Nubian survey, not with the British Museum. No, no, that is... Yes, yes, the Nubian survey under Mr. Reisner. 
but how rude I am to keep you standing here in the sun. Allow me to offer you a glass of tea while you tell me how I may assist you. This is a huge sight, and I would be absolutely delighted to share it with individuals of such distinction. Emerson shook his head irritably. Then a new idea seemed to occur to him. His eyes moved from Mr. McFerguson's preposterous nose to his equally remarkable ears. Hmm, he said. That is, uh, thank you, most kind. While McFerguson bustled about, finding seats for us in the shade of his tent and directing his servants to make tea, I whispered to Emerson, I know what you're thinking, Emerson. You are mistaken. How do you know what I'm thinking? How do you know I am mistaken? That nose is too good to be true. Be that as it may, Emerson, and be McFerguson who he may, he is not Sephos. For one thing, Sephos is almost as tall as you, and McFerguson is several inches under your height. For another, his eyes are dark brown. For a third thing, he has short, stubby fingers and broad palms. It is impossible to change the shape of one's hands. Sephos's hands are narrower and more flexible, with long, slender fingers. Emerson's glare informed me that I ought to have omitted this last criterion. I said hastily, "'And his shoulders are much narrower than yours, my dear, "'so please don't pull his nose.' "'Bah!' said Emerson, convinced against his will, but still aggravated. "'All the same. "'He may have been sent here by Budge. "'Nonsense, Emerson. "'His being here is pure coincidence. "'Be nonchalant, my dear.' Be agreeable. Smile. Do not arouse suspicions which are, in my opinion, as yet unaroused. Uh, hmm, said Emerson, thereby acknowledging the justice of my remarks. I cannot say that his attempt at a smile was particularly convincing, though it did show quite a number of teeth. He declined Mr. McFerguson's eager offer to share the sight, however. We mean to have another go at the pyramids of Nuri, he explained. Finish the job we started ten years ago. Better be on our way, eh, Peabody? McFerguson's face fell. At least let me show you round the site, Professor. There has been a great deal done since you were last here. Another time, said Emerson, with a longing glance at the looming bulk of Mount Barkhall and the ruins that stretched out around its base. They had never been properly excavated, and it was Emerson's contention that they were the remains of the temples of various periods, stretching back in time to the 16th century BC or even earlier. Emerson loves temple ruins. The more complicated, the better. I gave him an affectionate pat on the arm. The resourceful Mustafa summoned up a small flotilla of boats, and we got ourselves and our baggage across the river. My attempts to persuade Emerson to postpone this activity until the following day fell on deaf ears. May as well get it over, Peabody. I want to be on our way within forty-eight hours, before that fellow McFerguson can report we're here. I cannot believe he is one of the vultures, Emerson. Our change of plans was so sudden, no one could have anticipated we would head for Napata. And he'd been there for almost a week. So he claims, Emerson muttered. I've never heard of the fellow, have you? No, but perhaps he is new to the field, <clears throat> said Emerson. We left the animals behind. There would be, Mustafa assured us, other donkeys and camels awaiting us. I sincerely hoped so. The pyramids were on the plateau, a mile and a half from the river, and the sun was hot. However, Emerson was in the right. The crossing had to be made sooner or later, and unpacking and repacking our goods would be an unnecessary waste of time. It was late afternoon before my donkey ambled up the slope and I saw the pyramids ahead, black against the blazing reds and purples of the sunset, an even more welcome sight were the flatter pyramid shapes of the tents. The men had gone on ahead, with the baggage camels and what appeared to be half the local population, and many willing hands had made light work of preparing camp. A quick look round told me that Budge, or someone of his ilk, had been at Nuri since we worked there in 98. 
The poor pyramids were even more dilapidated than they had been then. There's Mother, called Ramses, as I and my escort approached. All right, are you, Mother? She'll be fine as soon as she gets her whiskey, said Emerson, assisting me to dismount. See to it, will you, Ramses? This way, Peabody, my dear. The following is an excerpt from Letter Collection C. These letters and the ones that follow from Nefret Fourth were not found among the papers of the persons addressed, but in a separate bundle, once in the possession of Mrs. Emerson. My dear Evelyn, in my opinion, it is highly unlikely that you will ever receive this letter. When we return from our projected expedition, you will hear of our adventures from our own lips. However, a sensible individual takes even remote possibilities into account. We are returning to the lost oasis. An unexpected visitor brought us a plea for help from our friend Tarek, of whom you have heard me speak. I need not explain to you why we felt obliged to respond. I will leave this sealed packet with my excellent solicitor, Mr. Fletcher, with instructions to deliver it when and if he deems it appropriate. Gargery would most likely steam it open. It contains this brief account and a copy of the map of which you have heard so much. Emerson strictly forbade me to enclose the map, remarking in his bluff fashion that Walter might be fool enough to dash off to the Sudan looking for us and die of thirst in the desert. I have more confidence in Walter. Should he decide to act, it will be with all due deliberation and caution, and the choice, in my opinion, should be his. You will, I expect, take David into your confidence. Persuade him, if you can, that our failure to include him was due to our great affection for him. Do not assume if we fail to return within a reasonable time that we are no more. It sometimes takes us a little longer than we expect to carry out our plans. The following is an excerpt from Letter Collection C. Dearest Leah, I don't know whether you will ever receive this letter. It seems unlikely, but I felt the need to write it. There's a chance we may not return, and I'd hate to vanish without a word of love to someone who means so much to me. Aunt Amelia has written your parents. If you don't already know about my life before I came to England and the epic journey that brought the Professor and Aunt Amelia and Ramses, I mustn't forget Ramses, to the Holy Mountain, your parents will tell you when they deem it advisable to do so. We have always been confidants, Leah, dear, but on this one subject I have been mute. I had promised I would not speak of it, but that wasn't the only reason for my silence. As the months and years went on, the memories faded until they seemed as unreal as a strange dream. Aunt Amelia would probably claim I didn't want to remember. It may be so. We're about to set out on the same journey. There are still great gaps in my memory, Leah. I don't know why. But I remember Tarek, who was my foster brother, kind and gentle and brave. I loved him very much. Yet I had forgotten what he looked like until his young brother, Merison, arrived at Amana House with an appeal for help from Tarek. Tarek and his son, his only heir, are suffering from a strange illness which none of his people can cure. Not too surprising, when one considers that their notions of medicine are derived from the mixture of magic and unscientific theory that characterized ancient Egyptian medicine. I've read everything I could find on tropical diseases, and I hope and pray I can be of assistance. In any case, we had to make the attempt. I owe Tarek my very life, for I doubt I would have survived long in the city of the Holy Mountain. I had wondered now and then what happened after we fled, leaving Tarek still fighting for his throne? What was the fate of my despicable cousin, Reggie Forthright, who had done his best to prevent me from returning to England to claim the inheritance he hoped to get? Was Tarek able to alleviate the suffering of the common people, the enslaved and downtrodden wreckage? Did he marry and have children? For all I knew... The city of the Holy Mountain itself might have fallen into ruin, overrun by enemy tribesmen or destroyed by some unforeseen natural catastrophe. I know the answers to some of those questions, and soon, inshallah, I will find out the other answers. 
The journey will be difficult and hazardous, and yet I look forward to its culmination with an eagerness you may find hard to understand. Whatever happens, I will be glad I attempted it. Remember that, dear Leah, if the worst should befall us. I don't for a moment believe it will, though. Aunt Amelia would never allow such a thing. Thus ends this excerpt from Letter Collection C. The die is cast, said Emerson, in reverberant tones. The time has come. We were seated round a campfire, which had been kindled for comfort rather than warmth, though the sun had set and the air was already cooler. The moon had not yet risen, and the outlines of the tents glimmered palely in the darkness. What die? I demanded irritably. What time? We will not be ready to leave for several more days. You sound like the Oracle of Amun Ra. How do you know what it? Ramses broke into his father's complaint. What father means is that the time has come to tell Dawood and Selim the truth. Up until now, they've heard only the story we told the hired drivers that we're looking for ruins west of here. And a cursed unconvincing story it is, too, I declared. The number of camels and drivers we have hired is far too great for such a short trip. The men are already speculating. Let them speculate to their heart's content, said Emerson. They don't know anything. Good gad, Peabody, you're in an excessively critical mood this evening. Get her another whiskey, Ramses. I accepted the offering in the spirit in which it was meant. You're both right, I admitted, after a cheering sip or two. Ramses, will you ask Selim and Dow to join us? You might see if you can locate Merison, too. He has rather avoided us lately. He's been making friends with our men, Lefret said, as Ramses went off to the little camp our fellows had set up. I told him his autocratic manner wouldn't serve him well with them, or us, and he seems to have taken my lecture to heart. He and young Ali have become chums. I couldn't help laughing a little. The word chum sounded so incongruous in connection with Merison. Ramses was back almost at once with our two stalwarts. I couldn't find Merison, he explained. Selim scowled. He and Ali have gone off together. You must speak to the boy, Emerson. He is too interested in the women of the village, and Ali is young and a fool. We won't have to worry about the women of the village any longer, said Emerson. This is our last night here. Um, our last for some time to come. Send him, Dawood, my friends. The journey on which we embark tomorrow is longer and more hazardous than I have led you to believe. I am about to tell you of our true purpose, so that you may decide whether or not to accompany us. The choice will be yours. Placid and unmoving as a monumental statue, Dawood said, There is no choice. Where the father of curses goes, we follow, even into the fires of Gehenna. Emerson cleared his throat noisily. Hmm. Thank you, my friend, but you have not yet heard the facts. There is no need, said Selim. The moon had risen. Its cold light outlined his sharp, handsome features with shadows. Doubt has spoken the truth. Your words come as no surprise, Emerson. The boy is no villager, and the weapon he carries is no Arab sword. Without further ado, Emerson launched into the story of the lost oasis. Dowd listened with interest, but without surprise. He had an almost childlike sense of wonder about the world, which meant that nothing surprised him, or that everything did. Selim's mobile features expressed a variety of emotions, but the predominant one was delight. It will be a great adventure, he exclaimed. Think well, Selim, said Emerson, in sepulchral tones. At the end, our bones may lie whitening in the sand. Dowd's deep voice replied, Or they may not. It is in the hands of God. Emerson had been speaking his fluent and somewhat florid Arabic, I now said in English, We have a proverb. God helps those who help themselves. Said him through his head back and laughed aloud. And so we will, said Akim. How can we fail with you and the father of curses to lead us? 
I could think of a number of ways, but there was no sense in raising doubts. It is a well-known fact that courage is based to some extent on the failure to recognize danger. Stupidity, in other words. And also on self-confidence. After swearing Selim and Daoud to secrecy, we went early to bed. Emerson dropped off to sleep at once, but I could not. Forebodings seldom trouble my husband. He does not believe in them, or so he says. They troubled me that night. Small wonder, considering what the morrow would bring. At last... I gave up the attempt to woo slumber. Rising quietly, I put on my dressing gown and slipped out of the tent. The moon was nearing the full. Its silvery rays were bright enough to illumine a familiar form, standing still as a statue some distance away. His back was toward me. He looked toward the west. He must have heard the rustle of my skirts as I approached, but he did not turn. Is something the matter, Ramses? I asked. His voice was as soft as mine when he replied. The stillness forbade loud speech. I was remembering a certain night ten years ago when you found me outside my tent and I told you I'd heard a voice summoning me, a voice I took to be yours. It was on this very spot. Or oh, near it, I agreed cautiously, for he sounded very strange. Please don't tell me it's happened again. That imagined voice was the result of a post-hypnotic suggestion planted in your mind by Tarek in order to... I know why. His face looked like stone. His eyes sunk in pits of shadow. His high cheekbones and firm mouth sharply outlined. In a sudden panic, I caught hold of his arm and was ridiculously relieved to feel warm, hard human muscle. He shivered. The air was cold. Then he looked down at me and said lightly, No, mother, nothing has happened. Not even a ghostly voice from the past. I couldn't sleep and stepped out for a breath of air. I hope I didn't waken you. I couldn't sleep either. It will be all right, mother. I know. Good night. Good night. I was drinking my tea when Selim came striding toward me. Ali has not come back, he said, too worried to give the conventional greeting. The boy is not in camp either, unless he is with you. I turned in silent inquiry to Ramses, whose tent Merison shared. He shook his head. He didn't come in last night. Send someone to the village to look for them. Emerson's teeth snapped together. If they're sleeping off a night of... Um, well, if that proves to be the case, I will make them run behind the camels for a day or so. They were not in the village... Dowd returned to report that they had been there, but had left shortly before midnight. The boy, he had adopted Selim's contemptuous name for medicine, drank much beer and boasted to the girls. Ali drank too. Selim sprang to his feet with a furious exclamation. Never has he done such a thing. He knows the law. When he returns, I will... I don't think we should wait for him to return, Ramses said in a curiously flat voice. I'll go back to the village and start from there. Perhaps someone saw which way they went. This seemed the most sensible procedure, so we all accompanied him. We got little information from the locals. The virtuous among them had been asleep, and the habitués of the illicit tavern too drunk to be observant. We spread out, searching behind every outcropping and hillock. It was Ramses and I who found Ali, in a little gully only ten feet from the path. One look was enough. The pool of blood in which poor Ali's body lay had already dried. Ramses made me look away when he turned the body over, and I did not protest. Ali's throat had been cut. There was no trace of Merison. That takes care of coincidence, said Ramses, after we returned to camp. Selim and Daoud were preparing Ali's body for burial, which must be done before sunset. The villagers had offered all possible assistance, including a grave in the cemetery near the small mosque. The poor souls were afraid they would be blamed and horrified by the brutality of the murder. It wasn't one of the villagers, Ramses went on. They had everything to lose and nothing to gain by such an act, and Ali is the third of our men to be taken from us. Yes, yes, Ramses, we all understand that, Emerson grunted. He was smoking furiously, which would have been a sure sign of distress and anger, even if his scowling countenance had not made his feelings clear. 
when I get my hands on that boy. Merison? Nefret stiffened. Why do you assume he is guilty? He may have been carried off by the people who killed Ali. It is possible, Ramsay said. Nefret's pale cheeks regained some of their colour. You're against him. You always have been. That'll be quite enough, Nefret, I said firmly. She had been badly shaken by the death of Ali, a merry, laughing lad whom we all liked. The situation is too grave for recriminations, I went on. We now have proof that someone is working actively against us. Who that person may be, we do not yet know. There is one strong point in Merison's favour. He was not on the boat when Hassan fell or was pushed overboard. That's right, Nefret said eagerly. However, I said, I suggest that we look through our baggage and that of Merison. I would like to know whether anything is missing. Money, personal possessions, papers of any kind. Well done, mother, said Ramses. How good of you to say so, my dear. At first glance, Merison's precious suitcase and other bundles appeared to have been undisturbed. But when we opened the former, we found that most of the clothing was gone, along with the sword and its scabbard. Ramsay so forgot himself as to use bad language. God damn it! I thought I was being so clever when I insisted on his sharing my quarters, but I obviously wasn't clever enough. He must have squirrelled his things away earlier. I'd have waked up if he'd had come crawling in last night. You did suspect him, Nefret said. A pity no one else did, said Emerson, in the cool, quiet voice that was more ominous than his bellows. Not your fault, my boy. Let's see what else he has taken. Emerson had already dispensed part of the money in return for the hire of the camels and their drivers and a considerable bakshish to the obliging Mustafa. The rest, according to his count, was intact, which did not surprise me, since he had kept it close to his person throughout. Our next concern was for the weapons. The heavy boxes which had been in Selim's charge appeared to be untouched, but Emerson wrenched them open. All here, he said. I meant to hand them round before we left, but I may as well do it now. He lifted one of the rifles, a great heavy thing, longer than my arm, and handed it to Ramses. Load it now. Yes, sir. Ramses refused to hunt and preferred not to carry firearms, but after an incident a few years earlier, he had taken up target shooting, explaining in his cool fashion, there are circumstances under which proficiency in this particular skill might come in useful. I reached for another of the weapons. Emerson slapped my hand away. It's too heavy for you. The recoil would probably break your shoulder, even if you could hold it steady. You too, Nefret. Nefret was watching Ramses, who had taken shells from another box and was expertly loading the weapon. I don't want it, she said in a choked voice. What about the pistols? I inquired, hopefully. There were seven of them, large, efficient-looking weapons. You are the world's worst shot, Peabody, said my husband without rancor. You have never even managed to hit anything with that little pistol of yours. Anything you aimed at, that is. I could learn, Emerson. Not with this, said Emerson. There were enough weapons to arm all the men, with several extra. We left Ramses to mount guard over them, and went to carry out the next stage of our search. I had a horrible foreboding of what we would find or rather, not find. It was Nefret's copy of the map that had disappeared. At first she refused to accept this, tossing papers all over the floor of the tent in a frantic search. Face facts, my dear, I said, putting a sympathetic hand on her shoulder. He had ample opportunity to take it. So did others, Nefret muttered, as she knelt, head bowed, among the scattered papers. We are wasting time, said Emerson. The sooner we get off, the better. Masoud is watering the camels. I will hurry him up and tell him to start loading. Nefret, get your gear together. Peabody, find Selim and tell him we are leaving immediately after the funeral. You mean to go on, then? I asked. Have we any other choice? In fact, we did not. It would have been unthinkable to abandon Tarek if there was the slightest chance that we might be of service to him. As Ramses had been the first to point out, Merison had carried no written message, and his behaviour since had given us good cause to question his veracity. Yet I had known men to be proved innocent, with even stronger evidence against them. The evidence against another unknown party was mounting. 
Medicine could not have been responsible for Hassan's injury. Ali's brutal murder and the theft of the map from Nefret must be part of the same deadly plot. The map in itself would be of no use to Merison. He could not read the compass bearings. Yet, as we had realized, he could not find his way to the Holy City or guide another there without such an aid. Whoever this other might be, his intentions would not be honorable or harmless toward us or toward Tarek. We knew only two things about him. He could use a compass and follow a map, and he'd been on the boat to Wadi Halfa. The missionaries, the great white hunter, the garrulous German tourists, the agreeable Captain Moroni, or someone else cleverly disguised as one of the crewmen. The sun sank slowly in the west, or to put it in scientific terms, the turning globe on which we stood revolved slowly in the opposite direction. Like most sunsets in sandy regions, this one set the horizon ablaze with streaks of brilliant colour, and the last rays of the solar orb cast a theatrical effect of light and shadow over the forms of man and beast. It was a scene to capture the imagination of the most romantic, the line of heavily loaded camels, their long shadows even more grotesque than the beasts themselves, and the men attired in long robes and a variety of exotic headgear. Except for the incessant grumbles of the camels, an eerie silence reigned. We were to travel at night, avoiding the daytime heat, while the moon was at the full. It was the evening of the day following our discovery of Merison's treachery. Emerson's intention of leaving that same night had been overly optimistic. Camels cannot be hurried when they are being readied for a long expedition. They must be allowed to drink their fill and rest afterwards. Proper loading also requires time and deliberation. Zowali had politely pointed out these facts to Emerson. He was the leader of the Bedouins we had hired to accompany us. Most of our men were Nubians, but the Bedouin know the desert well and were valuable additions to our crew. Zawali was a slight, wiry fellow who had, of course, known Emerson before. When he joined us that evening, he was wearing the usual Bedouin garb of shirt and long calico drawers, with the voluminous woolen jerd wrapped round him to ward off the chill of the night air. He was accompanied by Masud, the Nubian, who was to accompany us, and from whom we had hired the majority of the camels. We had just returned from seeing poor Ali laid to rest, as was his due. When the brief service was concluded, Selim had been the first to turn away. Daoud's eyes were red-rimmed, but there was no sign of grief on Selim's face, only a fierce determination. It bore the same expression as he sat listening to the exchange of compliments between Emerson and Zawali and Masud. Finally, the latter got to the point. It is said, Father of Curses, that our destination is farther distant than we believed. I contracted with you for thirty maharas. Days travel, Emerson replied. I did not inform you of our destination. Masud accepted this snub with a shrug, but persisted. Is it to the southwest we go? Yes. Wallahi. It is a dangerous route, Masud muttered, and many a caravan has been eaten up by the wild men of the hills along the way. They do not fear God. They are like birds. They live on the tops of mountains. We made an agreement, Emerson replied, monumentally calm. If you are afraid to keep it. Zawali let out a derisive laugh. Yes, let the cards depart. We are with you, Father of Curses. Masud turned on him with a snarl, and Emerson said, There are no cowards here, and I will not allow quarrelling among you. Go now. We will load the camels tomorrow after they have rested. There was no further dissension, but I saw trouble ahead. When I mentioned this to Emerson, he made a rude remark about forebodings, and then went on, Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, as you are so fond of saying, Peabody. We will deal with difficulties as they arise. The camels were brought in about midday, and the loading was about to begin when Daoud spoke to Emerson. We must bless the baggage, Emerson. What? Oh, curse it, said Emerson. But Daoud, there is no holy man. I have brought him, said Daoud. 
The wrinkled old man who had conducted Ali's funeral service stepped forward, his fingers on the amber beads of a rosary. With a polite nod at Emerson, the old gentleman went from pile to pile of baggage, saying little prayers over each. Then he turned to the men who had gathered round him and raised his hands, palms up. May God guide your steps. Allah yasadid khutak. May he give success to your undertaking. It was a good thought, Dode, said Ramses, who, like myself, had seen the faces of the travellers brighten. Mm, yes, Emerson muttered. Thank you, Dode. He rewarded the imam extravagantly and then ordered the loading to begin, courteously asking the advice of both Masood and Zawali. When the loads had been carefully arranged and balanced, he rode back along the long line for a final check. He had hired a pair of riding camels, which we were to use in turn, and several of the pack camels' loads had been lightened to accommodate other riders. The men would walk most of the time, mounting a camel periodically in order to rest. A camel's pace of approximately two and a half miles per hour is not hard to match. Emerson came back, followed by Daoud. Ready, my dear? inquired my spouse. As ready as I will ever be, I replied, shifting position slightly. The new position was not much of an improvement. In my opinion, there is no comfortable position on a camel. But first, Emerson, I know you do not share my belief in divine providence, but... Oh, good God, haven't we had enough praying? Emerson demanded. Very well, make it short. I bowed my head and murmured a few words, then turned to Daoud. Will you say a blessing, Daoud? I have already asked for his mercy, Sid, said Daoud calmly. But one can never pray too much, is it not so? His reverberant voice rose up over the grumbles of the camels, and I am sorry to say those of Emerson. Praise be to God, the master of the universe, the compassionate. Other voices joined his in the recitation of the Fatah. Ramses was among them, and I'm not ashamed to admit that mine was also. It made a good impression on the men, but that was not why I did it. It was a long night. The sun had been up for several hours before Emerson let out an exclamation and pointed. There it is, the rock outcropping where we stopped last time after the first day's journey. We'll make camp there. I didn't know how he could be so certain it was the same place. There were a number of outcroppings, for this was not the Great Sand Sea or the Sahara with their great rolling dunes, but a region of red and black hills interspersed with stretches of sand like pools of gold. However, I was more than ready to get off the cursed camel. Pride forbade I should admit weakness. I waved Ramses away when he offered me his hand to help me dismount and waited until he had turned his back before I slid stiffly to the ground. The men made haste to erect tents, for there was not much shade, and that would shrink as the sun rose higher. Selim started a small fire to boil water for tea, and we gathered round it to eat bread and extremely warm oranges and soft goat cheese that would be rancid before the day was over. From now on, we would subsist on the basic supplies of desert travellers, rice and flour, baked into unleavened bread, sugar and tea with a handful of dates now and then. The dates were not the sweet, soft fruit to which we were accustomed. The camels lived on them when there was no fresh fodder available, and we ate them only for nourishment. I had packed some tinned food, tomatoes and bully beef and fruit, but the weight of such items prohibited excess. Physical fatigue sent me quickly to sleep, but I woke gasping for breath after what seemed only a brief nap. It was later than I had thought. The sun had sunk down the west, brightening one side of the tent. Emerson sat cross-legged nearby, writing in his notebook. Perspiration trickled down his cheeks and dripped onto the paper, but he went on with his scribbling as placidly as if he had been in his study at a manor house. Whereas I felt like St. Lawrence on his griddle, toasted on front, back and both sides. Ah, awake I am he inquired when I stirred. Did you have a good sleep? Dear me, you appear a trifle warm. Would you like a drink? I would like a cold bath, I croaked. But I will settle for a sip of water and a damp cloth. Emerson supplied these luxuries, 
and after I had wiped my face and throat, I felt quite myself again. I looked out the open flap of the tent and saw that the others were stirring. The red rays of the declining sun turned the baked ground into a fair imitation of the infernal regions. A hot wind blew hair into my eyes. Did you sleep at all? I asked, removing the pins and shaking out my heavy locks. It was too hot. Oh, really? Emerson looked up. Seeing what I was doing, he came to my side and lifted my hair, spreading it across his big hands. Not now, Emerson, I mumbled through a mouthful of pins. Just helping to dry it, my dear. The sun will be down soon, and then the air will be delightfully cool. A perfect night for a ride in the moonlight. What a poet you are, Emerson. Emerson grinned. Don't swallow your hairpins, Peabody. After a supper of tinned peas, tinned beef, and bread baked on hot stones, we reloaded the camels and were ready to ride when the moon rose. The effect is quite magical. In the clear, dry air of the desert, the light of the lunar orb is so bright one can see almost as clearly as by day, and the stars blazed with diamond fire. The ground that had been a sullen red was now silver. I felt quite refreshed, but Emerson was not inclined toward conversation, so for a while we rode side by side in silence, and I contented myself with admiring the strong outline of his profile and the glimmer of moonlight in his black hair. We stopped once to stretch our stiff limbs and have a sip of water, and then we went on and on and... A hard hand closed over my upper arm. Here now, Peabody, said Emerson in some alarm. If you fall asleep, you will topple off the damned camel. I'll take you up with me, shall I? Uh, no, thank you, I said, my energy restored by the suggestion. If there is anything more uncomfortable than riding a camel, it is riding in front of someone who is riding a camel. I'm wide awake now. Quite a refreshing little nap. Thank you for looking out for me, my dear. I was about to indicate a point of interest over there. They shone as if luminescent, bleached to a pearly white by moonlight, a pile of tumbled bones. We had seen the remains of a few small animals, gazelle and hare and antelope, but these were not those of a small animal. They had been stripped bare by predators of some kind. Reflected moonlight twinkled in the empty sockets of the skull as we passed. A camel? Not just any camel, said Emerson. One of ours. Formerly one of ours, I should say. The first of the lot to die. Not a good omen, Emerson, I said remembering how the cursed beasts had perished one by one, leaving us stranded. You and your omens, it is a good sign we're on the right track. Leaving the desolate heap of bones behind, we went on until the stars faded and the sky began to lighten. We were making good time, better than we had on our first trip, but Emerson gave no indication of halting. The sun rose behind us, sending our shadows leaping forward across the ground. One elongated outline grew more rapidly, and I saw that Ramses had come up beside us. Father, look there. At first it was only a little puff of pale yellow, but it grew rapidly like a moving cloud. Is it a sandstorm? I asked apprehensively. Worse, said Ramses. Can you tell how many? Emerson asked. Nope, they're still too far away. Hmm said Emerson. He yanked violently on the head rope of his camel, turning it. You know what to do. Yes, sir. Ramses set his beast to a trot and rode toward the end of the caravan. I do not approve of cruelty to animals, but the only way to get the attention of a camel is to whack it. The men needed no such inducement. They, too, had seen the approaching cloud and knew what it portended. With blows and shouts, they formed the recalcitrant beasts into a rough circle and forced them to kneel. Quite like the Old West, is it not? I said to Nefret. Camels instead of wagons, but it is the same principle, and... Get down, Peabody, Emerson said, reinforcing the suggestion with a push that made my knees buckle. And pay attention. 
Let me have one of those guns, I demanded. It was possible now to see moving forms in the dust, the forms of mounted men. Not on your life, said Emerson. Shedim, Dawood, here, on my right. Ready, Ramses. The armed men knelt behind their camels, their weapons aimed. Most of them had rifles, and some of the Bedouin prided themselves on their marksmanship. However, according to Emerson, they were inclined to exaggerate their skill, and many of the guns were old, verging on antique. We appeared to be outnumbered by at least ten to one. I crept closer to Emerson and took out my little pistol. Don't fire until I give the word, said Emerson coolly. He repeated the order in Arabic. That includes you, Peabody. Aim high over their heads. Non second thought, Peabody. Don't fire at all. Ready? Now. A somewhat ragged volley shook the clear air. Again, Emerson said. The second volley slowed them, but the leader came on. He was brandishing a weapon, not a rifle, a huge sword. So it was to be hand to hand fighting. I heard Nefret gasp and saw her grip the hilt of her knife. I wondered if Emerson would have the decency to shoot me after all hope had failed. I wondered if I could bring myself to shoot Nefret rather than let her endure the hideous alternative, capture and slavery in a Turkish harem. They might not bother taking me prisoner, since, by their standards, I was a trifle elderly, but Nefret was a prize worthy of a pasha. To my horror, Emerson suddenly bounded to his feet. Exposed from the waist up, he raised both arms and shouted something in Arabic. The leader was now so close I could make out his face, hawk-nosed and bearded, decaying teeth bared in a ferocious fighting grin. The blade of the sword flashed as he whirled it over his head. Emerson dropped the rifle, folded his arms, and stood motionless. Shoot! I shrieked. Ramses, shoot the bastard! The man immediately! Do you hear me? His finger was on the trigger, and the gun was aimed at the rider's breast. Then it shifted just a little, and he fired. The bullet struck the raised sword blade with a ring like that of a gong, and the weapon flew out of the rider's hand. With a howl of pain and surprise, he jerked at the camel's head rope, and the beast veered off, followed by the rest of the attackers. They swept past in a cloud of sand. Well done, said Emerson giving his son a clap on the back. Thank you, my boy, for ignoring your mother's hysterical order. Yes, sir, Ramsay said. He lowered the rifle and sat down rather suddenly. It was a wonderful shot, Selim said. Now what do we do? Wait, said Emerson, still upright. Here, Peabody, what's the matter? You aren't going to faint, I trust. No, I am going to kill you. How dare you, Emerson? How dare you frighten me so? I am beginning to suspect, said Ramses, wiping his wet forehead with his sleeve, that my flamboyant gesture was unnecessary. No, no, it was a nice added touch, Emerson said soothingly. Well, let's make camp, shall we? Stand down, all of you, he added in resounding Arabic. The father of curses will protect you. A short time later, Selim, who had appointed himself sentry, let out a hail. A rider approaches Emerson. Ah, said Emerson. One man, Selim? Yes, father of curses. He stops. He holds up a white flag. Does that mean I cannot shoot him? I'm afraid so, said Emerson. Keep him covered, though. Aren't you going to invite him to join us for breakfast? I inquired with, I believe, a pardonable touch of sarcasm. Presently. I want my tea first. Is it ready? I handed round the cups and went to join Selim. The envoy was the leader himself. He had a rifle slung over his shoulder and a sword stuck through his sash, but his hands were empty except for the makeshift flag of truce. Emerson continued to sip his tea. He was delaying for two reasons. First, to annoy me, and second, to assert his superiority over the envoy. Finally, he stood up and stretched. I am going with you, I said. No, you're bloody well not. Good gad, Peabody, how would it look to have a woman trailing at my heels? Ramses, then. Ramses, who had not risen, said evenly, There is a kind of etiquette in these matters, mother. He'll have to go alone, not on foot, but unarmed. Quite right, said Emerson. 
he mounted one of the kneeling camels and induced it to stand up. We crowded round Selim, watching Emerson ride slowly toward the waiting man. I do not approve of this, I announced. Who are these people, anyhow? Tebu, I think. Ramses did not take his eyes off his father. Of the Guran tribe. Emerson reined up beside the other man. I couldn't hear what they said, but after a brief exchange, the raider burst into a peal of laughter, and the two rode back toward us, side by side. Ramsay said softly, Mother and Nefret, go into one of the tents and stay out of sight. Why? Nefret demanded. I've never behaved like a proper Muslim lady, and I won't do it now. The majority of the Tebu are peaceable enough, but the renegades among them are the most dangerous raiders in the western desert. They still take slaves, Ramsay said through tight lips. This fellow may be another of father's old friends, but I see no sense in waving a tempting morsel like you in front of him. Get inside. But, mother, make her go or I will. You're right, I said. Come, Nefret, we can peek through a crack. We beat a hasty retreat and just made it inside the tent before Emerson and his guest entered the camp. At the sight of the latter, Nefret's resentful scowl faded. Of medium height, dark-skinned as a Nubian, and lean as a feral dog. He was not an impressive figure, physically, but there was a certain look about him, the look of a man who acts as he chooses, with no inconvenient interference from his conscience. He seemed to be in quite a jovial frame of mind. His bearded lips parted in a smile, but as he settled himself on the rug and accepted a glass of tea... His eyes moved around the camp, as if taking stock of our numbers and our gear. Then they fixed on Ramses, who was sitting cross-legged next to him. Your father tells me it was you who shot the sword out of my hand. A lucky shot. I hit what I mean to hit, Ramses said, looking down his nose at the other man. I could have put the bullet through your head if I'd wished to. You were wise to turn aside when you did. It wasn't like him to boast, but as he knew, modesty is wasted on Arabs. The man, whom Emerson had introduced as Kamal, acknowledged the retort with a nod and a grin. It was the sight of your father that turned me aside, boy. They did not tell me this was his caravan. They were all speaking Arabic except for an occasional aside in English from Emerson to Ramses or vice versa. Who hired you? Emerson demanded. A man of honour does not betray his employer, was the smooth reply. Secrecy was part of the agreement. It seems an unnecessary part, said Emerson, equally bland. If your aim is to leave none alive to tell the tale. But no further of curses, that was never our aim. He widened his eyes and shook his head. We were told you had money, many camels, weapons, other treasures. He looked toward the tents, the only places of concealment. Ramsay stiffened, and Emerson said in English, Don't look round. To Kamal, he said, So you were to have these treasures as your reward for what? For massacring the lot of us? But I said it, Father of Curses. I did not know it was you. He grinned. If I had known, I would have asked for payment in advance. And now? Holding his glass as delicately as a lady might hold her cup, Kamal finished his tea before he replied. We would overwhelm you in the end, but you would kill many of us first. He pursed his lips and looked thoughtful. I asked myself whether the cost would be too high. This is becoming tiresome, said Emerson to Ramses, and time is passing. Have you any suggestions? He wants a bribe. Naturally. The question is, will he stay bribed? He turned back to his guest and shook his head. My son is young and hot-tempered. He tells me that if your men attack, you will be the first to die. In the name of our old friendship, I would regret that. So would I, said Kemal, with admirable candour. His eyes shifted sideways toward Ramses, who stared stonily back at him. Hmm. Perhaps we can come to an agreement... After some discussion, a barbaric little ceremony ensued. At Emerson's request, Ramses handed over his knife. 
Emerson drew the blade across his palm and handed the knife to Kamal, who did the same. They clasped one another's hands and maintained the grasp for several long seconds, while their mingled blood dripped down onto the sand. Then Kamal offered the knife to Ramses. It was clear that he was not simply returning the weapon, but proposing a similar ceremony. Eyebrows raised, Ramses looked at his father. Emerson, who was, confound the man, wiping his bleeding hand on his trousers, nodded and watched benignly while Ramses and the bandit also became blood brothers. The look of barely concealed distaste on my son's face would have been amusing if the situation had been less grave. In the name of God, the great said the marauder piously. He made another leisurely survey of the camp. I could almost hear him counting to himself. A dozen armed men and Daoud, who had not taken his eyes off Kemal, and who looked willing and able to murder him with his bare hands. So, he said, it only remains to seal our friendship with an exchange of gifts. After further discussion and the presentation of a heavy leather bag, Emerson escorted his dear old friend to his camel, and a fret and I emerged from our hiding place. "'Is it safe to come out now?' I inquired, somewhat belatedly, since we were already out. "'He's riding off,' said Ramses, who'd been watching them. "'But you might have waited until I told you it was all right.' "'Pa,' said Nefret, brushing sand off her front. Emerson came back, looking somewhat pensive. Well, I demanded, I didn't understand everything that was said. You were both talking so rapidly toward the end, but I saw you hand over what appeared to be most of our remaining money. How are you going to pay the drivers? Shouldn't we move on at once, instead of waiting for nightfall? Why didn't you insist he'd tell you who hired him? How do you know you can trust him to stay bribed? Emerson sat down, his back against the nearest camel, and took out his pipe. I beg you will keep quiet for a while, Peabody, while I explain the subtler nuances of our encounter. I saw nothing subtle about it. His meaning was clear. He'd been told to intercept and rob us, if nothing worse. His reward would have been money, modern weapons, camels, and nefret. And you, said Emerson. He said treasures, plural. Oh, bah! I exclaimed. Don't tease, Emerson. I really cannot endure your idea of humour just now. He couldn't get much of a price for a mature lady like myself. Now, there you are mistaken, my dear. There is one individual who would pay any price, including his fortune, his life, and his sacred honour. In the intense warmth of those keen blue orbs, my vexation melted. I could even forgive him the florid rhetoric. One gets into a certain verbal pattern after speaking a formal language like Arabic, and I knew he meant every florid word. More than one, said Ramses, matter-of-factly. Kamal's primary purpose was robbery and abduction, though he wouldn't have balked at killing a few people. We would have been taken prisoner and held for ransom. The drivers, those who survived, would have been left here without transport or water. Some of them might have made it back to the river. Might, Lefret repeated. The man is completely without conscience. Not at all, said Emerson, smoking placidly. His moral principles are different from ours, but he will not break them, always supposing one can pin him down in such a way that he cannot squirm out of a promise. I believe I have done that. Anyhow, he added, smiling at Ramses. That flamboyant gesture of yours wasn't wasted. He has a very healthy regard for his own skin, and a very healthy respect for your marksmanship. It was quite a compliment for him to offer blood brotherhood. It was a lucky shot, Ramsay said flatly. But next time, if there is a next time, I'm reasonably certain I can put the bullet into his body. That's horrible, Nefret exclaimed. Not nearly as horrible as what might happen to you if you fell into his hands, Ramses retorted. You aren't in jolly old England, Nefret, nor in Egypt, where your person is sacrosanct. Now, now, don't quarrel, said Emerson. There won't be a next time. He was honour-bound not to betray the name of the man who sent him. But he dropped a few hints. It was Mahmoud Dinar, 
the governor of Darfur. We would have been handed over to him, and he wouldn't run the risk of taking English persons prisoner for the sake of a paltry ransom, or even for Nefret, though I expect he would regard her as a pleasant bit of lanyap. He must be after Merison's gold, or rather the location of the place from which it came. He would have questioned us, Nefret murmured. Torture? Oh, yes, said Emerson placidly, and we would have told him. His eyes moved from Nefret's white face to Ramsay's, who sat with head bowed, staring at his clasped hands. You owe Ramsay's an apology, Nefret. He was not being vindictive. He was being practical. After I had cleaned and bandaged the cuts on their palms, Emerson ordered us all to our tents. Though he had expressed confidence in the honour of his bandit friend, he took the precaution of arranging for sentries. He took the first watch himself. Fret, who had spoken very little, went off without further comment, and as I watched her drooping little figure vanish into her tent, I decided I would have to have a word with her if she did not snap out of it. We could not afford girlish qualms or sulks. It was so unlike her. I suppose she was still upset about Merison, unwilling to accept the evidence of his treachery and resentful of the rest of us for suspecting him, especially, and unfairly, of Ramsay's. He had been quite right to scold her. Sleep did not come easily, but stern self-discipline prevailed. I did not even hear Emerson return. When I woke, later in the afternoon, he was snoring placidly beside me. I crawled over him and went out to find most of the men in the same state of somnolence and Ramsay standing guard behind a convenient camel. All quiet? I inquired. I assure you, mother, that if it hadn't been, you would have been made aware. His eyes, squinted against the glare of light, continued to sweep the horizon. Do you share your father's belief that we can trust in that scoundrel's word? Ramses lowered the rifle and turned, leaning against the camel. You didn't hear what he said just before he left? I heard, but I did not understand all of it. It was a warning. The word has spread among the Bedouin that a group of Inglisi are headed west with a rich caravan. Some of them consider infidels fair game. That is very comforting, I must say. You would not accept a comforting lie. No, I cleared my throat. Um, I have a little favour to ask. Of course, mother, he spoke absently, without looking at me. If we are attacked and overrun, and all hope is lost, will you be obliging enough to shoot me? That got his full attention. He whirled round, the orbs that were usually half-veiled by lowered lids and long lashes wide with consternation. For the love of God, mother, don't tell me the possibility of some such contingency arising hadn't occurred to you. I saw how you looked at Nefret this morning. Nefret too, of course, I added. Nefret too, Ramses muttered. He passed his hand over his mouth. Do you mind which I do first? I know it is asking a great deal of you, my dear, I said, undeceived by his attempt at insouciance, but I cannot depend on your father to do it. He is such a confounded optimist that he might wait too long. I feel sure I can count on you to assess the situation accurately. Premature action would be equally ill-advised. That is certainly one way of putting it. Ramses rubbed his bristly chin. He had neglected to shave that morning. I reminded myself to keep closer taps on him and his father. Emerson would certainly grow his confounded beard again if I let him. You realize, don't you, Ramsay said, that if I miscalculated with with you and the fret and escaped death at the hands of the bandits, I would have to turn the gun on myself, assuming father didn't shoot me. His voice was uneven and his mouth was twitching. Ramses, are you laughing? No. Well, he got his mouth under control. It was such an appalling suggestion that I couldn't... I couldn't take it seriously. Laughter can be a defence mechanism, I explained. I was quite serious, of course, but perhaps I was asking too much. Never mind, I'll just do it myself. I'll try, Mother. 
If I hadn't known better, I would have said there was a trace of moisture in his black eyes. I can't promise more, but it won't come to that. I don't suppose for a moment that it will. It is only that I believe in planning for all contingencies. Yes, I know. His hand rested on my shoulder in a grip as hard as it was brief. As father, say nothing of this to him. Emerson came striding toward us. The sun was sinking westward. After a comprehensive survey of the terrain, he nodded with satisfaction. You can relax now, Ramses. Come along, Peabody. Don't stand here chatting. We must be on our way as soon as the moon rises. Our rather nasty meal of tinned tomatoes and rice was enlivened by a discussion with Masood. He was so terrified of Emerson that his voice kept breaking into falsetto, but he persisted in his complaints, which were, I was bound to admit, legitimate. He and his men had seen Emerson hand over a bag of money. Their money. How were they to be paid? They deserved more than they had been promised. They had agreed to drive camels, not fight raiders. Well, you didn't have to fight, did you? Emerson demanded. The power of the Father of Curses saved you, as it will continue to do. You knew and accepted the dangers of desert travel. You will get your money, more than you were promised, if you are faithful. And if you should fall, I will be husband to your widows and a father to your children. I'm not sure that was the right thing to say, Emerson, I murmured. Dowd cleared his throat, like a small rumble of thunder. The word of the father of curses has never been broken. Iowa, the wretched man mumbled. Yes. And, said Dowd, the curse of the father of curses will follow a man to his death. That's a good one, Ramsay said appreciatively. New, is it? Dowd beamed and Masood backed off, wringing his hands and nodding energetically. Whether it was the promise or the implicit threat, he had been cowed. And although the rest of the men did not look happy, I did not believe they would rebel, as our former crew had done. Emerson agreed. These fellows are loyal. They're only a bit timid. Ah, oh, well, tomorrow we'll tell the tale. By morning we will be halfway between the river and the first oasis. If we can get them past that point, they will have to come on with us or risk getting lost and running out of water. Let us hope there are no more untoward incidents tonight. Untoward incidents, indeed, I said sarcastically. Another attack, you mean? The Tebu do not attack at night, said Emerson, with a certainty I wished I shared. As it turned out, they did not. Morning dawned clear and bright, and the first rays of the sun illumined the landmark we sought, a tumble of black stone marked by a pair of columnar shapes. As Emerson had discovered on our first trip, it was the ruin of a small building, most probably a shrine dating from Meroitic times. The desert had been less arid when the noble families of that vanished civilization travelled westward. There may have been water here two thousand years ago, though there was certainly no evidence of it now, nor of any life. The fact that the night had passed without untoward incident had restored the confidence of our drivers. I had thought they might entertain superstitious fears of the ancient ruin, which, as all men knew, were haunted by ghosts and afrites. But as I overheard one of them remark, The father of curses and the Sitakim know how to drive off demons, and if evil men come, we can hide behind the stones. It was a very sensible way of looking at the matter. So there was relieved laughter, and even a snatch of song, as the men set up the tents and tended to the camels. As I had expected he would, Emerson immediately discarded his coat and began crawling round the tumbled stones, emitting little yelps of excitement like a dog nosing out rabbit burrows. Ramses paced restlessly back and forth, while Selim and I boiled water for tea. I did hope Ramses was not still brooding about my request— it didn't seem likely. My son was not one to let his imagination run away with him. Father, he said suddenly, have a look, will you? What is it? I exclaimed, rising to my feet. Oh, dear, not the tebu again. No, it's all right. 
Ramsay said, but something's coming this way. I can't make it out. The sun is in my eyes. Father? Emerson's eyes followed the direction of his pointing finger. An animal of some sort. Yes, sir, Ramsay said patiently. Well, curse it. Your eyes are better than mine. If you can't tell what sort of animal, how do you expect me to? It's not moving any fast. A gazelle? Out here? In my opinion, this was no time for idle speculation. However much they appeared to enjoy it. Use the binoculars, I said, somewhat sharply. What? Oh, said Emerson. Where are they? Where you left them, I suppose. Never mind, I'll get them. I went back to the tent and located Emerson's binoculars under his coat and hat, which he had thrown on the ground. When I returned to the group, the men, including Selim, were still arguing. They had agreed that the animal must be a camel, but could not identify the nature of its rider. It is a strange shape, Selim said somewhat nervously. Not like a man. Does it have... does it have two heads? Honestly, I thought, men... Raising the binoculars to my eyes, I adjusted the focus. The animal was a camel. There were two heads, which was not surprising, since there were two people. I recognized one of them immediately. Mr. Newbold, the great white hunter, who did not look very great at that moment. In one arm he held the other individual, who lay limp in his grasp. The features were hidden, but I felt sure I knew who it was. Chapter 6 The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Ramses couldn't get the image out of his mind. Nefret sprawled on the sand at his feet, her shirt crimsoned by her heart's blood, not dead but dying slowly and in agony because his hand hadn't been steady enough to do the job right. The surer alternative was a bullet through the head, but he doubted he could bring himself to do it. He had seen men die that way. It was not a pretty sight. Shooting his mother wouldn't be much fun either. If worse came to worst, a quick death was preferable to slavery, especially for a woman, wasn't it? Or was that one of those hoary old sayings that people recited but never really thought about? Like... England expects every man to do his duty, and better death than dishonour. Did women really believe that, or was it something men wanted them to believe? At least he was no longer in doubt as to how his mother felt. Hearing that brisk matter-of-fact voice propose the unthinkable had shaken him, but he oughtn't have been surprised. That was his mother for you. She could look a fact in the face without flinching, no matter how unpalatable it was which was more than he could do. He closed his eyes, as if that could shut out the image of Nefret. And then it wasn't Nefret, but the girl, Daria, her blood soaking into the sand and her wide, dead eyes staring emptily, and he knew he had killed her. And he started out of a half-doze to see dawn pale in the eastern sky and close ahead the twin black columns that had been their first landmark. Knowing his father would want him to spend most of the day investigating the miserable ruin, he walked back and forth, stretching his legs and trying not to look at Nefret. Emerson had apparently decided his old acquaintance had stayed bribed, but Ramses wasn't so confident. His eyes kept straying toward the east, hoping not to see an ominous cloud of sand. What he did see eventually was not so much ominous as strange. The beast could only be a camel. But what was a single camel doing here? His mother's surprised identification of the camel's rider brought them all to attention. He appears to be in distress, she added, raising her voice to be heard over Emerson's curses. And he is holding someone before him on the saddle. Someone who is unconscious or... Oh, dear... She started impetuously forward. So did Nefret. Emerson threw out his arms and barred their path. Stay back, both of you. What the devil did I do with my... Give me that, Selim, and keep the women back. He snatched Selim's rifle and stalked off to meet the approaching riders. Ramses followed more slowly. Unlike his father, 
who had divested himself of binoculars, weapon, and extraneous clothing, he was armed, but he didn't draw the pistol. Newbold was not fool enough to start trouble with an enraged Emerson. He had both arms round the girl. She was a limp white bundle, wrapped in dusty garments, except for her head, which had fallen back against his shoulder. "'What the devil are you doing here?' Emerson demanded. "'Following you, what do you suppose?' Newbold's haggard face twitched as if he were trying to smile. Ran into trouble, though. Barely got away. No water. Please. Emerson nodded at his son, and Ramses caught the girl as she slipped through Newbold's failing hold. She was as light as a bird. Her eyes opened, and a dreadful ripple of déjà vu ran through him. It was the face he had seen in his dream, pale and empty-eyed. Then her eyelids fell, and she turned her face against his breast. Take her to your mother, Ramses, Emerson ordered. He held the heavy rifle in one hand as easily as he would have held a pistol. I'm ahead, Newbold. You can stick on for another twenty feet, I presume. Nefret broke away from Selim and came running to meet Ramses. She hurt, poor little thing. That brute had no business forcing her to come with him on a trek like this. Put her in my tent, Ramses. Ramses left her crooning reassurances as she divested Daria of her muffling garments. The girl hadn't spoken, but she was awake and aware. The wide, dark eyes followed him as he went out of the tent. His mother was ministering to Newbold in her own fashion. She prodded the bruise on his face with sufficient force to wring a grunt of protest from him and then snatched the cup of water from his hand. Your injury is superficial. Not too much water. You ought to know better. This isn't my kind of country, Newbold said. Thank you, Mrs. Emerson. Now may I lie down and get some sleep. I've been on that camel for almost twenty-four hours. Ramses had to admire the man's nerve. He was behaving as if he were an invited guest. His nonchalance had no effect on Selim and Daoud, who stood over him like prison guards. Emerson's scowl grew even darker. So was the uh, young lady, I presume. How is she, Ramses? Just tired and thirsty, I think. The fret is looking after her. Very well, you bold. Start talking, Emerson said. You can rest after you've told us what you're doing here. It will probably be a pack of lies, but I believe I can winnow the truth out of it. There's no point in trying to lie about why I'm here, Newbold said coolly. I've been on your trail ever since Cairo. But I had a number of things that made me believe you were after something more lucrative than a wrecked archaeological site. Your sudden departure from the train at Abu Hamid caught me unawares, but it also confirmed my suspicions. You wouldn't have lied about your destination if your purpose had been what you claimed. His voice had grown hoarse. Mrs. Emerson, may I trouble you for another sip of water? Face grim, she provided it. Go on, Mr. Newbold. We left the train at Berber and hired camels and drivers. You had left Nuri by the time we arrived there, but the obliging villagers told me which way you'd gone, and it wasn't difficult to follow your trail since you were only a few hours ahead. Then we ran into the trouble I mentioned. A band of raiders. They killed my men, shot some of them in cold blood after they'd surrendered. Their camp is a day's ride to the southwest. There's a well which they keep cleared. Again, his voice failed. He took another sip of water. They intended to hold me and Daria for ransom, or so they said. I thought it wiser not to take that for granted. Early yesterday morning, several hours before dawn, most of the men rode away, and I saw my chance. Stole back one of my camels and Daria, and made my escape. Daring escape, don't you mean? Emerson inquired. Why didn't you head back to the river instead of trying to locate us? A needle in a haystack, so to speak? Newbold looked back at him without expression. Followed the raider's trail, I suppose, said Emerson. Lucky you were able to elude them when they were on their way back, eh? Oh, the devil with it. Find him a blanket and a bit of shade, Daoud, and stand guard over him until I relieve you. Already the sun was high enough to make the ground shimmer. Ramses heard his mother humming to herself. 
The melody was one of her favourite Gilbert and Sullivan songs. Here's a state of things, here's a pretty mess. You've got that right, Mother, he said. What shall we do with the bastard? Tie him up and leave him here, Selim said promptly. We can make the knots so he can free himself after we have gone. And we will leave one of the camels and enough water for him to reach the Nile. The girl too, Ramses inquired. His mother gave him a look of mild surprise, and he realised she'd been about to ask the same question. She hadn't expected him to make it first. Neither had he. To cover his confusion, he took out a cigarette. It was an indulgence he seldom permitted himself, since his supply was limited and smoking dried the throat. "'I fear that idea is not feasible, Selim,' Emerson said, filling his pipe. "'In addition to the objection Ramses has raised, supposing he wasn't able to free himself.' He would die horribly and slowly of dehydration. Much as I despise the fellow, I don't want his death on my hands. And if he were able to free himself soon enough, he would be right back on our trail. He shook his head regretfully. I can only think of two alternatives. Either we take them along, or we send them back, with enough of our men to make sure they do go back. Well, Peabody, what is your opinion? I feel certain you have one. "'I am not certain I do, Emerson.' "'Her husband gave an exaggerated start of surprise, "'and she went on with less than her usual assurance. "'Neither alternative is ideal. "'Showing him the way to the Holy Mountain "'is precisely what we wanted to prevent "'and what he hoped to achieve. "'On the other hand, providing an adequate escort "'would mean divesting ourselves "'of at least half a dozen men and camels. "'That would leave us dangerously short-handed.' There is a third alternative, said Emerson, puffing thoughtfully. Not alternative, Emerson. There can only be two. The derivation of the word... Never mind the confounded grammar lesson, Peabody. We could take them as far as the first oasis and leave them there, along with the slowest and most timid of our drivers. After a moment, Ramsay said, I think you've hit on the only possible solution, Father. From the oasis, we will be escorted by Tarek's men. And, he added to himself, we'll have fewer deaths on our conscience if something goes wrong. If only they could persuade his mother and Nefret to stay too. Are we agreed, then? Emerson asked. Good. Get some rest, Peabody. You too, Emerson. Shortly, shortly. Ramses and I want to do a bit of excavating. Isn't that right, my boy? You too, Selim. Yes, sir, said Ramses. Yes, father of curses, said Selim resignedly. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. From that point on, Emerson changed the routine of our march. The bitter cold of the night and the steaming heat of midday were equally unbearable, so he broke the trek into two parts, the first from around midnight until 9 or 10 a.m., the second from late afternoon until men and camels both gave out, which usually happened around 8 as we went on, day after steaming day and night after starry night, there were fewer bones and other evidences of life along the trail. The men were tired. More and more frequently they dropped out of line to snatch half an hour's sleep before running to catch us up. We were delayed for several hours when one of them failed to return. He had walked to his fate, as the desert men put it, losing his head and his sense of direction after unremitting hours of sand and heat. Emerson finally located him, wandering aimlessly at right angles to the trail, and brought him back. Emerson kept riding back, looking for signs of pursuit. He returned from one such foray with a furrowed brow, and I inquired apprehensively, "'Did you see anything suspicious?' Emerson shook his head, and Ramses, who was walking with me, said, "'That's good.' "'I'm not so sure,' Emerson replied." We've had encounters with the slavers and Newbold. We have yet to hear from the military and the Egyptological community. Surely not now, I protested. We are too far from the river. I'm not so sure, Emerson repeated. And what about Merrison and his confederates, whoever they may be? They have the map, Ramsay said. They wouldn't have to keep close on our trail. Newbold plodded along in sullen silence. 
Nefret had kept Daria with her, and Emerson had refused Newbold's demand that she be returned to him with such eloquence that the request was not repeated. The girl now shrank from Newbold, hurrying to whichever one of them was closest to her when he approached. I wondered what the fellow had done to her. She had claimed she wasn't afraid of him. Fourth's second landmark, the dead tree, had fallen at last. Its bleached white branches looked like the skeleton of a mythical monster. As we sat round the campfire that night, Emerson said, Only three more days to the oasis. I wonder what we will find there. Water, I trust, I said. The stopper came out of one of the fatasses today, and several gallons were lost before anyone noticed. There is plenty of water, Emerson replied. I was wondering whether Turek has sent an escort to meet us. He surely will, Nefret said eagerly. He must be as anxious to see us as we are to see him. Ramses, who'd been tracing abstract designs in the sand with a stick, looked up. He may have given us up by now. It took medicine. He stopped, with a snap of teeth, at a warning gesture from Emerson. Newbold was not part of the group. He never was, since we had made it plain his company was not wanted. But he was sitting a little distance away, listening. We had told him nothing about our final destination or the circumstances that had prompted our journey, only that we proposed to leave him in safety and relative comfort within a few days. He hadn't given up trying to learn more, however. After his attempts to ingratiate himself with Selim and Daoud had failed miserably, he took to chatting with the drivers. This too was a failure. They knew even less than he did, and his attempts at bonhomie were not convincing, since he considered natives beneath him. The terrain began to change, becoming rougher and more broken. Walking was difficult, and the men complained of sore feet. Their heelless slippers were not suitable for country like this. Even the hardy Bedouin were showing signs of uneasiness. One morning, while the men were unloading the camels, Zawali the Bedouin approached Emerson. After the formal greetings, he asked how much farther Emerson meant to go. I hired you for thirty mahalas, Emerson reminded him. We have only been seven days on the march. But you did not tell us where we were going. This is new country to me. We do not come this way. We have only encountered one group of raiders, Emerson pointed out. And as you saw, they surrendered as soon as they recognized me. It is not ordinary raiders that keep us from this path. He hesitated, reluctant to admit fear and then went on. Years ago, some of the young men among our people heard of a rich oasis to the west and set out to find it. They did not come back. Others went forth. None came back. And there are legends. Ah, yes, the customary legends, said Emerson to me, told by those who never saw the fearsome sights they describe. He went on in Arabic. What sort of legends... So are they. Of burning mountains and fiery rain, O oh father of curses. Of men, if they are men and not a fritz, eight feet tall, whose arrows never miss their mark, and who can outrun the fastest stallion. Hmm, said Emerson, stroking his by now horrible beard. Well, Zamali, you have my word, the word of the father of curses, that we will meet no such dangers as you have described. Don't tell me you are afraid, you who jeered at the Nubians for cowardice. Zawali gave him an evil look, but left without further comment. We'd been amazingly lucky, in fact. We hadn't lost a man or a camel, and despite the slight accident to the fatas, our water supply was holding up, even if it did taste vile. Late on the following day, we passed a grotesque jumble of dried skin and white bones. Could that have been our last camel? I asked Emerson, who was walking with me. I've been keeping track of the time, and it seems to me that we have just about reached the point where it collapsed. It's possible, Emerson said indifferently. Not that... Uh, here, Peabody, where the devil are you going? He followed me, of course. I stood by the miserable heap, remembering that terrible day when the demise of our last camel had left us stranded miles from water, with little hope of reaching it before dehydration and exhaustion overcame us. 
yet my strongest memories were of courage and loyalty. Tarek, who had never deserted us, and who was to save us in the end. Ramses, only ten years of age, plodding doggedly through the sand without a whimper of complaint. Emerson, the bravest of men. Are you going to say a prayer over it? inquired the bravest of men, disagreeably. I forgave him his little joke. If it was a joke... I only wondered if the things we had to leave behind were still here. Hmm, said Emerson, his interest revived by the prospect of digging. We found nothing, though we excavated all round the cadaver. No great loss, said Emerson. Changes of clothing and a few books. That was about all we abandoned, wasn't it? Do you suppose Tarek came back and retrieved them? He was a great reader. Emerson gave me a long look. Peabody, don't tell me you loaded us down with a supply of trashy novels for Tarek. Naturally, I brought gifts, I replied composedly. Mr. Ryder Haggard has written several other novels in the interim, and I also thought Tarek might like The Prisoner of Zender and The Scarlet Pimpernel. I don't doubt he would, Emerson muttered. He had a weakness for romantic twaddle. It's getting dark. We'd better catch the rest of them up. He persuaded me to ride for a while, so I mounted his camel, and he walked beside me, his long strides easily matching the pace of the beast. I'd been about to ask him how much farther we had to go, but he kept mumbling to himself. The word twaddle was oft repeated, so I decided to work it out for myself. We'd been approximately one mahala from the first oasis when the last camel perished, but our pace from then on had been slowed by my feverish malady, and Ramsay's short legs, to say nothing of a deficiency of water. When we stopped that night, Emerson had predicted it would take us two more days to reach the oasis, and Kemet had replied, how well I remembered, half a day for a running man. We had waked next morning to find him gone. Though, of course, we went on. We hadn't got very far before even Emerson's giant strength at last failed, and I was unconscious when the rescue party Kemet led back along the trail arrived in the nick of time to save us. So then, with a strange little thrill, I realised we were within a few hours of our destination. I couldn't recall much about the place on our initial journey. I had been in a coma, which lasted until after we reached the Holy Mountain, and on the return trip, which might more accurately be called a flight, we had stayed only long enough to rest for a few hours and acquire fresh camels. It had been a pleasant spot, with flourishing palm trees and rich grass. One could easily understand why the desert men fought over such places, their emerald grass more precious than emerald gems in the midst of the wilderness. Would we reach it by the end of this night's march? Now that we were so close, my impatience could hardly be contained— I yearned for greenery and shade, for cold, pure water, instead of the foul-tasting liquid in the fatasses, and, of course, for word of our friend. When Emerson called a halt shortly after midnight, I protested. Surely we can reach the oasis by morning if we go on, Emerson. I yearn for greenery and shade, for cold, pure... Yes, yes, said Emerson. Come now, Peabody. You ought to know better than suggest we ride blithely up to the place in the dark. Tarek keeps a garrison there, and its purpose is to intercept curious travellers by one means or another. Oh, you're in the right, Emerson, I admitted generously. It's just that I yearn. So does the fret, said Emerson, as the men began barracking and unloading the camels. I had to speak firmly to her. Try to talk some sense into the girl, will you? And get into your blankets. The cold is bitter. As soon as it is light, Ramses and I will go on ahead and reconnoitre. By now, the men had become adept at efficient unloading, so it was not long before the tents were set up and our personal baggage placed in them. Excitement filled me with energy, and I wanted a cup of tea before I retired, so I joined Selim by the fire he had started. He had already begun brewing, or stewing, the tea... The Arab method of making tea is to boil the leaves until the liquid is dark brown. This is almost the last of the firewood, Sit, he said. 
It doesn't matter, Selim. Tomorrow we will be with friends who will supply us with everything we need. At least I hoped so. We had been proceeding on the assumption that though Tarek's messenger might be untrustworthy, Tarek's need of us was genuine. For our friend's sake, we dared not assume otherwise. Tarek knew we would come if we could, but he had no way of knowing when. Ah, said Selim. And we will be rid of him, is it not so? He nodded at Newbold, who was edging up to the fire. He had let himself go rather badly. None of us was fit for polite society, since bathing was impossible. But we had made the best use of the small amounts of water we allowed ourselves for washing, and Ramses had shaved every day, without having to be reminded more than three times. I had also reminded Emerson, who chose to take my remarks as suggestions which he felt free to disregard. His beard was now luxuriant, but at least he kept it cleaned and trimmed, which Newbold did not. Am I to be allowed a cup of tea? the hunter asked. Or am I still persona non grata? You have had the same comforts we have had, so don't whine, I replied, handing him a cup. I had planned to have a little chat with Nefret, but she had retired with Daria into their tent, and when I approached it, I saw the flap was closed. I understood how she must be feeling. All these long weeks she had worried about the little boy, Tarek's heir, and whether or not she would be in time to help him and his father. In a few hours she would find out, and the suspense was terrible. It was obvious that she preferred to be alone, so I did not force my company upon her. The moon was on the wane, and the air was icy cold. Shivering, I retreated to my tent. I knew I would not sleep a wink. I was rudely awakened by a loud shout. Removing Emerson's arm from my person, I snatched up my parasol, crawled over him to the flap of the tent, and emerged into the chilly pre-dawn light. The camp was ringed by motionless forms, black against the paling sky. They were taller than any human could possibly be. Their heads were oddly deformed, and each carried a long lance. Friends, said Selim to me, he had waked early, in order to start a fire, and his shout had aroused the sleepers. I could hardly blame him for crying out in alarm, though as the light strengthened I realized that the seemingly abnormal height of the newcomers was caused by the fact that they were mounted on camels and that their heads were covered by helmet-like caps crowned with feathers. The spears were very long, and the quivers slung over their shoulders bristled with arrows. Emerson was among the last to appear, rubbing his eyes and cursing, but the sight brought him awake in a hurry. "'Friends, yes,' he said. "'They do not look friendly,' said Selim dubiously. Emerson turned in a circle, examining the riders. None of them had moved. "'They are unquestionably from the Holy Mountain,' he said, stroking his beard. "'The headgear is unfamiliar. Tarek must have changed his guard's uniforms, but the shields are the same, and the bows.' "'If they are friends,' said Daoud, who had been thinking it over, "'why do they not greet you?' "'Hm. Well, I'm not sure,' Emerson admitted. "'Hold your fire, you damned fools,' he added. "'Ramses, will you?' A loud explosion interrupted him. Zerwali and the other Bedouin had crowded round, their weapons in their hands. It was Zerwali who had fired. Before the echoes of the shot died, he screamed and fell, clutching at his throat. An arrow had gone straight through it. "'They are the demons of whom we told you!' one of the Bedouin cried. "'Are you men or children?' Emerson demanded. "'Put down your weapons. They are human beings, like yourselves. "'And Zawali was a fool who deserved his fate. "'Is he dead, Nefret?' "'Yes. A single look had been enough. Nefret straightened. "'Let me talk to them.' "'Emerson frowned at her. "'Go inside the tent and dress yourself,' he said. "'Ramses, come with me.' "'He seldom used such a brusque tone with her.' When he did, she knew better than to disobey, but her face was mutinous. "'My dear, it is a man's world,' I said, with somewhat forced cheerfulness. "'The immobile forms were beginning to get on my nerves. 
Leave it to Emerson and Ramsay's. Ramsay's Meruitic is not as good as yours, but it should be adequate. With his customary, when he is fully awake, acuity, Emerson had identified the leader of the troop. The man had more feathers on his hat, and a medallion or pectoral depending from a cord round his neck. It shone like gold, as did the heavy armlet on his right arm. Like all the others, he was young and strongly built, with a thin, keen face and piercing dark eyes. Emerson and Ramses walked slowly toward him. The men had gathered round me, like nervous chicks around a mother hen. Emerson's orders, or more likely Zawali's fate, had had a distinctly sobering effect. So I was right, Newbold said, his eyes glittering with greed. Even a lowly soldier wears a fortune in gold. You don't know how lowly he is, I retorted. Do be quiet. Ramses and Emerson were only a few feet away when the captain suddenly called out, It is he! It is the father of curses! The great ones have returned! All the camels knelt with remarkable precision for a group of camels, and the riders raised their spears in salute. The captain dismounted and dropped to his knees before Emerson. I hadn't realized I was holding my breath until it left my lungs in an explosive sigh. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Emerson's meroitic vocabulary was limited, but as Ramses pointed out to him, he wasn't required to do anything but look lordly. It hadn't been necessary for Ramses to translate the captain's announcement. His action had spoken louder than words, and most of the words had been familiar to Emerson. Emerson drew himself up and accepted the homage with a gracious wave of his hand, remarking in English, Quite an impressive performance, eh? It was meant to honour us. Zawale didn't get that impression, Ramses said. Poor devil. Damned fool, Emerson corrected. He had little patience with stupidity or with insubordination. He might have brought a rain of arrows down on us. I think the leader is waiting for you to address him, father. You do the talking, my boy. Introduce yourself. Ask his name. Tell him how delighted we are to see him, and that sort of thing. Ramses couldn't help being somewhat flattered at the captain's reaction when he mentioned his name. The fellow had risen when Emerson indicated he might do so. He promptly knelt again. The great lady of the house and her parasol were acknowledged with equal respect, but when the captain, whose name was Har, saw Nefret, he bowed so low the feathers in his headdress dragged in the dust. "'Since I am not allowed to speak,' said Nefret, in cutting tones, "'ask him about the little boy.' At first... Har didn't seem to understand what Ramses meant. When Ramses elaborated, the child, the prince who had been ill, he repeated, The prince. Yes, he is well. Now will you come with us, you and your servants? The men were obviously not keen on the idea. In daylight, the true nature of their would-be escort was apparent, but the warlike aspect of the troop was hardly reassuring. However, there was really no alternative, as Ramses pointed out to one of the waverers, would you prefer to stay here? The camels are weary, and so are your men, and the water is running low. It was a rhetorical question. They wouldn't have been allowed to stay behind, even if they had been foolish enough to choose that alternative. Masud went off muttering to join the burial party. Emerson allowed them time for prayer and a few glasses of tea before urging them to load up. It is fresh water and fresh meat ahead, and shade where you may rest. They are preparing a feast for us. Ramses couldn't remember hearing Har mention a feast, but it went over well. Even the camels appeared to sense that they were nearing water. They moved faster than they had for days. Emerson promptly urged his riding camel to the head of the procession, slightly in front of Har, and Ramses grinned to himself. No one had to teach his father new tricks. He walked alongside the camel on which Nefret and Daria were riding, and tried to make conversation. Not far now, he said encouragingly. Nefret only nodded, but Daria turned and looked down at him, her eyes wide. Who are these people? They do not ride like tribesmen, but like soldiers the British have trained. I can assure you the British had no hand in their training, 
Ramsay said. They live far away and have no contact with the outside world. You'll be all right, Daria, I promise. She withdrew rather quickly. Ramsay saw that Newbold was close behind him. The hunter's gaze was fixed on the nearest soldier, one of the youngest of the troop, who sported a thin golden armlet. Ramses felt as if he could read Newbold's mind. There was the gold he sought, worn by a common soldier. He'll try something, Ramses thought. But what can he do? If he hadn't known the oasis was near, he would have taken the vision of palms and verdure for a mirage. The men saw it too. A low chorus of amazement and relief arose. So the father of curses spoke truth, exclaimed Masud his bloodshot eyes narrowing. The father of curses does not lie, said Daoud. The place was larger in extent than Ramses remembered, acres of lush grass with several small pools and trees of various species. They rode for a quarter of an hour into the green heart of the place before the escort halted in a clearing. In the shade of the date palms was a cluster of huts constructed like the Nubian tuholes of branches and mud brick. Ramses hurried to his father, who appeared to be having some difficulty understanding the officer's remarks. As soon as Ha saw Ramses, he made his camel kneel and dismounted, bowing and raising his hands. These have been made ready for the great ones, he said, indicating the huts. All that you need and wish will be brought to you. I wonder if Selim and Dawood rank as great ones, said Ramses, watching the troop lead the rest of the caravan away. And Daria... He addressed the officer in Meroitic. Where are they taking our people? To a place where they can camp. It is not fitting that they should be close to the great ones. Now will you go within? Rest well tonight, for tomorrow we will go on. Servants will come to you. Tell him we want Selim endowed with us, Emerson ordered. What about Newbold? Him too, said Emerson, ungrammatically but forcibly. I want to keep my eye on the bastard. There are enough huts to go round. You aren't going to let him take Daria? No, said Emerson, in a voice like a large boulder slamming onto stone. He helped his wife dismount and led her to the largest of the huts. She gave it a quick inspection. Excellent, she said happily. One of them must have ridden on ahead to warn of our arrival. There are even basins of water for bathing. Emerson proceeded to allocate houses, directing Newbold to one on the edge of the group. Lefret and Daria shared another, next to the elder Emersons, and Daoud and Selim a third. Half a dozen servants turned up while Ramses was selecting his abode. They wore kilts and a few strings of beads, and they were carrying a miscellaneous lot of luggage. Bent over from the waist in token of deep respect, one of them murmured something which Ramses translated. He says if we give them our clothes, they'll wash them. Splendid, said Emerson. That should make you a happy people, do Come in and freshen up a bit, eh? He lifted the curtain over the door invitingly. Everything appears to be quite satisfactory, his wife conceded. Except for one little detail, Ramses thought, watching his parents vanish into comparative privacy. All the servants were men. He hadn't set eyes on a single woman. This was a military encampment, after all. No doubt the garrison was changed at regular intervals, and the men were expected to get along without distracting female companionship while on this duty. How could they leave Daria here, alone with Newbold and several dozen soldiers? Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. After a refreshing, if limited, bath, I assumed the least grubby of my garments and settled onto a stool with my journal. I had fallen rather behind with it, and there was certainly a great deal to write about. We'd been served a light repast, dates, so sweet and fresh, they might have been an entirely different fruit than the hardened objects we'd eaten along the way, fresh-baked unleavened bread and wine. The servants assured us better and more ample food was being prepared— Emerson went to the door and raised the curtain. Would you care to take a little stroll, Peabody? Or do you want to rest for a while? As you can see, I am not in need of rest, my dear. But I suppose my journal can wait a bit longer. 
When we emerged, we found Ramsay as deep in conversation with Selim. There was no need to ask about Daoud. Reverberant snores issued from the hut he shared with Selim. The girls must be resting too, for the piece of matting over the door of their house was lowered. We decided not to disturb them, but Ramses and Selim were pleased to join us. We walked more or less at random, through a grove of date palms and past a stream of clear water that flowed into a large stone basin, enjoying the shade and the cool air. In the distance I heard the bleating of goats and the quacking of ducks. It is as large as Siwa and Karga, Selim exclaimed. How is it that this place is unknown? Not so large, replied Emerson, but sizable enough to support herds and raise crops. They have quite an effective irrigation system, he added, as we passed several small plots of vegetables. It is unknown because the people who control it take pains to make sure it remains unknown. The trees had thinned out and fingers of sand intruded onto the green grass. We'd better go back, I said. Nefret will wonder what has become of us. We followed another route on the way back, along a well-trodden path that led from the fields to what seemed to be the servants' village. It was a bustle of activity, meat turning on spits and pots boiling. Our unexpected appearance threw the cooks into complete disarray. One of them dropped a roasting fowl into the ashes, and the others exhibited such consternation that we went on without stopping. Nefret was pacing up and down in the little clearing when we reached it. "'Where have you been?' she demanded. "'That bastard Newbold has gone wandering off, too. "'I wanted to follow him, but I was afraid to leave Daria alone.' "'I doubt he can get into mischief here,' said Emerson, though he frowned a little. "'We only saw the domestic quarters,' I explained, with a smile. "'I fear dinner may be late. We disturbed the cooks. "'However, it wasn't long before a procession arrived, bearing food and drink, low tables, and mats on which to sit. Looking quite refreshed after his nap, Daoud tucked into the food with good appetite, and Dahlia was persuaded to venture out of the hut. I suggested we ask the captain to join us, but was voted down. One mustn't be polite to inferiors, said Emerson, with a grin. Leave it to him to sue for an audience. Newbold doesn't come back said Ramses. Where do you suppose he's gone? I don't give a curse where he's gone, said Emerson. I have his weapons, and if he thinks he can corrupt Har's lot, he will get a rude surprise. Some of us, I must include myself, ate more than we ought to have done. The roast fowl and fresh bread were so tasty after our sparse diet. The sun had sunk below the tops of the trees before we finished, and the servants began clearing away the remains of the food. Emerson leaned back with a sigh of repletion and began filling his pipe. "'Perhaps I ought to locate our men,' he said lazily. "'Make certain they're comfortable and have a little chat with Masud on the subject of Afrits.' "'It can wait,' I said, stifling a yawn. "'We won't be able to go on for a few more days. I won't mind resting a while. "'This is such a pleasant place.' Nefret opened her mouth and snapped it shut again. I knew what she had intended to say. She wanted to go on as quickly as possible. The captain's reassurance about the sick child hadn't entirely convinced her. Ramses glanced at her and then said, Far be it from me to spoil your plans, mother, but I'm not sure we'll be allowed to linger. Ha means to press on tomorrow. But the camels, I exclaimed, they will need to be watered and fed. Our camels, yes, said Ramses. Theirs are rested and ready. Do you suppose Har will allow any of our men to go on to the Holy Mountain? He's here to prevent that very thing. Emerson let out an exclamation. By God, you may be right. It's high time we had a talk with Har. Here, you. He caught one of the unfortunate servants by the arm. I feared for a moment that the fellow was going to faint, but he rallied long enough to listen to Emerson's order. Emerson had enough meroitic to say... Fetch har to me. He was particularly familiar with the imperative form of verbs. When har appeared, he wasn't alone. Two of his men were with him, struggling in their grip, teeth bared, was Newbold. We found him hiding behind one of the houses, listening to you speak, said har, without so much as a preliminary bow. If he is a friend, why was he not with you? He is no friend. 
Fred exclaimed indignantly. Ha glanced obliquely at her and averted his eyes. It occurred to me then that he'd never looked directly at her. The women of the Holy Mountain were not required to seclude themselves or go about veiled, except for certain priestesses. The handmaidens of the goddess Isis, who were swaddled from head to foot when they appeared in public. Ha's attitude toward Nefret must be a token of respect. Hold on a minute, Nefret, said Ramses. He proceeded to translate what Ha had said. He didn't have to translate Nefret's response. Emerson gave her a stern look. Contain yourself, Nefret. Ramses, tell them to release him. He is no friend, but he is our responsibility. If there is such a concept in Meruitic, he added, Newbold, what the devil were you doing? Newbold shook himself free. He hadn't bothered to freshen up, and he looked like a wild man with his unkempt beard and long, dirty hair. Sparing you my unwelcome company, he said with a sneer. I wanted to see what this place is like, since you intend to leave us here at the mercy of these savages. Daria, who was, as usual, close to Nefret, murmured something to her, and Nefret burst out again. Professor, you can't mean to... You can trust me, I believe, said Emerson, to do what is right without advice from you. Let me remind you, all of you, that we have a certain dignity to maintain. Squabbling and disagreement do not help. Nefret's eyes fell. I'm sorry, sir. Hmm, said Emerson. You bold, sit down over there and keep your mouth closed. Ramses, ask how to share his thoughts with us. It was as Ramses had surmised. We were to move on at once under military escort, for the king's heart ached to see us. We being our four selves only. That won't do, said Emerson, who had lit his pipe, a procedure that made the imperturbable captain stare in wonder. I suppose it makes a certain amount of sense to leave our fellows here. They will be comfortable, and we will be amply escorted. We intended to leave Newbold behind anyhow, but Selim and Dawood must come with us. And, of course, Dahlia. See here, Newbold exclaimed. You can't... I fail to see how you can prevent me, said Emerson with excessive politeness. Good God, man, there are no women here. At least I haven't seen any. Do you claim you could keep Daria safe from these savages, as you've been pleased to call them, even if she wanted to stay? May I speak, sir? Nefret inquired, with equally excessive sweetness. Daria's already told me. Let her speak for herself, said Emerson. Well, Daria? Please, don't leave me here. Her expressive dark eyes moved from Emerson to Ramsay's, and after a long moment to me. "'Please.' "'Certainly not,' I said. "'That settles that,' said Emerson. "'Ramses, you may inform Har of our decision.' "'Don't ask him,' he added. "'Tell him.' "'Using the imperative form of the verb,' Ramses inquired. "'As often as possible,' said Emerson, returning his smile. "'The people of the Holy Mountain are a courteous lot. "'Ha had listened to the discussion in silence, "'with no sign of impatience and without attempting to break into it, "'which would have been a waste of time "'since he hadn't the least idea what we were talking about. "'He listened with equally attentive silence to Ramsay's speech "'and then nodded. "'It shall be as the father of Curses says. "'With his permission, we leave tomorrow at dawn.' "'That was easier than I expected,' I remarked, "'after Ramsay's had translated.' We'd better get some rest if we're to leave so early. Not just yet, said Emerson. Ramses, tell him I must talk with our men first. I want his word, the word of an officer and uh, a devout follower of the gods, that no harm will come to them while we are away. I am fair game, I suppose, Newbold said with an ugly twist of his lips. Him too, said Emerson regretfully. He got the oath he had demanded. I recognized the word Amen Re and knew the officer had sworn by the chief god of the Holy Mountain the most binding of promises. By the time we had everything settled, darkness was complete and the moon had risen, a waning moon which gave little light. Selim, indignantly refusing the assistance of the servants, started a nice little bonfire and began stewing tea, a commodity which was not included in the cuisine of the oasis. Emerson returned from his visit to our men, escorted by soldiers carrying torches. He had refused Ramsay's offer to come with him. 
remarking that he was beginning to pick up some of the language and that he knew the words for protect, safe, and swear, along with the essential pronouns. I made him swear again, he announced, looking quite pleased with himself, and say he would protect them and that they would be safe. Emerson does have a way of making himself understood, even in a language he speaks poorly. How did the men take it? Ramses asked. Mustard wasn't well pleased, Emerson admitted. He accepted a cup of tea from Selim and sipped it appreciatively. I had to point out the obvious, that even though he and his men had rifles, it wouldn't do them a particle of good to overpower the garrison, even supposing they could. They don't know the way back. The others were less resistant. They had just gorged themselves on the first meat they've had for days, and some of them were washing their clothes. I assured them they would be paid for the days they spent here, and that seemed to satisfy them. You seem pretty cheerful yourself, I said. Self-satisfied would have been closer to the mark. Emerson, are you sure we're doing the right thing? What do you mean? Emerson asked in surprise. I lowered my voice and glanced over my shoulder at the hut to which Daria had retired, pleading weariness, taking her with us. I was the recipient of three outraged stares. No, only two. Ramsay's fixed gaze was less condemnatory than speculative. You don't mean it, Aunt Amelia, Lefret cried. Emerson shouted her down. For God's sake, Peabody, we cannot leave a defenceless young woman at the mercy of... I shouted him down. Don't bellow! Emerson subsided, simmering, and Ramses anticipated Nefret's protest. Mother meant nothing of the kind. We must take her with us. There's no question of doing otherwise. She was simply expressing doubts, doubts I share, as to Daria's real motives. A peremptory gesture from me reminded Nefret that Newbold was nearby. Her voice was not loud, but it was acid sharp. You've always been against her. I never thought I'd find you so puritanical. Ramses made no attempt to defend himself against that unjust charge. May I remind you, he said patiently, of what she said the night she came to my room. She said she had her own reasons for staying with Newbold. She rejected my offer of help. She's changed her mind, Nefret said. Women are prone to that weakness, you know. Perhaps it was your charm that influenced her to change it. That'll be quite enough, Nefret, I said. I cannot think of any way in which she could constitute a danger to us. But I'm in full agreement with Ramses that we must be on our guard. Trust no one, not even the innocent. That was what Abdallah... What Abdallah always said. I don't recall his ever saying that, remarked Emerson. He said it to me. I spoke the literal truth. I never prevaricate unless it is absolutely necessary. Chapter 7 Newbold did not come out of his hut to bid us farewell. No one expressed disappointment. Escorted by a few of the servants carrying our hand luggage, we were led to the place at the edge of the oasis where the caravan awaited. The camels had been loaded, and as the stars paled and the rim of the sun peeped over the horizon, I saw that the men of our escort had exchanged their uniforms for long hooded robes woven of camel hair. They were practical garments for desert travel, and in the dim light, the tall shrouded forms were eerie enough to strike terror into the heart of the superstitious. Then I observed a strange, balloon-like structure on the back of one of the camels. 
It rather resembled the basurab used by Bedouin women when they are on the march with their men. Curse it! I exclaimed. Are we expected to ride in that contraption? Ha indicated that we were. I gave in for the moment, since the captain was obviously impatient to be off, but I had no intention of occupying it for the entire time, and I knew Nefret would feel the same. It was comfortable enough, though extremely cramped for three. Rugs and cushions formed a soft surface on which to sit, and the curtains could be adjusted to admit air. When Emerson announced his intention of checking the loads to make sure nothing had been left behind, Daoud nudged Selim, and the latter said somewhat apologetically, "'It is the time for prayer, Emerson.' "'Curse it,' said Emerson. "'Get on with it, then. Ramses, come with me.' I apologized to Selim, who replied with a grin that there was no need. I calculated that approximately half of the original escort was now with us, the rest presumably having been left to guard the oasis. Emerson confirmed this when he returned and went on to say, Everything seems to be in order. Here, Peabody, let me hoist you up. I will not test the reader's patience by describing the last part of our journey in detail. In fact, there was nothing much to see once we had left the palms and greenery of the oasis behind, sand and stony ground, rock outcroppings, and an occasional vulture swinging through the empty sky. One event broke the monotony, a sandstorm which went on from mid-morning until shortly before sunset. There was no thought of stopping. A stationary object would soon be buried. The camels knew this. At times, when the force of the wind and sand was at its fiercest, they moved at a snail's pace, but they never stopped. As the interminable hours wore on, one came to think of the sand not as a natural force, but as millions of tiny malevolent beings attacking the bent heads of men and camels, driving through the drawn curtains of the basurab, and penetrating even the cloth we had wrapped round our heads and faces. When the wind finally died, as suddenly as if someone had pressed a switch, our camel came to a halt. Naturally, I immediately parted the curtains and put my head out. The first sight my anxious eyes beheld was the face of Emerson. He had assumed one of the hooded robes, which had protected him to some extent from the driving sand, but his face was red and raw. "'All right, are you, Peabody?' he inquired hoarsely. "'Yes, my dear. What about the others?' "'Still with us and still on their feet. Brace yourself. I believe your camel is about to kneel. Can't blame the poor brute.' Ha came plodding back along the line of camels. He inquired solicitously after the well-being of Nefret and me, and announced we would stop for a while. For once I was in full agreement with the camels, some of whom had already knelt. We gathered round the little campfire Selim had started. The sullen crimson of the sun was dulled by fine falling dust. "'Are we still on the right path?' I asked. "'I cannot imagine how we could see where we were going, "'and the storm has obliterated any landmarks.' "'There haven't been any signs of life for several days,' said Ramses. "'No bones, no tracks, not even a pile of camel dung. "'I wouldn't be surprised if these patrols are ordered to obliterate such signs. "'They probably have their own private landmarks.' "'As soon as the dust had settled, Emerson checked the compass but when he approached Ha with the information that we were off course, he was politely but firmly brushed aside. I know that, Father of Curses. We will return to the right path tomorrow. As usual, Ha and his men left us to ourselves, settling down in their blankets a little distance away. This vexed Daoud, who was a sociable soul and wanted to make friends. They are strange people, he announced. They are people like us, Daoud, Ramsay said. They speak a different language, and their customs are not like ours. But they are good men. They do not pray, said Daoud, who had punctiliously observed the times of Fatah when it was practicable. They pray to their own gods, Nefret explained. They are not gods, but false idols, declared Daoud. No doubt that is true, Daoud, said Emerson. But do not say so to these men. That would be discourteous, said Daoud. If... Allah wishes to show them the right path. He will do so in his own way. The world would be a better place if everyone thought as you do, Daoud, I said, patting his arm. Now, what about a language lesson? 
At my insistence, we had tried to do this every evening, and I had beguiled some of the long hours of riding by speaking Meruitic with Nefret. I should add that although I have used the word for convenience, strictly speaking, the language of the Holy City was neither Egyptian nor Meruitic, though it contained elements of both. It had once been Nefret's native tongue, but I confess I was surprised at how quickly she had regained her former fluency. Ramsay's gift for languages stood him in good stead. I realized he must have begun studying Meruitic even before we left England, and he became even more proficient as the days passed. His father did not. However, as I have said, Emerson generally gets his point across in one way or another. Next day, we passed through a region of heavy sand dunes. It was hard going for men and camels and very boring. Squatting uncomfortably in the basurab, I had fallen into a half doze when an outcry from Emerson awoke me. I put my head out. You must see this, Peabody, he exclaimed. Let me help you down. We were nearing the top of one of the higher dunes. The sun was setting. At first I saw nothing except more cursed sand. But as we plodded onward and upward, a fantastic vision seemed to rise up out of the ground ahead. Towers and battlements, black against the crimson sunset, like the ramparts of a medieval castle. There it is, said Emerson. The holy mountain. We stood staring in fascinated silence until we were joined by Ramses and Selim. The sight was magical and a trifle ominous. Daoud, slightly behind the others, gave voice to my feelings. Surely it is the castle of the king of the Afrits. We are going there? Yes, said Emerson. Ah, said Daoud. And down he went, onto his knees, to rub face and hands with sand in lieu of water. It was the proper time for prayer, but I suspected he would have done it anyhow. After a sidelong glance at Emerson, Selim joined him. We waited in silence while the patient camels plodded past, and when our friends had finished their prayers, Emerson said, We'd better catch them up now. Take my arm, Peabody. It's all downhill from here. Though the mountains had appeared so close, we were still a full day's journey away. And I began to suspect that Ha was in no hurry to get there. He camped at the foot of the last large dune and allowed everyone a full night's sleep. His men were in a more cheerful mood now that home was in sight. There was laughter and even some song round their fire that evening. Our own assemblage was not so merry, despite Daoud's efforts to cheer us up. With full confidence in Allah, and, if I may say so, in us, he had decided Afrits presented no threat and related several stories about how evil demons had been routed by devout and clever people. The threat was quiet and thoughtful, and Daria stayed close to her. Ramses avoided both of them. He appeared to be brooding about something, but when I asked, he denied that there was anything on his mind. We went on next day through the foothills of the massif that loomed ahead. Early in the afternoon, eyes weary of stony ground were cheered by the first sight of greenery, a few patches of grass and a single tree, of a species unknown to me. We were by then at the foot of the massif. It was an impressive sight, over 500 metres in height, fringed with fallen boulders about its base. Only the most intrepid climber would have tackled those cliffs. There was only one way through them, and it took us another two hours to reach it. A long, slow ride round the southwest corner of the mountain mass. The entrance was barely wide enough to admit one camel at a time, and as my beast passed through, the framework of the basurab scraped the rocky walls, which were of masonry, crudely but solidly built. That was the last time I saw for some time. The dusky darkness closed in as we went on, the path twisted and turned. High above, the slit of twilit sky darkened and stars shone out. Torches flared along the length of the caravan. The camels quickened their pace. They sensed they were close to the journey's end, to food and water and rest. Then I heard a grating rumble, like the voice of a great beast. I knew what it was, but I did not blame Daria for seizing my hand and crying out. What is this place? What is happening? Don't be afraid. Nefret's voice was remote, eerily distorted by echoes. This entrance is secret and well guarded. 
but we are with friends. The sound had been that of the great rocks that barred the inner entrance being rolled aside. We rode through into a place I remembered well, a cleft open to the sky which had been widened to serve as an animal corral and storage place. It was brightly lighted by torches and crowded with people. Daria kept tight hold of my hand, and Fred said impatiently, There's nothing to be afraid of. Come, Aunt Amelia, let's get out of this horrible contrivance. Goodness, but I'm stiff. Hang on a moment, my dear. I suspect the cursed camel is about to... It did. Stiff as Nefret, I rolled out into the arms of Emerson, who gave me a quick squeeze before he lowered me to my feet. Ramses was there to lift Nefret down. He left Daria to Emerson. Good to be back, eh, everybody, said Emerson, smiling broadly. Hmm, I said. In my opinion, Emerson, that statement is a trifle premature. Many things may have changed since we were last here, and not all for the better. One thing at least hasn't changed, Ramses said. He indicated several carrying chairs. The bearers stood beside them, short, heavily muscled men, dark of skin and bare of clothing except for a loincloth. Heads bowed, they waited passively for their orders, like beasts of burden, which was what they were. Ramses went on. The ricket are still enslaved. We were now handed over to the civilian branch, in the form of a portly individual wearing the elegant pleated garment and rich ornaments of a high official. After he had exchanged a few words with Ha, the latter gave us a generalized bow and went off. I had the distinct impression that he was relieved to get us off his hands. Though perfectly courteous, he had avoided my attempts to strike up a conversation, and he had been no more forthcoming with Ramses. Nefret he had not addressed at all, except for brief formal inquiries as to her well-being. The official approached us, bowing and smiling, and launched into what I took to be a speech of greeting. He spoke very rapidly, and my intellectual faculties were dulled by fatigue, so I asked Nefret to translate. He said, Welcome to the holy city, O great ones. The king and your loyal people await you. How nice, I said, nodding graciously at the gentleman. Tell him we... Ask him what he means by bringing those poor devils here, Emerson broke in, frowning at the litter bearers. I will not be carried on the shoulders of slaves. And furthermore... Father, if I may? Ramses did not wait for a response, but went on quickly. I suggest we postpone questions and complaints until we are with Tarek. I have a feeling the situation is more complicated than it appears. Hmm... Well, I won't ride in one of those damned litters. It is a matter of principle, Emerson added loftily. The official, whose name is irrelevant to this narrative, had to accept this since wrestling Emerson into one of the litters presented obvious difficulties, but I thought he would burst into tears when Nefret also declared her intention of walking. Forget your confounded principles for the time being, said Ramses, who appeared to be in a state of mounting exasperation. Let's just get to where we're going. Mother is tired and Daria is about to drop in her tracks. I was a trifle surprised that Tarek hadn't come himself to greet us, but Ramses had the right of it. So we proceeded, we three women and the official in the carrying chairs, and the men walking behind and beside us. The winding passages through which we passed were rock-cut and narrow. The ramparts of the Holy Mountain were honeycombed with such passages, leading under and into and through the cliffs, excavated over the millennia by thousands of hands. Impossible to tell whether we had traversed this particular part of the maze before. The walls all looked the same. I expected we would emerge into the open air, with the city spread out before us, framed and hidden from the outside world by the heights all round. Instead, the rock-cut passage changed into a wider corridor, which debouched into a series of antechambers, and at last into a large pillared room where the bearers stopped and lowered the litters to the floor. A single glance told me that this was not the same house in which we had dwelled on our first visit.
Even after ten years, I could recall every detail of that place. I'd spent many weary hours in its confines. This room was airy and cool and prettily furnished, with chests and tables and low bed frames piled high with embroidered cushions. Carved pillars supported the roof, and there were several curtained doorways along the walls. The litter-bearers took up their burdens and went out through the doorway by which we had come. The official was about to follow them when Emerson interposed his person. "'Take us to Tarek, he demanded, in his primitive Meroitic. Visibly intimidated by the large form towering over him, the official began flapping his hands and talking very fast. "'The king will send for us tomorrow,' Ramses translated. "'Tonight we are to rest and refresh ourselves after a long journey.' "'That makes sense, Emerson,' I said. "'We are travel-stained and weary, "'and Tarek has courteously allowed us time to rest before he greets us.' "'Emerson abandoned his aggressive stance and came at once to me. "'Are you tired, Peabody?' "'Tired, hungry, thirsty, and filthy, Emerson.' "'Oh.' "'Emerson rubbed his chin in mild perplexity. "'He hadn't shaved for days, and his beard was, at its worst... "'thick and bristly. "'I meant to see to that later, "'but at the moment all I could think of was water. "'Cool, clean water, quantities of it, "'running over my entire body. "'I had fond memories of the baths of the Holy Mountain, "'one of my few fond memories, I should add. "'Let us settle in and make ourselves comfortable,' I urged. "'Where are the servants, do you suppose?' "'Perhaps they're waiting to be summoned,' said Nefret. "'She clapped her hands.' I refuse to deal with those swaddled handmaidens of the goddess, Emerson grumbled. If one of them turns up, I will send her away. The women who sidled in were not swathed in veils, nor were they the little dark-skinned wreckage who had waited on us before. We had had attendants like these, too, women of what one might loosely term the middle class, wives and daughters of minor officials. Their ornaments were of copper, not gold— and their garments were of coarser linen than those worn by the nobility. An equal number of male attendants followed them, eyeing us warily. Nefret issued orders in Meroitic, and I saw that Ramses was watching her with that hooded look of his. She spoke with fluent authority. Her tone and manner had changed in a way I could not quite define. The servants scattered, and Nefret said to us, "'I have told them to bring our luggage and prepare food. "'Do you want to bathe before we eat, Aunt Amelia?' "'I believe we all should,' I replied. "'Go ahead, father,' said Ramses. "'I believe the men's servants are indicating that our quarters are through that door. "'I'll join you shortly.' "'Going to have a look round, are you?' Emerson inquired. "'Hmm. Don't do anything I wouldn't do, my boy.' "'Don't do anything he might do,' I corrected. "'Are we to go this way, Nefret? "'There are several suites of rooms here.' Nefret said, with the same unnerving assurance. Come with me, Daria. Our suite consisted of several small bedrooms and a bath chamber. Daria pleaded to enter the bath with Nefret. She had scarcely spoken a word since we arrived, and shrank away from the servants. Nefret, who did not suffer from false modesty, readily agreed. I, who did suffer from it, took my turn after they had finished. Pure physical pleasure drowned all thought as I allowed the women to minister to me with the skill I remembered. Washing and drying my hair, rubbing oil into my dry skin after weeks of perspiration and dust had been removed, wrapping me at last in towels of linen. When I joined Daria and Nefret, I found them examining the clothing that had been laid out for us, robes of sheer pleated linen held in place by colourful sashes. "'Dear me,' I said, "'this won't do. "'We will have to wear clean undergarments beneath them.' "'I haven't any clean undergarments,' Nefret said with a grin, "'and I doubt you do, Aunt Amelia.' "'The bags containing our clothing and other personal necessities "'had been brought to the bedchamber.' I didn't have to open them to know Nefret was unfortunately correct. Well, you cannot appear before persons of the male gender in that transparent garment. The men are joining us for dinner, I presume? Yes. Hmm. Let me think. It took a while to convince the servants that I meant what I said, but they finally brought us robes like their own. 
We put the pleated linen on over these, and after I'd inspected Nefret and Daria, I decided it would do. You've been very silent, Daria, I remarked. I'm in wonderment, was her low-voiced response. I had heard... I had heard tales of such places, but believed they were only stories. I patted her shoulder. You're adapting admirably to these new experiences. Continue to do so. Now, let's see what there is for supper. Oh, I do look forward to a proper meal. As I had expected, the men were already in the sitting room, if I may so term it. Emerson's beard was as ebullient as ever, but Ramsay's was clean-shaven, and Selim had trimmed his beard. A thrill passed through me at seeing my spouse once again attired in the costume that became his stalwart form so well. A knee-length kilt of white linen fastened at the waist by a jewelled belt. Ramses and Selim wore similar garments, but Daoud, modest man that he was, had wrapped himself in a large piece of linen, probably a bedsheet. Nefret clapped her hands again, and the servants began to carry in small tables and stools. Two to each table and dishes of food. Daoud sniffed appreciatively. But I cannot sit on one of those, he protested, indicating the little stools. Sit on the floor, then, I suggested. The tables are low enough. Do sit down, all of you. You needn't be so formal. There's nothing formal about this costume, Emerson grumbled. They wouldn't give me a shirt. The fixed regard of Daria, fixed to be precise, on the magnificent musculature of his bare chest, seemed to disconcert him. He turned red and subsided onto one of the stools. "'My dear, you look splendid,' I said, carefully not looking at his bare legs, which were of a considerably paler shade than the rest of him. "'So do you all?' "'Yes,' Daria murmured. She had transferred her interested stare to Ramsay's. In the becoming but barbaric costume, he bore an uncanny resemblance to the ancient Egyptians shown in statues and reliefs, broad of shoulder and slim of waist, his skin the same shade of reddish-brown. The moisture of the bath-chamber had caused his thick black hair to cluster into curls, and the result was strikingly like one of the short Nubian wigs worn by noblemen of the New Kingdom. At first we were too hungry to converse. Roast goose and fresh vegetables, bread still warm from the oven, were a welcome change after days of short rations. Even the thin, rather sour wine was refreshing. Dowd refused to touch it until I explained that the local water was probably not safe to drink. Does not the law admit exceptions in cases of necessity? I asked. Dowd allowed that perhaps it did, and after a time we all became very cheerful. Selim, who had spent most of his life working in the tombs and temples of ancient Egypt, was intelligently fascinated by everything around us. He kept jumping up to peer closely at a row of hieroglyphs or a painted bird, and bombarded Emerson with questions, which the latter was of course delighted to answer. While the others were laughing over one of Dawood's stories, which would probably not have been quite so funny without the wine, Ramses got up and began prowling round the room. I joined him. Is something troubling you? I asked. A good many things trouble me. He glanced at his father and lowered his voice. There's something wrong here. Can't you feel it? You intended to do a little exploring, I believe. Did you find anything to make you uneasy? He drew me behind one of the columns and leaned against it. I didn't have time to explore the whole place. It's even larger than the other palace we stayed in, with a confusing maze of rock-cut chambers at the back. I suspect there's a back entrance, as was the case in the other house. But it is well hidden, and when I started prodding at the walls, I was politely but decidedly urged to leave. He hesitated for a moment, and then said, The front entrance through which we came is now closed by a heavy door. It is locked or bolted on the other side. That could be for our protection. Against what? Oh, I agree, it means nothing in itself, but... I patted his arm. Perhaps such uneasiness is solely the result of fatigue. We have been welcomed as honoured guests. They didn't even blindfold us when we passed through the tunnels. Yes, his face softened. It wasn't quite a smile, but close to it. I didn't mean to cause you uneasiness, Mother. You must be very tired. Why don't you go to bed? 
All that food and wine has made me uncommonly drowsy, I confessed. We should all retire, I believe. I don't doubt that all our uncertainties will be resolved in the morning. Emerson gave me a reproachful look when I sent him off with the other men, but he was too shy about such things to announce his preference publicly, or to take me by the hand and lead me into my bedchamber with everyone looking on. As for me, I had no intention of going to bed with that beard. The two girls took one of the sleeping chambers, and I another. The room was cool and dim, lit by a single lamp. The bed had springs of woven leather with pads of folded linen atop. After the surfaces on which I had reclined of late, it felt as soft as a feather bed. Weary as I was, I had no trouble in falling asleep. But my slumber was not sound. Fragments of dreams slipped in and out of my sleeping mind. Once I thought I saw Abdullah's face, but he did not linger or speak. Another image was that of Nefret, clad as I had first beheld her in the white robes of the high priestess of Isis, with her loosened hair falling over her shoulders. There were birds, too, the jewel-bright birds of the fabled city of Zerzura, fluttering and swooping and uttering high-pitched cries, more like human voices than birdsong. I woke quite refreshed, however, to find rays of sunlight piercing the shadows through the high, clear story windows. The first creak of the leather springs brought one of the serving women, who helped me into a loose robe and bowed me into the next room, where breakfast was being brought in. It was not long before Emerson joined me, similarly attired and rubbing his eyes. What I wouldn't give for a cup of coffee, he mumbled. I dreamed I could smell it. So did I, I said, and so strong was the power of imagination, I fancied I still could. I have some tea and sugar left, though, and as soon as I've sorted out our baggage, I will instruct the servants how to brew it. Where are the others? Coming. One of the servants offered him a bowl of fruit, and another presented a platter of little cakes, sticky with honey. Oh said Emerson. I swear to you, Peabody, I can still smell. He broke off, his eyes widening, as, with great empressement, another servant poured a dark, fragrant liquid into our handleless earthenware cups. Emerson snatched his up and drank. Good God, I exclaimed after sampling mine. It is coffee. Where do you suppose they got it? I don't give a curse where they got it, said Emerson, motioning the servant to refill his cup. Ramses came in, followed by Selim and Daoud. Good morning, mother. Good morning, father. My olfactory sense must be out of order. I thought I smelled... You did, Emerson exclaimed, beaming. A delicate attention on the part of Tarek, I expect. He must have gone to considerable trouble to obtain it for us. Ramsay's expressive black brows tilted, but he accepted the cup the servant handed him without comment. It is good, said Daoud, unsurprised, but not strong enough, or sweet enough. They use honey as a sweetener here, I explained. However, I have some sugar left. I'll get it and waken the fret and Daria. They must have been very tired to sleep through this racket said Emerson, whose voice had been the loudest. He went on sipping his coffee with a look of utter bliss. Ramses put his cup down. Mother, did you look in on them this morning? Why, no, I thought it best not to disturb. He moved so quickly, I had to trot in order to catch him up. He parted the curtains with a single sweep of his arms. Nefret and Daria had vanished, along with the bags and bundles that contained their personal belongings. The tumbled coverings on the two beds were the only sign that anyone had been there. One of them must have called out in the night, I exclaimed. I took it for the cry of a bird. We had searched the entire house, including the dark, rock-cut storage chambers at the back, looking for some indication of how the girls had been carried off. Their disappearance couldn't have been voluntary. Fred would never play such a trick, leaving us to wonder and worry. There was no doubt in my mind that the wine had contained a sleeping potion of some sort. If there was a back door, we did not find it. The servants were nowhere to be seen, 
Emerson's fury and frustration rose to such a pitch that he kept flinging himself against the wooden door in the sitting room. He succeeded only in bruising his shoulder. He was finally distracted by Selim, who dragged out two of the men servants whom he had found trying to hide under the low bed in his room. Daoud took one of them by the shoulder and began shaking him, while Emerson shouted at them both in a mixture of English and Arabic. "'There's no use going on with this, father,' said Ramses, who had managed to interpose a few questions in Meroitic. "'They dare not admit knowledge, even if they possess it. Sell him, sheath your knife. Daoud, stop shaking that poor fellow. You will snap his neck.' "'Yes, we must keep our wits about us,' I cried. "'Quite right, mother.' Outwardly, he was the coolest of us all. Only a keen observer like myself would have noticed the unnatural calm of his voice. May I suggest you leave off brandishing that jug before you hit yourself on the head? I don't believe the girls are in imminent danger, and until we learn what and who are behind their abduction, we cannot take the proper action. The only person who can help us is Tarek himself. With a wordless snarl, Emerson rushed back to the door and began beating on it with his fists. The result was instantaneous and so unexpected that Emerson stumbled forward through the opening, straight into the individual who had flung the portal wide. He and Emerson both fell to the floor. Beyond them, I saw three other men attired like the first in military uniform, brown linen kilts and wide belts to which were attached long daggers or short swords. They carried spears, and on the left arm of each was a long oval shield covered with animal hide. Ramses pounced on his father and, by main strength, managed to drag him off his victim, whom he had by the throat. Father, stop it, he gasped. Mother, can you make him... He let out a whoop and doubled up as Emerson's elbow drove into his ribs. My intervention was not necessary. His son's cry of pain had struck through the red mists of anger into the strong core of paternal affection. "'Good God!' Emerson exclaimed. "'My dear boy, accept my profound apologies. "'I didn't realise it was you. "'Not hurt, I hope.' "'Ramses shook his head dumbly. "'Taking advantage of his temporary inability to speak, "'I remarked, "'Pull yourself together, Emerson. "'I believe we are about to receive a delegation. "'At least we were, until you knocked one of them down. "'I am sure I do not know how they are going to respond to... It was his own fault, Emerson said sullenly, coming at me like that. Ramses had got his breath back. If you remember, Father, this procedure is the one followed before when we were visited by an emissary. Distinguished persons were always preceded by an armed escort. We were told the king would see us this morning. I expect this gentleman has come to take us to him. He slipped past his father and addressed several sentences to the person whose white-clad form I could see behind the guards, several yards behind them. The man was an official or a priest. To judge by his pleated garment and beaded collar, he replied in a high-pitched voice but kept his distance. "'Gentlemen be damned,' said Emerson. "'I want to know what they've done with Nefret. "'Then, sir, may I respectfully suggest the sooner we're ready to go, "'the sooner we will be able to ask that question.' "'Shall we take the guns?' I asked. "'You aren't taking anything of the sort,' Emerson snarled. "'It would be advisable to leave them here, I think,' Ramsay said. "'We don't want to give Tarek a false impression of bellicosity.' "'I am feeling quite bellicose at the moment,' said Emerson. "'But I suppose you're right. "'Tell the fellow we will be with him shortly. "'Peabody, why aren't you getting dressed?' The servants had taken our clothes away and returned them laundered and neatly folded. After I had assumed proper attire, I considered whether I should take my parasol. I did not consider for long. It was a weapon, but it didn't look like one. I then hastened back to the sitting room, where I found Ramses in conversation with our visitor. He was a man who had obviously lived well. His cheeks were pink and plump, and a roll of fat circled his neck above the broad collar of gold and gemstones. As he bowed and raised both hands in salute, the pleated sleeves of his robe fell back to display broad armlets of gleaming gold. Mother, may I present Count Amenizlo, overseer of the royal storehouses and second prophet of Amen Ray? How nice, I said, acknowledging his bow. 
The round pink face was vaguely familiar. Haven't we met before? Uh, yes, yes, said the Count, bowing again. I speak some of the English to you. In welcome. He was one of Forth's students and Tarek's brother, Ramsay said. Uh, only a youth when we last met. Enough of these empty courtesies, exclaimed Emerson, to the obvious bewilderment of Count Emenizlo. He understood the next sentence, however. Take us to Tarek. Yes, yes, we go to the king. The four soldiers stood at attention, two on either side of the door. I was relieved to see that Emerson's victim appeared unhurt, if somewhat dishevelled. With ironic courtesy, Emerson gestured to the Count to precede him. What about Selim and Daoud? I asked. Are they included in the invitation? No, Ramsay said. Apparently they're considered to be servants. We'll have to set Tarek straight on that. But not this time. The escort fell in behind us as we passed along a corridor whose walls were prettily painted with geometric patterns in bright colours of orange-red and blue, green and yellow. I expected it would lead eventually to a terrace looking out over the valley. Instead, after several abrupt turns, we found ourselves in a similar passageway lighted by hanging lamps. Here were scenes of feasting and entertainment, slender girl dancers and acrobats, musicians, tables piled high with food, scenes familiar in their subject matter from many such in Egyptian palaces and Kushite tombs. Emerson, who would normally have lingered examining each detail, gave them not a glance, but walked so close on Amenizlo's heels that the Count was forced to break into an undignified trot. As I began to suspect, a suspicion which was later confirmed, we had been housed in apartments usually inhabited by princesses or queens, connected directly to the king's apartments, so he could visit the ladies without the inconvenience of going out of doors. We met only a few people, servants by their dress, who flattened themselves against the wall and averted their gaze as we passed. A square of sunlight ahead, where the corridor ended in a room open to the outer air, indicated that we had almost reached our goal. Amenizlo stopped. No need to announce us, said Emerson. Here, Peabody, take my arm. Let us make a dignified entrance. Another group of soldiers, wearing uniforms like our four, fell back as we entered the throne room. Not the imposing state throne room which we had seen before, but a smaller, brighter, less formal chamber. Painted papyriform columns supported the clear-story roof, and sunlight streamed in through the narrow openings above. At the far end, opposite the door through which we had come, was a raised dais, with several heavy curtains behind it. On the dais stood the throne, a chair with feet carved like lion's paws and arms supported by carved scarabs and sun discs. It was entirely covered with gold leaf. Arranged in a semicircle before the dais were three smaller chairs of plain wood. The man who occupied the throne wore over his heavy black wig a diadem with the twin Uraeus serpents of Cushite kingship. To one side... And slightly behind the throne stood a younger man. I recognized him at once, though he was now richly dressed in the garments and ornaments of a prince. The man was medicine. The other man, the king, was not Tarek. Though I was momentarily struck dumb by this discovery, I realized I ought to have been prepared for it. Tarek would have been the first to greet us had he been able. He must have lost his throne through death or usurpation, and Merison had deliberately deceived us. Even if Tarek had passed on after Merison's departure from the Holy City, there could be no innocent explanation for the theft of the map and the death of poor Ali. As the truth dawned on my companions... I feared for a moment I would have to restrain two infuriated male persons instead of only Emerson. Ramses had never concealed his dislike of medicine, but the emotion that darkened his features was a good deal stronger than dislike. I caught hold of his arm in a grip he could not break without hurting me and said urgently, Ramses, no, contain yourself. He's taken a fret, Ramses said. That is why he brought us here. He wanted... That may be so, but attacking a royal prince when the odds are heavily against you is not a sensible procedure. 
Quite right, said Emerson, in a voice like stone grating on stone. I'm surprised at you, Ramses. Let us hear what they have to say. Uh, will you do the talking, my boy, and translate for us? I don't want to miss a word. Ramses settled back on his heels, breathing hard. I was relieved to see that Emerson had risen to the occasion. He prefers not to control his temper, since shouting and shaking people relieve his mind. But when calm and cunning are required, he displays them, usually. Medicine stepped forward. Not a shadow of guilt clouded his smooth young brow, and his smile was as guileless as ever. I will talk for the king, my father, in your language, so that you will all understand. He welcomes you, and bids you sit yourselves. He is the Horus Manghabale, son of Rezakare, lord of the two lands. Yes, yes, never mind the rest of it, said Emerson with a dismissive gesture. The king nodded benignly. He was a fine-looking man, with a broad brow and the lean, hard body of a soldier. I would have put him in his late thirties. What has happened to Tarek? I demanded. Did he die, then, of the strange sickness, and the child, too? Merrison laughed, and Ramses, who was watching him like a cat with a bird, said, The strange illness was a lie, wasn't it, Merrison? A lie designed to bring us here. Is Tarek dead of another cause, such as assassination? Merrison translated this speech and the ones that followed, and very odd it was to hear the older man's deep baritone followed by the boy's higher voice, like a piping echo. He is not dead, was the royal reply, accompanied by a contemptuous sneer. He ran away, like the coward he is, with those few who are loyal to him. One day, when I have nothing better to do, I will crush them like beetles. None of us had accepted the king's invitation to sit ourselves. Emerson stood with arms folded, looking down on the king. It was a deliberate act of rudeness, for persons of lower rank are required to kneel or sit so that their heads are not higher than those of their superiors. The king appeared more amused than offended. If I had not known him to be a usurper, and his son a cheat and a liar... I would have thought him quite a pleasant fellow. Be damned to that, said Emerson. I want to know what you have done with Nefret. It must have been you, or those acting by your orders, who took her and her friend away, coming like thieves in the night, violating the honour of your house and the hospitality owed to strangers. It was quite an eloquent speech, in my opinion, and Medicine must have translated it accurately, for the king's jaw tightened, Without waiting for a reply, Merison said smugly, The priestess is safe again in her house with her handmaidens. The shrine of the goddess is no longer empty. And the other girl? Ramses demanded. The servant of the priestess is with her. The goddess has accepted her. I said, Do I understand you correctly, Merison? Nefret has been brought here to resume her former role of high priestess of Isis? She has always been high priestess, lady, Merison said, for she never chose a successor. When she was taken from us, the goddess abandoned her shrine, and the prayers of the faithful were not answered. Now the goddess, too, will return. My goodness, I said, finding myself at something of a loss for words, and distracted by seeing a slight movement of one of the curtains behind the dais. They must cover doorways or niches, there had been a similar arrangement in the great throne room, and one of the curtained niches had been occupied by the highest of the high priestesses, the god's wife of Amun, whose power was even greater than that of the king. As we discovered later, to our horror and dismay, she was Nefret's mother, who had lost her mind and forgotten her true identity. My attempt to save her had been in vain. She had perished of pure rage and an excess of spleen, was her successor lurking therein? I decided there was no harm in asking. Is the Henishem present? I inquired, interrupting a loud speech from Emerson, who was demanding to see Nefret. He stopped shouting and stared at me. Good God, Peabody, the woman is dead. She must have been succeeded in the position by another woman. Someone is there, I said, 
Behind the curtain I saw it move. Merison stared too. Why do you ask about the Henishem? She is not there. She is in her own place. She has no power here. It is my father who... I insist upon seeing the fret, Emerson shouted. How do I know she is unharmed? You will see her soon. After she has resumed her duties, who would harm her? She is the most honored of women, beloved of the goddess. Ramses put a heavy hand on his father's shoulder. In the neck of time, since Emerson's intense concern about his daughter had been exacerbated by the references to religion, of which he does not approve. He subsided. I could hear his teeth grinding, however. And Ramses said quickly and softly, Mother is right as always. Violence would only end in our being injured and confined. We must retire and discuss this. But we have not yet ascertained all the facts, I protested. I have a good many more questions to ask His Majesty. I feel certain you do, Peabody, said Emerson, forcing himself to calmness. But if I have to listen to any more rubbish about goddesses from that treacherous little puppy, I may do something rash. Merison's lower lip protruded like that of a sulky child. We had used a number of words he did not know, and his amour propre was damaged. The king had shown signs of increasing impatience as the conversation went on and Merison did not translate. Now he rose to his feet. Come, he said in Merowitic, with an expansive gesture that would have made his meaning clear, even if it hadn't been one of the words we all knew. We followed as he strode toward an open archway. Beyond was an anteroom, pillared and handsomely decorated, and beyond that, a series of arches that opened onto a terrace with statues of divinities. The sun was well up, and the long valley of the holy mountain stretched out to right and left below the high balcony on which we stood. Fields and small villages on the floor of the valley, fine mansions and temples on the slopes. A broad staircase lined with sphinxes led down to the roadway that followed the curve of the cliffs, leading from the quarter of the nobles past the palace to the great temple of Amun Re, or as he was called here, Amun Re. Gold tipped obelisks glittered in the sunlight, and the painted reliefs on the pylon gateway shone with brilliant colour. On the left, the mighty figure of a king or god grasped a kneeling enemy by the hair, while the other arm raised a long spear. Behind the king stood a smaller female figure, who also brandished a weapon. I was familiar with such scenes, which were common in Egyptian temples, but here the colours were fresh and bright, the black hair of the king, the brownish red of his body, and the woman's paler yellow skin. Her hair was also black. I squinted, trying to make out details, for there was something unusual about the figures, especially that of the woman. She was slimmer than a conventional Cushite queen, those ladies being notorious for their extreme corpulence. And what weapon was it she held? That pylon is new, Emerson muttered. At least the reliefs are. I wonder who the female figure represents. A goddess? Not Isis. She hasn't the right sort of headdress, or ma'at, or... Ramses let out a strangled sound. It's mother, he gasped. You and mother. Don't you see the parasol? The following is an excerpt from Letter Collection C. Dear Leah, chances are you'll never see this letter, but I don't like journals. They seem so impersonal, and I don't know what has happened to the others, and I must keep track of what's going on, and I'm all alone except for Daria. Have I told you about her? No, of course I haven't. I keep forgetting things. She's a strange girl, very young, very pretty, the companion of a horrible man named Newbold, a hunter and treasure seeker. She pleaded for my protection, so we brought her on with us to the Holy Mountain. The trip itself went well enough, as such things go, and we were welcomed as honoured guests. I went to bed that night tired but comfortable, and happy at the prospect of seeing Tarek next day. I awoke next morning. How can I explain it? I went to bed as Nefret Fourth. I awoke next morning as High Priestess of Isis. The rooms were the ones I had occupied ten years ago. 
Every ornament, every piece of furniture was the same, including the low bed with its linen sheets and draperies where I lay. The women who surrounded the bed were robed in white, their face veils thrown back, the handmaidens of the goddess. Leah, it was the most awful feeling. For a moment I thought I'd never left the holy mountain, that the intervening years had only been a dream. You, the professor, Aunt Amelia, Ramses, all the others, only a dream. I started crying. I'm so ashamed. But you can't imagine the dreadful sense of loss, the loss of everyone I loved. One of the maidens bent over me, opened my loose robe, and placed her hand over my heart. The handmaidens are physicians here, and they know about the voice of the heart. She smiled and nodded, and another girl approached with a cup containing a liquid of some kind. Like the switch of a torch bringing light, I was suddenly in control of myself again. Can you guess what did it? It was the sight of my own body, Leah, a woman's body, not that of a thirteen-year-old whose breasts have just begun to grow. I sat up and pushed the cup away. No, how did I come here? Where are my friends? The handmaidens clustered round. I didn't recognize any of their faces. Another sign, if I had needed one, that time had passed. All the ones I had known, Mentarit, Amenit, had grown to maturity and left the service of the goddess. The girl who held the cup, she had a round-cheeked face with full pouting lips, thrust it at me again. I pushed it so hard some of the liquid spilled onto her pristine robes. I enjoyed doing it. First things first, as Aunt Amelia would say. I was terribly thirsty, but I was afraid there might be some drug in the liquid. Wine, from its appearance. You drink first, I ordered, pointing at the cupbearer. She scowled as she obeyed, but my imperious manner impressed the others. One of them, a sweet-faced girl of about thirteen, ventured, Does the priestess wish her servant to be brought to her? They meant Daria. My heart lifted at the sight of her. Someone from my own world. Another verification of reality. She was clad in the night robe she had worn when she went to bed, and her hair hung down over her shoulders. I jumped up, pushed through my hovering attendants, and went to her. Are you all right? She was a little pale, but quite composed. They have treated me well. Do you remember what happened? Men took us away in the night. You were sleeping soundly. I woke and tried to call out, but one of them covered my mouth and carried me away. What will they do with us? I was beginning to get a pretty good idea of what they meant to do with me. After we'd been served food and drink, I submitted without protest to the all-too-familiar rituals, being bathed in several waters, anointed with oil of lotus, dressed in sheer linen and the ornaments of the high priestess, the broad beaded collar, the brightly embroidered sash, armlets and anklets, and the curious little cap of golden feathers. The process took the entire morning. The only answer I got to my incessant questions about the others was a repeated promise. The high priest will come soon. He damned well better, I said to Daria. One of the handmaidens, the scowly one, had tried to send her away, remarking that I didn't need low-born servants, but I insisted on keeping her with me, and in that matter, at least, my word was law. They treat you with great reverence, she said, watching one of the girls clasp a bracelet round my wrist. I seem to have been conscripted for my old position, I said, trying to smile. I am desperately worried about the others, though. If it was only me they wanted. But you have power. They obey you. You can speak for your family. I hope so. The heavy ornaments settled into place. I remembered only too well the helpless feeling the sheer weight of them brought. The collar pressing down onto my shoulders, the bracelets weighing my arms. The last step was familiar too. Long translucent veils of white draped around me and over my head and face. Stiff-limbed as a doll, I was led into an adjoining room and guided to a throne-like chair. No one tried to stop Daria when she followed and took up a position behind the chair. I felt a thrill of gratitude for her presence and her astonishing composure. I certainly wouldn't have blamed her for losing her head. I could see through the face veil, though not distinctly. The man who entered the room was only a blur at first. When he came nearer, I made out the form of a man bowed with age, leaning on a staff. 
I hauled myself to my feet, to the consternation of the handmaidens, lined up in two rows before my chair. Mortek, can it be you? I had spoken English. The answer was in Meroitic. The high priest Mortek, the worthy, went to the gods long ago, lady. I am Amase, high priest of Isis, first prophet of Osiris. I ought to have anticipated that. Mortek had been an old man when I knew him. I felt lonelier than ever. Then I order you to tell me why I was taken away from my friends. Where are they? What's happened to them? The great ones. They dwell in the house where you were before your servants brought you to your own place. They are content. They are honored. They rejoice. I let out a squeak of hysterical laughter. I could picture the rejoicing once they realized I was gone. The professor shaking his fists and cursing, Aunt Amelia brandishing a parasol, and Ramses. He wouldn't show emotion, not Ramses. He'd be thinking and planning. Have they been told where I am? They are with the king now, lady. I want to be with them. I want to see the king. Take me to him at once. I hadn't expected those orders would be obeyed, nor were they. The old gentleman made a long speech full of circumlocutions and ambiguities, but I got the idea. The goddess must be brought back to her empty shrine by me and no other. He would help me prepare for the ceremony. It must be faultless. There could be no mistake in movement or word. He didn't say what would happen if I did make a mistake. Divine retribution by Isis in one of her less pleasant attributes? I sat in silence my mind racing, while he backed away, bowing. I was perfectly willing to go through the performance, supposing I could remember it. But why hadn't Tarek simply asked me to do it? Why hadn't he come to me, his little sister, his friend? Wait, I said sharply. The old gentleman jerked to a stop, and I went on. The Horus Tarakenidal is my brother. I will bring the goddess back to her shrine after I've seen him and spoken with him. Amase threw up his hands. Do not say that name again. It is forbidden. It does not exist. The Horus is Manchabale Zekare. What has happened to Tarek? The old man put his hands over his ears in order to avoid hearing the forbidden name, or because I was screaming at the top of my lungs. He limped out. I took the nearest handmaiden by the shoulders and shook her till the veils flapped. What has happened to him? Is he dead? Answer me. Not dead, no, she panted. Gone. Where? Far from here. Lady, please, you hurt my neck. I let her go and sank back into the chair. It is bad news he has given me, Daria, I said. Many things are now clear. She edged forward. I don't understand, Nefret. Did you speak to me? I had spoken Meroitic. I caught hold of her hand. Please, stay with me, Daria. Talk to me, in English. Remind me of who I am. Thus ends this excerpt from Letter Collection C. It was something of an anticlimax to observe on the right-hand side of the pylon. A smaller male figure, presenting an ankh, the symbol of life, to the nose of a seated king. The smaller person had the braided side-lock that indicated youth, and its nose was considerably larger than that of the king. Zakari appeared quite pleased at the effect of his little surprise. When he indicated that the audience was over, we went unresisting. Emerson kept muttering, Good God, good God. After we'd gone a little way down the entrance corridor, I said thoughtfully, I wonder that the new king would leave that relief. Surely it must be the one Tarek promised he would commission in order to honor us, and therefore the royal image must be his. Ramses had been somewhat disconcerted by his own image. The nose was really a bit much, but he had the answer to my question. He usually does. The cartouche has been changed, mother. That was standard procedure in Egypt, if you'll recall. Whenever a monarch used up the representation of a predecessor... The name in itself conferred identity. It wasn't even necessary to remodel the features. Hmm, yes, said Emerson. I'm beginning to get an idea. 
Let's not discuss it now, father, Ramses cut in. He gestured at Amenislo, who was trotting along ahead of us. Emerson glared. Quite right, right, boy. We don't want to be overheard. He has obviously turned his coat against his own brother. All the members of the upper classes are closely related, I said. I expect the new king is a first or second or third cousin of Tarek's. He must have had some connection with the royal family in order to claim a right to the throne. None of us spoke again until we had reached our own quarters. Ramses, fetch Daud and Selim, Emerson said. You, he pointed at Amenislo, who was bowing and smiling. Get out, go, leave us. Well, I exclaimed, we are in a pretty fix. Get rid of them too, grunted Emerson, indicating the servants. They don't understand English, I replied. Unlike Amenislo, I will tell them to serve luncheon. I expect Daud is hungry, and I'm a bit peckish myself. How can you think of food at a time like this? Emerson demanded. It is necessary to keep up one's strength, I replied. At least we know the girls are in no danger. Daud settled down to eat with his usual placidity, but Selim was in a considerable state of agitation. Ramses says they have taken Nurmisur to be a priestess of their false god, he exclaimed. What are we to do? The Sitakim will make a plan, Daud said. Uh, yes, of course, I said with a little cough. But we must think very carefully about how to proceed. These people take their religion quite seriously, and... Don't be a credulous fool, Peabody, growled Emerson, who never takes religion seriously. In this society, as in all the others with which I am familiar, religion among the ruling classes is only a cloak for politics. If the new king were powerful enough, he could install his own high priestess and be damned to tradition. As he has apparently done with the position of God's wife, who is known here as the Henishem, Ramses said. You recall how it was done in Egypt, when a new king took the throne? He had his daughter adopted by the reigning God's wife as her successor. Nefret's mother was an aberration, and unlike Nefret, she died in office. She may have already had an adopted daughter who took her place, but has not her power. And if the usurper forced his daughter on the new Henishem... Yes, yes, Emerson said, impatiently. More very interesting, my boy, but off the point. Selim let out an exclamation. Nor Misur's mother? Do you mean she was the god's wife here? I thought she died when Nor Misur was born. That is what Nefret believes, I said. And you must never... Ever tell her differently, Selim. Her mother went mad, denied her husband and her child, and forgot her true identity. She is dead, and there is no need for Nefret to know the truth, which would make her very unhappy. Yes, Selim murmured, stroking his beard, for a mother to deny her child. God had taken her mind away, said Daud. She was not to blame. Would it make Nurmisur unhappy to know that? Yes, I said, with an affectionate smile. Very unhappy. Then I will be silent, said Daud, forever. Yes, Selim agreed, forever. Now that we've settled that, said Emerson, can we return to the point... Sikare may be powerful enough to control the position of God's wife, but he obviously needs us and the fret to prop up his throne. I cannot imagine that our influence is that great, or his position so weak, I protested. Emerson had been hoarding his store of tobacco. Now he took out his pipe and pouch. He claims the nasty weed aids in ratiocination. I sincerely hoped so, for never had we been in dire need of clear thinking. Such must be the case, said Emerson, or we wouldn't be here. Never mind pointing out that I have just committed some horrible flaw in logic, Peabody. Only consider the probabilities. 
We are obviously persons of some importance, or that pylon would not still display our images. Tarek was a popular ruler, especially among the lower classes, but a military coup could have overthrown him, especially if it was supported by the more reactionary of the nobles and by the priesthood. Those sanctimonious bastards are always poking their noses into affairs of state. This was grossly unfair and an example of Emerson's prejudice against religious persons, but I let it pass, for in this case his accusation might have a basis in fact. The priesthood of Aminre, chief god of the Holy Mountain, had supported Tarek's brother for the kingship, and the high priest had been one of his bitterest enemies. Daud swallowed a mouthful of bread and looked at me. Have you made a plan yet, Sit? By God, Daud is right, Ramses burst out. We should be planning what we mean to do, not engaging in idle speculation on the basis of insufficient information. What do you propose? I inquired, resisting the temptation to point out that he was as prone to that error as I. The most important thing is to find a way of communicating with Tarek. There must be people who are still loyal to him, an opposition party. No doubt it has gone underground. But we've got to find some of its members and offer our support in return for theirs. We have firearms, but not enough of them. We can't get the girls away without outside help. That makes sense, said Emerson, puffing away. It may be significant that our servants this time do not include any of the common people, the wreck it. The majority of them probably support Tarek, but they are powerless and it won't be easy to reach them. You remember how much trouble we had last time getting permission to visit their village. That's the next step, Ramses said. Well, the first, really. We must be free to move about. That means convincing the new regime that we are on their side. Father, can you bring yourself to be ingratiating to the king and medicine? More easily than you, I fancy, said Emerson, giving him a sharp look. That shouldn't be too difficult, I mused. People who love power are extremely susceptible to flattery. I will leave the flattery to you, said Emerson. What I'll propose is a practical quid pro quo. Our loyalty, publicly demonstrated if necessary, in exchange for permission to record the reliefs in the temples and explore the tombs. No man who knows the father of curses will believe he would be disloyal to a friend or let his daughter be taken from him, said Selim, who had followed the discussion with furrowed brow. He doesn't know me, said Emerson, trying to look sly. He knows you well enough, by reputation at least, to know you would never consent to remain here indefinitely, I retorted. You must ask when we will be allowed to leave. He will lie, of course. He can't afford to let us go, with or without Nefret. A united outcry from the others arose. Of course we won't leave without her, I said impatiently. But since we cannot enforce our will, we must, for the moment... Pretend to believe any lies the usurper chooses to tell, especially about Nefret. The high priestess does not serve for life once she has chosen a successor. Do you know what happens to the high priestess after she gives up her position? Ramses asked quietly. I can guess. That isn't the point, Ramses. I will ask the king if we may take her with us after she has appointed another in her place. And he will say, yes, we may. And he will be lying. And we will pretend, do you hear me? We will pretend to believe it. I'm only trying to gain time. Time enough to locate Tarek and figure out how to overthrow the usurper. Where is this friend, this Tarek? Selim asked. That's a good question, Ramsey said. It must be holed up in a place which is defensible and or well hidden. Or well, the king would have crushed him and his followers already. One doesn't leave a pocket of rebellion to fester if one can easily clean it out. The difficulty is that we learned very little about the city and the surrounding area. We were closely guarded prisoners most of the time. Do you suppose Tarek knows we're here? I asked. If he doesn't, he soon will. The usurper can't make use of our prestige without announcing our presence. I wouldn't count on Tarek's being able to reach us, though. He'd be a fool to venture into the city when there's a price on his head. We need more information, I declared. Let us send word to the king requesting another audience. We will present him with a list of our demands. First and foremost, we will insist on seeing Nefret. 
I share your anxiety, Peabody, said Emerson. But I think we ought not make the first move. It is poor diplomacy, especially in a society like this one. He sauntered toward the right-hand wall and began examining the painted reliefs. Emerson, I said, if you begin copying inscriptions or taking notes, I will... I will... You'd better do the same, said Emerson, without turning. We must convince old Zaccardi that our fascination with the culture of the Holy Mountain is great enough to win us over to his side, at least for the time being. You are right, I acknowledged. Very good, Emerson. So what is the plan? Dowd inquired. Is there time for me to finish eating? Is there more food? Take all the time you like, I said, indicating to the servants that they should replenish the bowls. We can do nothing until tomorrow, Emerson. I cannot contain myself much longer than that. Dear me, Peabody, I hadn't expected to find you so lacking in patience. Why don't you make one of your famous lists? Sell him. We should be good enough to find our notebooks and writing implements. I don't know where they stowed the rest of our luggage, but I expect one of these pleasant young women will show you if you ask nicely. He winked in a vulgar fashion, and Selim's lips relaxed into a knowing smile. Yes, Emerson, I will ask very nicely, with gestures, since I do not know the words. I expect gestures will work quite well, said Emerson. Now then, Peabody, feel free to speculate to your heart's content, since that is all we can do at present. Perhaps a brief, incisive summary of the situation to begin with. Don't patronise me, Emerson. I wouldn't dream of it, my dear. Well, I said, to sum up then, Merison was sent not by Tarek, but by the new king, whose position is less secure than he wants us to believe. Merison was promised higher rank, possibly even the position of royal heir, if he succeeded. It does seem a trifle callous of the king, though, to risk his son on such a trip. Unless he has so many of them, he can spare a few, said Ramsay cynically. It may not have been as great a risk as Merison implied. I don't doubt his escort was greater than he admitted, and it may be that the king doesn't entirely trust him. I sure as hell wouldn't. Don't you realize he must have been brought up in Tarek's household, where he was taught English and other things? You may be right, I said. The boy seems to have no moral sensibilities whatever. He has now allied himself with someone from the outside world. Someone who could use a compass and get a caravan together. Does the king know about this, or is Merison playing a double game with him too? Selim came running back into the room. The guns, he exclaimed. The guns are gone, 